Preface of Life at the Zoo Notes and Traditions of the Regent's Park Gardens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Life at the Zoo Notes and Traditions of the Regent's Park Gardens by Charles John Cornish. Preface it may be said that some of the subjects of these notes are not obviously part of life at the zoo and this remark would be well founded they have in the writer's mind a connection with the zoo which perhaps is not obvious and might not appear to the majority of readers and would certainly take more time to set out than its value warrants so that if any reader or critic cares to press the point he is prepared to say at once mea culpa the chapters on animal aesthetics dealing with the sensibility of the inmates of the zoo to music will be found under the title of orpheus at the zoo by which they originally appeared in the spectator to the editors of which paper the author owes his thanks for suggesting many subjects of interest at the zoo which would not have occurred to him and for their kind permission to publish these as well as other chapters in an extended form he hopes that both these and the unpublished chapters which are now added present a fair picture of the many-sided present as well as some glimpses of the past of the famous menagerie in regent's park for the insertion of animal drawings by japanese artists in addition to mr gambier bolton's photographs the writer must plead the conviction which he has long maintained that their truth to nature is of its kind unrivalled c j cornish orford house chiswick mall september twenty eighth eighteen ninety four end of preface chapter one of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one the zoo in a frost sudden and severe cold however trying to human constitutions seems almost harmless to animal health provided the weather be dry frosty and undimmed by fog on the last friday of november eighteen ninety three the thermometer fell so rapidly that in a few hours it registered sixteen degrees below freezing point on the following morning though the sun was shining brightly every pool and pond was sheeted with ice and the gravel walks were as hard as granite yet at the zoological gardens birds and beasts from tropical or semi-tropical regions such as burma assam malacca and brazil were abroad and enjoying the keen air and others which are usually invisible and curled up in their sleeping apartments till late in the day were already abroad sniffing at the frost and icicles and as indifferent to the cold as mr samuel weller's polar bear when he was a practising his skating a visit to the gardens in such weather suggests a modification of too rigid ideas of the limitation of certain types of animals to warm or torrid climates and illustrates the gradual and reluctant character of the retreat of species before the advance of the glacial cold in remote ages no creatures are as a rule more sensitive to cold than the whole monkey tribe yet there is at least one species of monkey which habitually endures the rigors of a northern winter one of the cleverest antique japanese drawings at south kensington represents a troop of monkeys caught in an avalanche of snow the grotesque discomfiture of these pink-faced monkeys rolling down the hillside helplessly clutching at each other's bodies and limbs grinning and grimacing as their heads emerge from the powdery snow is something more than the fancy of a japanese painter the incident is probably drawn from an actual scene and one of the creatures the chelly monkey from the mountains of pekin was in an open cage in the gardens and in far better health and spirits than in the height of summer its fur had grown thick and close and the naked face had assumed the dark madder pink with which it was adorned in the drawing when presented with sticks encrusted with frozen ice 
it sucked the chilly dainty with great relish and only showed signs of sensitiveness to cold by putting its fingers in its mouth and then sitting on its hands to warm them the behaviour of this northern monkey is only strange by contrast with the general habits of its kind but the indifference to cold of the capybara a gigantic water guinea pig from the warm rivers of brazil is not easy to explain two of these quaint creatures had left their snug sleeping apartments and were stepping gaily among pools of half-frozen water and broken ice one had gained an extra coat by burrowing in its straw and then emerging with a pile upon its back and when this fell off retired and shuffled on another pile but the other seemed quite content to sit without protection in the sunniest corner of its enclosure the whole colony of porcupines six in number which like most semi-nocturnal animals are very loath to appear in public during the day unless enticed by food of a more than usually tempting character were abroad and in the highest spirits erecting and rattling their quills and sitting up to inspect their visitors like gigantic rabbits it is difficult to conceive that a coat of quills can impart much warmth to its wearer but towards christmas the quaint black and white garment of the porcupine has almost the appearance of a mantle of stiff feathers and the crest on the head and shoulders sloping backwards along the spine combines with the black face and roman nose to suggest a comical resemblance between the fully fledged porcupine and one of buffalo bill's sioux warriors in full costume of eagle's plumes during the first cold of winter the plumage of the birds and the coats of the fur-bearing animals in the zoo are hardly inferior to those of their wild kindred both the eagle and the american bison are in condition to excite the cupidity of an indian brave the bull bison which in summer has a strangely ragged and moth-eaten appearance with big patches of bare skin showing on its flanks is now covered with a buffalo robe of magnificent proportions and the richest colour and texture from shoulders to tail the body is wrapped in a mass of brown felted fur the mane hangs down below the knees and a shock of black and silky hair covers the head and face almost concealing the horns and the sullen bloodshot eye this bull is said to be the largest of its race in this country and is probably as fine a specimen of the male bison as ever led its band across the frozen plains of the northwest it was brought to england by lord lorne after the completion of his stay in canada as viceroy of the dominion and spent its earlier days at the home park at windsor whence it was transferred on exchange to the zoo the golden and sea eagles never present so fine an appearance as in these bright winter days those who see them with their wings and tails ragged and broken in the summer and early autumn would hardly recognize them in their compact and close-set winter plumage as they scream aloud in the frosty air and fly to and fro in their large aviary on pinions undisfigured by a single broken feather the gaiol an immense bison from the jungles of assam with a coat as smooth and sleek as the bison's is shaggy and unkempt drinks the iced water in its pen and stamps the frozen ground while the steam rises from its broad nostrils into the cold english air with all the vigour of a shorthorn bull in a surrey straw yard and the wild swine whether from india or europe are equally indifferent to the weather it would seem that all those species such as the wild boar or the buffalo and bison which are widely distributed on many continents adapt themselves rapidly to changed conditions of climate and those wild boars which have been bred for several generations in this country and in scotland are rapidly developing a thicker and rougher coat of hair than their indian cousins 
it is probable that the tiger from turkestan if allowed the use of the outer cages from which the indian tigers and other large carnivora are withdrawn during the winter would develop the thick and beautiful coat with which the northern tiger is represented in chinese paintings the bears though so well wrapped up take the frost as a hint to hibernate and were for the most part fast asleep those which occupy cages facing the morning sun uncurl as the day grows brighter and exhibit coats in the utmost perfection of winter growth the black brown and cinnamon bears have at this time a bloom upon their fur which the utmost skill of the furrier fails to reproduce if the animal is killed at any other period of the year in southern and central russia many proprietors own large estates devoted to breeding horses and cattle a menagerie of bears is often added to this these are killed at the right season and their skins sold in the best condition cloaks made from the skins of the six months old cubs have been sold for from six hundred pounds to a thousand pounds of the polar bears one the older and larger seems disposed to follow the example of the brown and black species and to doze through the cold weather the she-bear much smaller and younger than its mate takes its bath as usual and plays with the floating ice like a baby with the soap there it exhibits the most astonishing antics turning back somersaults and standing on its head or flinging out plates of ice with its nose and paws no creature suggests such perfect indifference to cold as this arctic bear with icicles hanging to its fur as it plunges again and again into its freezing bath the beavers are of course invisible having long ago provided against the frost by plastering the wooden sides of the new house with mud and turf and dragged a supply of dead branches as far as they could be forced to enter the narrow door though they are fed every day and have nothing to fear from the weather the instinct of winter storage is as strong as in the wild state one is tempted to speculate whether this prudence is accompanied by any rational knowledge of the probable inadequacy of their stock to meet their natural wants if their sense of quantity bears any proportion to their industry and skill in engineering they must be full of anxiety and misgivings for the few branches given to them are only make-believe and they are wholly dependent on their captors for food for some reason the rare european beavers from the banks of the rhone have not thriven at the zoo four out of six have died at the date at which this visit was made and only one is now left in the gardens the demeanour of the inmates of the artificially warmed houses ought not to differ greatly in frost as the ordinary temperature is nominally preserved in the elephant and antelope houses such a day as that which we describe has little effect beyond giving an added briskness of demeanour to such creatures as are not like the elephant and rhinoceros too bulky and majestic to be exhilarated by mere accidents of temperature the antelope house is redolent with a delicious perfume of the finest hay and its graceful inmates nibble at their fragrant breakfast with the same dainty selectness which marks their habits at meals on less appetizing days many of the larger kinds lying in their neat stalls look like some glorified form of oriental cattle the eland couched placidly on a bed of golden straw with its satin-like biscuit-coloured skin gathered into soft little wrinkles at the folded joints and its dark full eyes turned to gaze mildly at the visitors seems a type of what the domesticated antelope should be shielded from the weather eating artificially prepared food lying on the straw of civilization and dependent for its food on the stockman's punctuality the only creature which showed some effects of the exhilaration in the frosty air was the beautiful little nagor antelope the only living specimen we believe of this rare animal now in europe in form it is almost like a large gazelle with lyre-shaped horns a golden fawn-coloured skin 
of perfectly uniform tone set off by large and brilliant black eyes this antelope was unusually active and friendly standing on its slender hind feet and reaching its head up to be caressed and fed in the open paddocks and runs of the smaller deer and wild fowl there was great good temper and content the japanese deer were all curled up sleeping in the cold air round their food box which was filled with chopped straw bran and oats and swarming with impudent zoo sparrows these little robbers as also the zoo starlings are in such good case from the abundance of food left at their disposal by the fastidious strangers in the cages and paddocks that like the owls during the plagues of mice on the pampas they defy the weather and the seasons and marry and bring up irregular families irrespective of the almanac dozens of them as well as many of the starlings had selected this particular cold morning of all others to take a bath the gradually sloping drinking pools in most of the runs especially the tortoises baths which have a wide shallow entrance exactly suit their wants many were washing and splashing in the pools in the swine runs while others were drying themselves in rows on the sunny wall above the styes with an immense amount of fuss and vulgarly loud conversation the gulls were particularly noisy and playing at a new game with bits of ice which they picked up from the broken edges of their ponds and let fall on the sound ice they then scrambled and fought for the pieces as they slid on the slippery surface one big gull swallowed a large triangular piece which stuck for some time in its throat and evidently gave it much discomfort until the sharp edges melted the ravens in the crow cages were also much pleased with the broken ice and were busy hiding all the pieces in holes round the edges of their aviary one of the birds was evidently not satisfied with the concealment offered by the cranny into which it had poked a large fragment so after considering for some time it drew it out again rubbed it in sand until it was well covered with grit and then pushed it back protected by a coating of colour adapted to environment the heating of the monkey house had been carefully looked to during the night and beyond showing a disposition to huddle together and sleep the common monkeys betrayed little obvious sensibility to the bright dry cold outside but the delicate little marmosets and small tropical south american species were with the exception of the capuchins removed to the warmer inner room behind the glass palace one creature only seemed penetrated by the frost a sleeping lemur it was clinging to the bars of its cage its hands grasping the rods its two front arms stretched out and its head heavy with sleep drooping between them yet though steeped in slumber it was shaken from moment to moment by spasms of shivering its body conscious and responsive to the cold though its drowsy brain was insensible to the warnings of physical malaise winter in the insect house is the time of incubation and sleep all the beautiful forms of tropical moths and insects which burst into life in the butterfly form in may are sleeping in their pitcher-shaped cocoons or buried in moss and mold only the great goliath beetle with a body like a well-blacked boot on which cream has been spilt and immense stag-like horns was alternately eating melon and sipping highly sweetened tea to indigestible forms of food on which it had made an almost uninterrupted meal for seven weeks from another point of view the demeanour of the semi-tropical birds in this sudden wave of cold was even more interesting than the power of adaptation to climate shown by so many quadrupeds the whole pheasant tribe perhaps the most beautiful as a class of any family of birds are in the acme of plumage and condition 
the himalayas and china are the main homes of these gorgeous creatures and we are not surprised to see in regent's park the metallic luster of the monals or the scarlet orange and gold of the rarer chinese varieties in equal perfection with that attained in the glens of nepal or the mountains of peking but the argus pheasant is a native of sumatra and borneo the companion of the trogons and orangutan yet the cock-bird was displaying its beauties in the open air among leaves and grass tipped with hoar-frost and showed plumage so close and perfect that it was impossible to doubt that the colder climate had if possible added a lustre to its unrivalled wealth of ornament it is to be regretted that the eggs laid in the previous summer were not fertile else the development of perhaps the most perfect instance of animal pattern might have received further explanation from the processes of growth in the plumage of the young one tender nestling from the tropics was being reared at the zoo though not exposed to the rigour of december frost in october eighteen ninety three a young king vulture arrived from south america a round fluffy ball of white down with a smooth black head like a negro baby and as helpless as a young pigeon it grew rapidly and at the time when this paper was written was the most interesting and intelligent specimen of a young carnivorous bird that the writer has yet seen as a rule nothing could well be more morose and forbidding than the eaglet or the young of any hawk or falcon they are helpless savage and unresponsive to any form of kindness but the young vulture is almost as tame and intelligent as a puppy it follows its keeper in the warm house which it shares with the tortoises sitting down when he stops and rising and running with a half bird half quadruped gait which is irresistibly comic when frightened or shy in the presence of strangers it lays its head on the ground and shams dead like a young plover though almost as large as a turkey but it soon loses all fear and takes food or pulls at the garments of its visitors with amusing confidence but the young vulture is an accidental visitor the frosts of winter are mainly interesting at the zoo as the time when the inmates exhibit the full beauty and vitality of vigorous maturity note since the above notes were written the young king vulture has grown to full maturity and is an even more interesting bird than its early promise indicated at the end of july eighteen ninety four it was full grown and in perfect plumage every feather being distinct and unbroken it is black from the crown to the legs without a single white feather and has none of the unpleasant appearance of the less noble vultures so devoted is it to its keeper that when some of the gigantic seashell tortoises were introduced into the large house in which it lives it rushed at them to drive them away the moment he entered the house to feed it and stood between him and the horny monsters its wings wide stretched and its beak open and hissing it still lies down to be caressed and is in every way a very handsome and interesting bird End of chapter one Chapter Two of Life at the Zoo by Charles John Cornish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two: The Ghosts of the Tropical Forest. Perhaps the rarest, certainly the least known to man of all the creatures which, by a strange chance, find their way to the gardens of the Zoological Society in Regent's Park, are the denizens of the tropical forest we say forest because though divided by the dissociable ocean there is only one great forest which belts the globe the notion of the physical symmetry of the world which fascinated the old geographers and led herodotus to surmise that the course of the great river of africa must of necessity conform in the main to that of the danube in the opposite continent was wrong in theory and application but shifting the guiding forces from the control of original and plastic design to the influence of the dominant sun the theory still holds good 
and while the tropical heats remain constant and undisturbed so must the tropical forest flourish and endure with its inseparable concomitants of vegetable growth overpowering and replacing the marvellous rapidity of vegetable decay to the naturalist the most marked feature of the great tropical forest south of the equator is the inequality in the balance of nature between vegetable and animal life from the forests of brazil to the forests of the congo through the wooded heights of northern madagascar to the tangled jungles of the asiatic archipelago and the impenetrable woods of new guinea the boundless profusion of vegetable growth is unmatched by any similar abundance in animal forms a few brilliant birds of strange shape and matchless plumage such as the toucans of guinea and of the amazon or the birds of paradise in the moluccas or the papuan archipelago haunt the loftiest trees and from time to time fall victim to the blowpipe or arrow of the natives who scarcely dare to penetrate that foodless region even for such rich spoils until incantation and sacrifice have propitiated the offended spirits of the woods but except the sloth and the giant ant-eater there is hardly to be found in the tropical regions of the new world a quadruped which can excite the curiosity of the naturalist or form food even for the wildest of mankind in the corresponding tracts of africa and the asiatic archipelago the rare four-footed animals that live in the solitary forests are for the most part creatures of the night unlike the lively squirrels and martin cats of temperate regions they do not leave their hiding places till the tropical darkness has fallen on the forest when they seek their food not on the surface of the ground but imitating the birds ascend to the upper surface of the ocean of trees and at the first approach of dawn seek refuge from the hateful day in the dark recesses of some aged and hollow trunk there is nothing like the loris or the lemur in the fauna of temperate europe we may rather compare them to a race of arboreal moles the condition of whose life is darkness and invisibility but unlike the moles the smaller members of these rarely seen tribes are among the most beautiful and interesting creatures of the tropics though the extreme difficulty of capturing creatures whose whole life is spent on the loftiest forest trees is further increased by the reluctance of the natives to enter the deserted and pathless forests the beautiful lemurs most of which are found in madagascar are further believed by the malagasy to embody the spirits of their ancestors and the weird and plaintive cries with which they fill the groves at night uttered by creatures whose bodies as they cling to the branches are invisible and whose delicate movements are noiseless may well have left a doubt in the minds of the first discoverers of the island as to whether these were not in truth the cries and wailings of true lemures the unquiet ghosts of the departed several of the larger lemures are to be found at the zoo and though these suffer so much if unduly exposed to the light that before long they lose their sight they may occasionally be seen in their cages others the rarest and most delicate members of the race are so entirely creatures of darkness that their exposure to daylight seems to benumb all their faculties they appear drugged and stupefied and though capable of movement seem indisposed either to attempt escape when handled or to move in any other direction than that of shelter from the odious day even food is refused before nightfall and unlike the epicure's ortolans which awake and feed in a darkened room whenever the rays of a lamp suggest the sunrise the lemur only consumes its meal of fruit and insects when nightfall has aroused its drowsy wits these midnight habits clearly unfit it for public exhibition at the zoo and the last and rarest of the tribe which have arrived in london occupy a private room adjacent to the monkey palace in common with other lemurs and loris and a few of the most delicate marmosets and tropical monkeys which have escaped the rigours of an english winter 
one large cage which in spite of the label cockerel's lemur placed upon it seemed at the time of our last visit to contain nothing but a pile of hay is the dwelling place of these latest guests after displacing layer after layer of the hay the two sleeping beauties were discovered lying in a ball each with its long furry tail wrapped round the other in the deepest and most unconscious repose when at last the two were separated and the least reluctant was taken in hand the extreme beauty of the little ghost was at once apparent in colour it is a rich cinnamon fading to lavender beneath the texture of the fur is like nothing but that of the finest and best finished sealskin jacket only far deeper and closer so that the hand sinks into it as into a bed of moss the head is large and most intelligent the face being set with a pair of very large round hazel eyes in which the lines of the orbit seem not to radiate from the centre but to be arranged in circles like the layers of growth in the section of a tree the long tail is at the base almost as wide as the body tapering to a point and covered with deep fur but the greatest beauty of form which this lemur owns is the shape of its hands and feet these exquisite little members are so far an exact reproduction of the human hand that not only the hands but also the feet own a fully developed thumb but each finger as well as the thumb expands into a tiny disc as in certain tree frogs so that the little hands may cling to the tree with the tightness of an air pump it is plain as the half-sleeping lemur climbs over the arms and shoulders of its visitor that it takes him for a tree the arms are stretched wide apart the thumbs and fingers are spread and grasp each fold of the coat with the anxious care of one who thinks that a slip will cause a fall of a hundred feet and the soft body and tail half envelop the limb down which they are descending fitting to the surface like some warm enveloping boa as soon as it reaches the hay pile in its cage the lemur instantly burrows its long tail vanishing like a snake and in a minute it is once more asleep and unconscious of the world a near relation of the lemurs is a beautiful little creature whose uncouth native name has not been replaced called the moholi it only differs from the lemurs in the shape of the ears which in the moholi are either pricked up like those of a bat or folded down on its head at will it has the same wonderful brown eyes so large and round that they seem to occupy the greater part of the head the moholi is in fact all eyes as it stretches its slender arms out wide against the keeper's chest and turns its head to look at the visitors it has the most winning expression of any quadruped we have ever seen the coat of a pinkish gray above turns into light saffron below and the texture is less deep than the lemur's fur in touch it resembles floss silk thickly piled the slow loris from malacca is a tailless lemur in exchange it has received a fretful temper which seems a permanent trait in this species when wakened it growls bites and fights until once more allowed to sleep in peace this loris hardly falls short of the beauty of the lemurs the fur is cream-coloured with cinnamon stripes running from the head down the back of the three species which we have described the first seems to combine some of the characteristics of the monkey and the mole the second of the squirrel and the bat the last those of the monkey and the weasel tribe the slender loris is a still greater puzzle it has all the characteristic points of the lemurs without the tail in size it resembles a squirrel but its movements are so strange and deliberate and so unlike those of any other quadruped that it seems impossible to guess either at its habits or its purpose in creation each hand or foot is slowly raised from the branch on which it rests brought forward and set down again the fingers then close on the wood until its grasp is secure when the other limbs begin to move like those of a mechanical toy 
as we looked its affinities with other types presently suggested themselves it is a furry coated chameleon the round protruding eyes the slow mechanical movements and the insect feeding habits are identical except that the loris hunts by night and the chameleon by day the loris even possesses an auxiliary tongue which aids it in catching moths just as the development of the same member marks the insect catching lizard from dawn till dusk all the lemurs are the very bond slaves of sleep hypnotized in the literal sense drugged and steeped in slumber had the old poets known them had the phoenician sailors brought them back when they visited the land of ophir they would have been the consecrated companions of somnus ovid's famous picture of the cave of sleep and the noiseless hall where a couch of down raised high on ebony self-coloured zomber draped with sable pall stands in the midst whereon that god doth lie while all his limbs relaxed in slumber fall wants but one touch to complete the drowsy theme a sleeping lemur curled up on somnus's dusky pillow end of chapter two Chapter Three of Life at the Zoo by Charles John Cornish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three: The Butterfly Farm at the Zoo. A collection of tropical butterflies and moths reared in the zoological gardens was exhibited in the rooms of the Royal Society at their annual soirée in 1893 the fact that such perfect and beautiful examples of the frail and fantastic forms which by night fill the place taken by the hummingbirds by day in the steaming tropical forest have lived in the precincts of a london park is sufficient justification if any be required for their presence among such practical and progressive surroundings readers of kenelm chillingly one of the latest and most extravagant of bulwer lytton's romances may remember that one of the airy fancies of his youthful and impossible heroine is to keep pet butterflies in cages and to shed floods of tears over their untimely death they manage things better in the butterfly farm at the zoo where the brilliant insects after their brief day is over pass by a kind of metempsychosis from the catalogue of living to that of dead specimens and figure anew in the list of additions to the collections of the society it would be difficult to picture a more elegant or more interesting sight than the hatching of the butterfly broods in the insect house during the first days of summer heat the glass cases filled with damp moss and earth and adorned with portions of tree trunks or plants suited to the habits of the moths are peopled by these exquisite and delicate creatures as one after another separates itself from the chrysalis case in which it has been sleeping all the winter and fluttering upwards with weak and uncertain movements exposes its beauties to the light the wings of the largest kind such as the great orange-brown atlas moth are as wide as those of a missile thrush and the great size of this and other species increases the strange likeness to bird forms which is so marked even in the smaller english hawk moths the giant moths of the tropics unlike the rest of the insect world have faces and features not devoid of expression some resemble birds others cats some are covered with long soft plumage like the feathers of the marabout or the plumes of swans others are wrapped in a silky mantle like an angora kitten or clothed in ermine and sables the depth and softness of these downy mantles make the impulse to stroke them suggest itself at once yet when the head-keeper lifts them from the branch on which they rest as a falconer lifts his hawk the feeling that they are neither moths nor animals but long-winged birds is equally irresistible form and texture suggest endless analogies with the higher animals but the scheme of color is peculiar to the tribe of which these are the most beautiful examples 
in the cecropian silk moths for example some five or six of which at the time this paper was written were preening their feathery wings on the lichen-covered bark of an ancient oak trunk the body seems thickly wrapped in feathers and like the wings is of an exquisite mottled gray the color of the natural wool of the cashmere goat but the legs antennae and parts of the wings are boldly painted a rich red matter brown the indian moon moth is perhaps the most delicate in coloring of all the wings are of the palest green and as wide as those of a swallow the tent of the aquamarine the uniform faint color is only broken by a few crescent spots of a darker tint but the whole of the front edge of the wing is bound in velvet of the color of dark red wine the body is wrapped in thick and downy feathers of the purest white from which the soft legs and feet emerge stained to match the claret edgings of the wing across the head and lying back against the dark shoulders are the fern-shaped antennae of pale green thus this lovely creature possesses but three hues pale green claret color and white but these are so graded and distributed and so modified by the contrasted beauty of the texture of the semi-transparent wing the thick and downy body and the delicate flesh-like legs that the creature seems rather the realization of some painter's dream than one among hundreds of silk producing insects we once heard the generic difference between angels and fairies stated with all the certainty which was due to the youth of the speaker angels have birds wings and fairies have butterflies wings of course was the indignant answer to the difficulty raised imps also have bats wings but the wings of the moth have not yet been appropriated to the human embodiment of the unseen denizens of the air there is a softness and reserve of colouring and an uncertainty of outline in the moth's wing which mark it at once as something distinct from the sharply cut and brilliantly coloured forms of their butterfly relations perhaps the most brightly coloured moths which are raised in the house are the ecles regales which are covered with a network of orange rivalling in colour the inner flesh of a melon on a ground of greenish grey and the ecles imperialis in which an exquisite shade of old rose invades and is lost in a rich cream-coloured ground not the least beautiful among the giant moths is the splendid creature from the cocoons of which the wild silks of india are wound this is a far larger and finer moth than that which produces the chinese tusser silk its wings are old gold in colour with two large transparent eyes on each fringed with rose colour these according to hindu superstition are the finger marks of the god vishnu and the tusur moth is therefore sacred to that deity but it is among the wild demon-worshipping santals that the indian silk moth has its native home in the boundless upland forest the trees on which it feeds are covered with thousands of the cocoons which are gathered by these wild tribes and sold to the silk winders of the plains numbers of these fine cocoons line the cases at the zoo each with living pupa inside the cocoons are beautiful objects in themselves nearly the size of a walnut in the rind and hanging by stalks firmly twisted to the supporting twigs like rows of melons their colour varies through all the shades of silvery or purplish grey streaked all over like the eggs of the yellow hammer with fine irregular dark purple lines the silk threads of which they are woven are flat like tape not round like the ordinary floss silk of europe and it is to this flat and irregular form of the thread that the beauty of woven tusser silk is mainly due it may be doubted whether the cultivation of the tusser moth will spread to the west 
like that of the common silkworms but the time is not far distant when this and probably others of the fifty-nine species of silk producing larvae which were exhibited in the colonial and indian exhibition will become an additional source of wealth in the wide forest regions of our indian empire the area of the jungle forest in the santal country in which grow the trees whose leaves form the best food of these silkworms is vast beyond any probable use which the most enterprising silk grower conceives as far as the eye could reach from any rising ground writes mr thomas wardle in his history of the growth of the tusser silk industry and for hundreds of square miles there lay a forest in which it seemed that any quantity of the tussor of the future might be cultivated and i think it is worthy of the attention of the government of india to encourage in every way a greatly increased production and not to be behind china in this respect remembering that when i showed how tussor silk could be used the demand which sprang up was chiefly met by the greater quickness of the chinese not only the moths but even the caterpillars or larvae of the various silk moths are as beautiful as any fabric which is woven from the glossy fibres of their cocoons let no one despise worms and creeping things after once seeing these exquisitely formed and coloured creatures the larvae of most may be seen in late july in the insect house feeding on green leaves in the cases the finest are those of the cecropian silk moth they are of a blue-green with a soft bloom like that on some succulent plant the whole body is clothed with alternate lines of turquoise and amber studs specked with black polished and shining like jewels those that have spun their cocoons are wrapped in jackets of light brown silk into which strips of green leaves of the plum tree are twisted for protection the ailanthus silk moth has a pale grey larva with little ornaments in rows shaped like the flowers of the stone crop and dotted with black the moth itself is strangely beautiful fawn-coloured with bold wavy lines of black grey and pink the promethean silk moth has a larva of pale cambridge blue with yellow and crimson studs not even the sea anemones in their native waters are more beautiful than these fugitive forms assumed by the undeveloped silk moths of the east in their scheme of colour the butterflies are to the moths what the fabrics of europe are to the webs of cashmere or the carpets of dagestan a score of the lovely swallowtail butterfly may often be seen fluttering in their cage the bottom of their glass mansion is covered with short pieces of osier stick each one of which is pierced up the centre with a tunnel at the end of which lies the pupa of that strange instance of protective mimicry the hornet clearwing another case is full of the scarce pale variety of the swallowtail and a third of the american swallowtail the female of which is black spangled with what seems a shining dust of sapphires but perhaps the most beautiful of all the butterfly broods is the swarm of papilio crescentantes at the time of hatching the case is full of these lovely butterflies black above with beaded spots of pale yellow yellow below with beaded lines of black when last seen by the writer some were flying from side to side of the cage some had alighted or were in the act of alighting and others on the moss at the bottom were sipping the juices of ripe grapes among the butterfly cages is a glass cage which since its inmates first found their way to the zoo has never failed to excite the utmost interest and curiosity on the floor of the box partly sheltered by a few green plants are ten or a dozen gold buttons with a red gold centre on a lighter gold setting edged by a round semi-transparent rim if watched attentively the buttons presently move about on invisible legs and perhaps one suddenly splits puts out a pair of wings and flies these astonishing beetles which are at present unnamed are from ceylon 
above they exactly resemble an embossed gold sleeve button with a rim of yellow talc laid on their backs the underside of a golden beetle appears surrounded with the same semi-transparent rim trapdoor spiders also flourish in the insect house and have made several caves with most ingenious doors in a large piece of rotten wood with rugged lichen-covered bark the doors are quite irregular in shape made to fit the surface of the hole in which the spider lives and are of all sizes from that of a walnut shell to a pea the door exactly fits the orifice however irregular its shape and is so cleverly covered with pieces of wood and lichen woven into the fabric that it exactly resembles the surrounding bark and even a prying tit might omit to probe it with its bill the one hideous and repulsive creature in this good company is the great tarantula spider it is like a long-legged hairy crab quite seven inches from claw to claw with enormous brown poison fangs like a beak two of these spiders discovered in a tent at a swan occupied by officers of the heavy camel corps put the whole of the inmates to flight in their pajamas and the only wonder is that they ever ventured to return before daylight there is something strangely repulsive in this low type of life which nevertheless makes a prey of such beautiful and highly developed animals as hummingbirds and even the small and fragile quadrupeds of the tropical forest End of chapter three chapter four of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four patterns on living animals early in the spring of eighteen ninety three the marquis of hamilton brought with him from trinidad a number of little fish less in size than a half-grown minnow which were presented to the zoological society and were to be seen at easter swimming in a glass bowl among a thin growth of water weeds in the warm chamber in which the tropical moths and butterflies are hatched being small and elegant they have a long and ugly scientific name the girardinus guppii in the absence of a label the writer mistook them for the gudgeon which formed the food of the more rapacious fish and was about to suggest that they would be interesting material for an experiment with the electric eels when a ray of sunlight flashing through the bowl revealed the astonishing fact that these tiny fishes possessed beauties of ornament not exceeded in kind by any of the most exquisite birds of the tropics each of the little creatures though so frail and so delicately formed that its body offered a scarcely greater obstacle to the passage of the sunlight than the water in which it swam was decorated on either side by one or sometimes two of those exquisite ornaments seen in the greatest perfection in the train of the peacock which are perhaps best described as the peacock eye it was no mere spot lying in a ring of a different colour such as decorates the sides of a trout or salmon but a perfectly developed peacock gem lying in its gorgeous rings of blue green and gold equally rich and dark in tint and even more striking from its contrast with the colourless and semi-transparent body of the creature it adorned the analogy with the pattern on the peacock's tail was even more complete than that which a first glance disclosed for on many of the fish a third or rudimentary eye appeared fainter and elongated like a smudge of wet colour and corresponding exactly with the gradation or evolutionary process of ornament which charles darwin noted in the side feathers of the peacock train this wonderful decoration which was assumed like the brilliant red and emerald of the english sticklebacks for the period of courtship only disappears later in the year and the creatures abide in plain clothes till next spring but the character of the ornament they wear suggests a further and separate interest beyond that which their beauty naturally claims 
pattern by which we mean the repetition of certain and regular forms so as to produce an ornament which pleases the eye without making any demands on the mind is by no means a common form of natural decoration in the higher animals contrasts of brilliant colors as in the plumage of the birds of paradise and of the parrots and loris are the usual and beautiful ornaments of birds any visitor to the cases of a good natural history collection will find a hundred instances of this form of decoration for one of true pattern even the wings of butterflies though spangled with colors in dots lines and spots are usually devoid of pattern though the juxtaposition of a number of the same species would instantly produce the effect of pattern but that effect so far as it is given in a single individual is as a rule only due to the fact that the creature is itself symmetrical and that the lines and markings on one side of the body are repeated upon the other the stripes upon a tiger skin for instance though in the nature of ornament are not a pattern though a number of tiger skins laid side by side might produce to the eye the effect of pattern the patterns themselves are also few in number and these limited and favorite forms of enrichment are applied indiscriminately and with a certain indifference to congruity of species yet with unfailing success in the result to the most widely different forms in the animal creation take for example the most complex and perhaps the most beautiful of all natural ornaments which appears in the eyes in the peacock's tail the same pattern with slight variations is found only on the feathers of the beautiful grouse-like polyplectron of malacca though modified as darwin noted by the white edging which makes it even more conspicuous than the bronze circle round the peacock eye but also in the peacock pheasant and the oscillated turkey of honduras in this splendid bird the eyes are placed in a row at the end of the tail feathers and upon some of the upper tail coverts and are rimmed with gold the same pattern by a leap from an order of birds not distantly connected appears in undiminished beauty in the little fish from trinidad and with an almost incredible difference of subject and sameness in effect in the peacock butterfly and eyed hawk moth of england in the emperor moth and a number of allied insects and lastly with a startling resemblance in the centre of the beautiful peacock iris which is now cultivated in english gardens it would perhaps not be difficult to add to the instances of repetition of this particular pattern which we have given by a careful survey of the specimens exhibited in the natural history museum at south kensington but the fact of the repetition of the peacock eye as ornament in the case of birds fishes moths butterflies and lastly of a common and beautiful flower will sufficiently illustrate the fact to which we draw attention the pattern if less elaborate and exact in reproduction when found among the moths and butterflies is an impressionist rendering of the same scheme and if it were the reproduction of some human hand would leave no doubt as to the identity of the motive and idea in each the remaining natural patterns even though of less complex form may almost be counted on the fingers of the hand and are applied with the same careless profusion to the adornment of creatures like and unlike without distinction though the range is in most cases far more limited than in that of the peacock eye the most perfect form of the cup and ball pattern which is seen in the feathers of the argus pheasant seems only to reappear on the wings of the brahma moth and of the eyed tortoise though in one or two other small tortoises the effect of the ball ornament is produced by an actual embossing of the shell yet even in this case not only is the form of the pattern reproduced but also the beautiful brown coloring which by its soberness and exquisite gradation produces the effect of low relief in monochrome the wave line the spot the scale pattern the bar pattern and in rare instances a checker or diapter in black and white 
almost exhaust the list of other natural patterns and these like the peacock eye recur in non-allied species in exactly the same arrangement not only of form but of color a most effective spot pattern is that in which a rich chestnut ground is covered with minute white or cream-colored spots the result is most rich and beautiful and it seems to be reserved for use in highly decorated creatures of any class or family it is seen at its best in the breast of the lovely harlequin duck in which the whole surface shines like enamel but exactly the same pattern in the same colors appears on the neck of such a widely different species as the chestnut eared finch of australia and with the order of color reversed under the wings of the bar breasted finch both of which may be seen in the parrot house at the zoological gardens in the smaller wing feathers of the argus pheasant this spot pattern is reproduced on almost the same minute scale as on the harlequin duck and the little finches then by a sudden change it is found on the back of the larvae of the gallium hawk moth a chestnut-colored insect with a row of minute white spots down the middle of its back and two rows of rather larger white spots one on each side the larvae of the spurge hawk moth of the white satin moth and of the sycamore dagger moth also show it among butterflies the salatura melanippus has a border of white spots on chestnut ground round the edges of its wings and the same arrangement may be seen on a shell some kind of gastropoda if we remember rightly which is commonly observed on cottage mantelpieces the scale pattern is generally due in the case of birds to the natural shape of the feathers and not to surface pattern a good example is the neck of the amherst pheasant in which the feathers are scale shaped and being edged with black produce a beautiful pattern and the neck of the golden pheasant in which the corresponding feathers have square ends and the black edging merely falls into parallel lines the perfect rectangular diapter pattern is extremely rare in birds but not uncommon in the larvae of moths and butterflies it is seen in perfection on the backs of the great northern diver and its relations and in a faint reproduction on the wings of the wood leopard moth a very elegant and decorative ornament is the wave line pattern this like the chestnut ground and white spot is constantly reproduced in the same colors black on gray or gray on black it appears on the side of the wild duck on swinnow's pheasant in which bird it is the main form of ornament on the neck of the grass parakeet on the sand grouse on several common species of iris and on the wings of the brahma moths surrounding the ball ornament to which we have referred the inference to be drawn from these coincidences must be left to practical zoologists but the fact that natural patterns as applied to animals and plants while at times showing the utmost elaboration of design are so limited in number and applied with so little modification in color or form to birds fishes insects and plants alike seems an inviting subject for inquiry meantime it would be a charming amusement to any one who desires a new and not too exacting intellectual interest in a visit to the zoological gardens to go from the aviaries to the wild fowl ponds and from the pheasants in their runs to the finches in their cages in the parrot house and make a complete list of the possessors of each form of these distinct and arbitrary animal patterns by so doing he would incidentally secure an acquaintance with the most beautiful of all the birds for the possessors of these ornaments are generally among the most elaborately marked of any of their species the list given above is far from exhaustive and as the first and often the most pleasing part of these minor inquiries into nature consists in the collection and classifying of likenesses it offers an attraction as great as any obvious inducements to observation in the society's collection some day we shall perhaps see in the cases at south kensington a collection of examples of the repetition of ornament as well as of the evolution of ornament in nature 
the origin of the first is now explained but on what hypothesis can we account for the second the observation of these patterns would extend throughout the year if it is to be complete the typical pheasants are only in perfect plumage in winter and these delicate ornaments are much affected by the physical condition of the wearer in the fish as we have seen they almost entirely disappear after the bodily vigor of the spring season has departed in late summer and early autumn the pheasants and peacocks are molting the tropical moths on the other hand which have such beautiful analogies with the bird plumage are hatching out in may the pretty little tropical finches take far less time to molt than some of the larger birds or are less affected in plumage and the minute but accurate reproductions of the patterns on the wood duck wild duck and jungle fowl which appear on their diminutive bodies may be seen at almost any season in the parrot house the flower gardening at the zoo is now maintained at so high a pitch of elaboration and beauty that it would not be difficult to provide instances of animal pattern in beds of peacock iris and of other plants which reproduce the less elaborate but equally distinct forms of pattern of which examples have been given above End of chapter 4chapter five of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five the giraffe's obituary the winter of the year eighteen ninety two like the days of pestilence before the walls of troy was fatal both to man and beast even the carefully tended inmates of the zoological society's gardens did not escape and as the new year opened with the death within a week of sally most human and most intelligent of apes and of her neighbour tim the silver gibbon who was almost as great a favourite of the london public as the educated chimpanzee so the spring saw the death of the two beautiful giraffes the sole survivors left in the collection the experience which the society has had in maintaining its stock of these interesting creatures has not however been altogether discouraging since the first four specimens were brought to england in eighteen thirty six no less than seventeen fawns have been born in the gardens and many of these lived to grow up but the stock gradually diminished until in eighteen sixty six two were burnt to death in their stable and a third died of old age leaving only the pair now lost the time of their death unfortunately coincided with the complete interruption of the ancient trade in wild animals up the valley of the nile by the mahdi's occupation of the sudan a trade as old as the days of solomon never organized often interrupted for centuries yet always ready to spring up again and always dependent for its rarest products on the free navigation of the river of egypt giraffes which not excepting the hippopotamus have most excited the imagination of european capitals after the long intervals in which they have remained unseen by the nations of the west seem always to have found their way hither from the land of the pharaohs the first seen in europe since the tertiary epoch was obtained from alexandria by julius caesar and exhibited at the circensian games to crowds who expected from its name camel leopard to find in it a combination of the size of a camel and the ferocity of a panther pliny who described it echoed the public disappointment it was as quiet he wrote as a sheep the trade probably reached its maximum after it became the fashion to exhibit combats of wild beasts at rome yet even then giraffes seem to have been scarce in the popular shows though pompey could exhibit five hundred lions at a time and the emperor titus at the dedication of his new theatre caused the slaughter of five thousand wild beasts either the number of wild animals in the provinces must have been beyond anything since known or the roman governors must have used their despotic powers freely to oblige their friends no doubt they did this 
Caelius, Cicero's gossiping correspondent, says, when writing to him in Cilicia, in nearly every letter I have written to you about panthers. It is a great shame. Pray send to Pamphylia, where most are said to be taken. You have only to give an order, and the thing is done. You know I hate trouble, while you like it, and yet you will not do this, which is no trouble. I have sent men to look after them, and bring them here." despots are the best collectors and from the fall of the roman empire till the arrival of those placed in the zoological gardens in eighteen thirty six the rare appearances of the giraffes in europe were in each case due to the munificence of eastern sultans and pashas the prince of damascus gave one to the emperor frederick the second in twelve fifteen and the soldan of egypt presented another to lorenzo the magnificent which became the pet of florence and used to be allowed to walk in the streets and take the presents of fruit and cakes extended to it from the balconies from this time the giraffe was not seen in europe until in eighteen twenty seven the pasha of egypt sent four to constantinople venice england and france respectively the giraffe sent to england was in bad health and soon died but the parisians went wild with excitement over the pasha's present it had spent the winter at marseilles and throve there on the milk of the cows which the pasha had sent over for its use from egypt the prefect of marseilles had the arms of france embroidered on its body cloth and it entered paris escorted by a darfur negro hassan an arab a marseilles groom a mulatto interpreter the prefect of marseilles himself and a professor from the jardin des plans while troops kept back the crowd thousands came every day to see it and men and women wore gloves gowns and waistcoats of the colour of his spots but the successful expedition by which in eighteen thirty six monsieur thibault procured a stock of giraffes for the zoological society owed nothing to the patronage of the pasha of egypt beyond permission to enter the soudan the caravan left the nile near dongola and thence passed on to the desert of kordofan here m thibault engaged the services of the arab sword hunters whose skill and courage were of such service to sir samuel baker in his expedition thirty years later to the sources of the nile tributaries and in two days they sighted the giraffes a female with a fawn was first pursued by the arabs who killed the animal with their swords and next day tracked and caught the fawn in the thorny mimosa scrub for four days the young giraffe was secured by a cord the end of which was held by one of the arabs at the end of that time it was perfectly tame and trotted after the caravan with the female camels which had been brought to supply it with milk the arabs were excellent nurses and taught the young creature to drink milk by putting their fingers into its mouth and so inducing it to suck four others which m thibault caught died in the cold weather in the desert but he replaced three of these and brought four including that first taken down the nile to alexandria and then by ship to malta providence alone he wrote enabled me to surmount these difficulties the report of the council of the society as to the progress of this great undertaking is worth quoting in full the council are now april eighteen thirty six looking forward with interest to the completion of an attempt in which the society is engaged for the importation of several giraffes which they hope to see added to the society's collection in a very few weeks in the earlier days of the society's existence the acquisition of this singular and rare animal was among the most important objects to which the attention of the council was directed and they made many inquiries as to the probable means of effecting it and then named a price which would be paid for one or two of them on their being delivered in good health at the society's gardens in eighteen thirty three the inquiries were again resumed through mr bouchier of malta to whose valuable aid on numerous occasions the society is almost incessantly indebted 
through his intervention and the kindness of colonel campbell her majesty's consul general for egypt an arrangement was made during the close of that year with m thibault who was then in cairo and he agreed to proceed to nubia for the purpose of procuring giraffes on the society's behalf the terms of his agreement imposed upon him the whole risk of the undertaking previously to the delivery of the animals in malta and it was not until his landing them in that island that he was entitled to receive the stipulated price which was at a fixed rate for each individual diminishing in proportion to the number he should bring with him after a brief reference to the capture of the animals the report states that he reached malta in safety with his valuable charges three males and a female on november twenty one eighteen thirty four having thus fulfilled his engagement m thibault became entitled to receive the stipulated sum of seven hundred pounds which has accordingly been paid him but the council has considered it so desirable to avail themselves of his experience with respect to these valuable animals that they have arranged with him for the continuation of his services until their arrival in england for the conveyance of the giraffes to this country the council have availed themselves of the manchester a steam vessel of great size and power which proceeded to lisbon at the beginning of the present month having been specially engaged for the service of prince ferdinand of portugal from lisbon the manchester is to proceed to malta whence she will return to london her arrival may be expected before the end of may for the conveyance of the animals to england a thousand pounds will be paid and the necessary fittings for the accommodation of the giraffes will be prepared at the cost of the society in her majesty's dockyard at malta orders to that effect having been sent thither by the lords of the admiralty thus the giraffes came to this country under circumstances almost as imposing as those which mark the reception of that sent by the pasha of egypt to paris they travelled in one of the first steam vessels of the mercantile marine one which had just conveyed a prince and their comfort was provided for by the admiralty and the royal dockyards all four were safely lodged in the zoological gardens on may twenty four eighteen thirty six an event which the council of the society justly claimed as highly creditable to its resources one died in the following winter but the rest continued in excellent health and became the greatest public favourites in the menagerie at the time of their arrival the largest was then about eleven feet high the height of an adult male being twelve feet at the shoulder and eighteen feet at the head for many years as we have said the giraffes throve and multiplied they readily took to european food and ate hay and fresh grass from the tall racks with which their stables were fitted onions and sugar were their favorite delicacies and in search of sugar they would follow their keeper and slip their long prehensile tongues into his hands or pockets but they always retained a liking for eating flowers a reminiscence perhaps of the days when their parents feasted on mimosa blossoms in the desert some years ago one was seen to stretch its neck over the railings and to delicately nip off an artificial rose in a young lady's hat they were most affectionate creatures and as m thibault noticed when in charge of them in upper egypt would shed tears if they missed their companions or their usual attendants but the development of the lacrimal ducks which enables the giraffe to express its emotions in this very human fashion is less obvious than the wonderful size and beauty of the eyes themselves which are far larger than those of any other quadruped on may twenty seventh eighteen forty four years after their arrival the female giraffe bore and afterwards reared a fine fawn and it was not until they had been eleven years in the menagerie that the death occurred of one of the pair of males which had survived the first year in england in eighteen forty nine two more males and one female giraffe were waiting the society's pleasure at cairo and the stock continued to increase by births in the menagerie 
in eighteen sixty seven the straw in the giraffe's house caught fire at night and a female and her fawn were suffocated a sum of five hundred and forty five pounds was claimed as compensation for their loss and duly paid to the society by the sun fire insurance office probably the first claim of the kind paid in europe for curiosity now that we have no living giraffe left in england we would suggest a comparison of the beautifully stuffed giraffe heads in mr rowland ward's collection in piccadilly with the innumerable specimens of other large game such as wapiti buffaloes hippopotami or rhinoceros which fill the rooms in all these the size and character of the eye has been carefully reproduced though no art could preserve the lustre and softness of the eye of the giraffe in life while the mahdi's power remains unbroken at khartoum there is little probability that the soudan traders will be able to supply any to occupy the empty house in regent's park yet the southern range of these beautiful creatures though it has greatly receded still extends to the north kalahari desert and to part of kama's country where the camel thorn as the boers call the giraffe acacia abounds there the great chief carefully preserves the giraffes and allows only his own people or his own white friends to kill them the other point at which the giraffe country is still accessible to european hunters or naturalists is somaliland and the unknown horn of africa this district is so far accessible that parties of english sportsmen yearly penetrate it from berbera making aden their starting point from british territory but from the point of view of those who would delay as long as possible the extermination of the large game of africa the dervish empire is not altogether matter for regret no doubt the arabs will still kill giraffes to make their shields from the hides as they have done for centuries but for the present the soudan giraffes will be protected from raids like that in which those in the kalahari desert were destroyed in hundreds because the price of shambok whips had doubled the mahdi is in fact the involuntary protector of the wild animals of central africa to which sir samuel baker bore unconscious testimony when he lamented that owing to british interference in egypt where the kurbach hippopotamus whip has been abolished the hippopotamus will remain undisturbed on the great white nile monarch of the river upon which fifteen british steamers were flying when the soudan was abandoned by the despotic order of great britain and handed back to savagedom and wild beasts End of chapter five chapter six of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six the electric eel if the rational basis of legend and fable is worth exploring at all we may well ask why the possession of electric power the most strange and until recently the most inexplicable attribute of any of the inhabitants of the water does not play a greater part in the marvellous narratives of ancient voyages the remora or sucking fish magnified a thousand times in imaginations excited by a world of strange and new experience was the besetting foe of mariners in northern waters clinging to the keel it kept their barks for weeks in the mary pigram the sluggish sea of drifting ice whales rising like sandbanks above the waves tempted the weary crews to make fast to their treacherous bulk and then plunge to the bottom carrying with them both ships and sailors gigantic squids thrust their slimy arms down the hatchways and plucked sleeping seamen from their berths and strangled them before their comrades eyes but the torpedo the paralyzer 
though as well known then to the fishers of the mediterranean as it is now known under the name of the cramp fish or electric ray to the trawlers of cornwall or the channel seems to have appealed less to the fancies of the sailors of old than the new though less mysterious powers of the monsters great and small which rushed beneath their keels in hyperborean seas possibly the powers of the torpedo were too well known to excite curiosity though it is difficult to believe that a creature which sometimes reaches a bulk of a hundred pounds weight and can emit an electrical discharge strong enough to kill a duck or to cause in the human arm a creeping sensation felt in the whole limb up to the shoulder accompanied by a violent trembling and sharp pain at the elbow followed by loss of sensation for an hour was not as suggestive to sailors fancies as the tentacles of the cuttlefish or the sucking discs of the remora but if the fabulous terrors of the last were enough to deter the boldest mariners who sailed beyond tule it is matter for congratulation that early explorers were unacquainted with the powers and proportions of a monster of still more formidable mould the electric eel of southern america its mere aspect is lurid sombre and repulsive its belly glows like red-hot iron as if fresh from the lake of living fire its back is dark and shiny as if tinged by inky colcitus around its lips and jaws are glowing spots like bubbles of hot metal the colors meet in a line along the side and the creature when drawn from the water looks as though formed of two welded portions of iron the one hot the other cold just plunged into the blacksmith's cistern small eyes blue and bleared are set in the top of a blunt ferocious head from which the strong and muscular body tapers gradually to a point at the tail such at least is the appearance of the two electric eels at the zoo of whose power the writer with curiosity stimulated by baron humboldt's unique description of these creatures in the inland pools of tropical america recently made trial neither the size of the fish nor their physical condition in the small tank in which they exist at present could reasonably be expected to produce such results as the great traveller witnessed in the stagnant pools of the llanos of caracas when the indians drove a herd of horses into the water to face the electric discharges of the fish these yellowish livid eels he writes resembling large aquatic snakes swim near the surface of the water and crowd under the bellies of the horses and mules the struggle between animals of so different an organization affords a very interesting sight the indians armed with harpoons and long slender reeds closely surround the pool and by their wild shouts and long reeds prevent the horses from coming to the bank the eels seek to defend themselves by repeated discharges of their electric batteries and for a long time it seems as if theirs would be the victory several horses sink under the violence of the invisible blows which they receive in the most vital parts and benumbed by the force and frequency of the shocks disappear beneath the surface others with mane erect and haggard eyes raise themselves and endeavor to escape but are driven back by the indians within five minutes a couple of horses are killed the eel which is five feet long presses its body against the belly of the horse and attacks at once the heart the viscera and the group of abdominal nerves it is natural the author adds that the effect which a horse experiences should be more powerful than that produced by the same fish on man when it touches him only at one of the extremities the horses are probably not killed but stunned and are drowned amid the confusion of the struggle between the other horses and eels the truth of humboldt's account of the taking of the electric eels is sometimes doubted 
but apart from the credit due to the deliberate utterances of one of the greatest minds of modern days the accuracy of whose views even when he put them forward as mere probable surmise is being constantly verified by later experience the powers of the creatures even of the small specimen brought to this country are so astonishing as to make humboldt's account not err on the side of the marvellous it would be difficult unless the opportunity existed of taking a plunge into a tank large enough to swim in and well stocked with electric eels to realize by personal experience the precise effect of the shocks upon the horses but a record of the writer's sensations when in personal contact with these uncanny creatures may perhaps give some notion of the strength of their electric power the largest of the pair in regent's park about four and a half feet in length thick and deep and probably weighing from sixteen pounds to eighteen pounds was moving sluggishly on the bottom of the tank and was slowly raised to the surface by a landing net as its side became visible its resemblance to a cooling cask was even closer than when seen from above when grasped in the middle of the back there was just time to realize that it had none of the lubricity of the common eel when the first shock passed up the arm with a flicker identical with that which a zigzag flash of lightning leaves upon the eye and as it seemed with equal speed a second and third felt like a blow on the funny bone and the hand and arm were involuntarily thrown back with a jerk which flung the water backwards on the pavement and over the keeper who was kindly assisting in the enterprise this slight mishap recalled a far less agreeable result of a shock inflicted on a previous inquirer whose recoiling hand had struck the assistant a severe blow in the face unwilling to be baffled by a fish less in size than the salmon which form the common stock of a fishmonger's window the writer once more endeavoured to hold the eel at any cost of personal suffering but the electric powers were too subtle and pervading to be denied the first muscular quiver of the fish was resisted but at the second the sense of vibration set up became intolerable and the enforced release was as rapid and uncontrollable as the first the smaller eel was neither so vigorous nor so resentful as its fellow but though the first and second shocks did not compel the grasp to relax a third was equally intolerable with that given by the larger fish the electrical power seems to increase rapidly in the heavier eels one of five feet in length which appeared to be nearly dead when it arrived at the gardens and was therefore handled without ceremony inflicted a shock which as the keeper stated nearly sent him on his back and the same fish when being carried by hand in a tub up to the rooms of the royal society sent a shock through the water which nearly caused the downfall of fish and bucket alike this power of projecting its electric discharge either through the water or by means of any conductor to the object which it desires to paralyze may be well observed at the zoo the usual way in which the shocks are received is by grasping a copper rod which is placed in contact with the fish's back but it is when in pursuit of the small fish which form its food that the range of the eel's battery is best seen on the last occasion on which the writer was present at the eel's feeding hour eight or ten lively gudgeon were taken from a pail and placed in the eel's tank the small fish at once dived to the bottom as is their habit and sought refuge in the corners or at the angle made by the meeting of the base and sides of the stone cistern every one of the fish was killed by electric shock before being eaten but in the case of those in the corners it was impossible for the fish to bring the electric organ which lies on each side of the lower part of the tail into direct contact the eel therefore swam past them like a torpedo boat which intends to discharge its broadside torpedoes and as the battery came opposite the fish gave a slight quiver which instantaneously produced a violent shock in the gudgeon and turned it belly upwards 
after three had been killed and eaten the shocks became weaker and the other gudgeon seemed only partly paralyzed by the first shock and sometimes recovered and swam away in a crippled condition until benumbed by a second shock one fish which was shocked and left for dead while the eel went in pursuit of more recovered after a few minutes and was subsequently pursued received a direct shock from the eel's side and was killed the inference suggested by the writer's own experience of the violence of the shocks inflicted though with different degrees of intensity is that the eel controls the power of the electrical discharge at will just as it controls any other function which has its initiative in muscular action and that the gudgeons received enough and no more than was sufficient to paralyze them and make them easy victims for the slow-moving eel End of chapter 6chapter seven of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven deep sea lamps the possibility of exhibiting the powers of electrical fishes in the tanks at the zoo suggests the question whether in the progress of marine aquariums we shall ever see the luminous creatures of the deep seas exhibited alive before air-breathing mortals in this upper world virgil sibyl set the depth of tartarus at twice the skyward gaze to the summit of olympus but the profundity of the ocean abyss is such that in the deep atlantic olympus might be imposed upon itself and ossa piled above without rising to break the surface the imagination almost refuses to grasp the physical conditions in an abyss so profound as the ocean bed off the coast of puerto rico wrapped by a weight of waters five miles deep in perpetual darkness and everlasting cold and under a pressure of which figures can convey no practical conception even at the average depth of two thousand five hundred fathoms sunlight can never penetrate the temperature is only a few degrees above freezing point the water is without movement there is no plant life and the pressure is two and a half tons on the square inch or about twenty-five times greater than that which drives a railway train yet it is now certain that where the fancy painted a survival of the sterile and lifeless plains of an unformed world or at most the rude survivals of primitive fossils the bed of the deep sea teems with animal life and the clinging darkness of its waters is peopled by myriads of fragile and fantastic forms and lighted into a blaze by the effulgence from their bodies hard as it is to conceive the bare existence of life under the conditions of the ocean abyss the mind pauses in astonishment at the completeness of the triumph by which creatures apparently doomed to live an eternal night are supplied not with mere slimy secretions of luminosity but with rows of bright and ever-burning lamps in organs fitted with lenses and reflectors which shoot their beams sidelong through the circumfluent ocean or project shafts of light before their eyes to illuminate their path the results of recent deep-sea exploration have been summarized by mr sidney j hickson fellow of downing college cambridge in a short work on the fauna of the deep sea published in the modern science series though the bulk and specialized character of the reports of separate expeditions organized by the english french german italian and norwegian governments makes such a task one of no ordinary difficulty mr hickson has succeeded in his wish to give in a small compass the more important facts of this great mass of literature in such a form as may interest those who do not possess a specialist knowledge the main conclusions are clearly presented with examples and excellent illustrations in number sufficient to convince without bewildering 
on one point we could desire a little more information there is no suggestion of the means by which creatures differing so little in bodily frame and tissue from the shallow water species from which they are apparently derived by migration into the deeps support the enormous pressure in their present home some explanation seems to be required though an incident in the recent erection of the fourth bridge seems to suggest that the modification of tissue to endure high pressure may be acquired more rapidly than is supposed the men employed in the steel shells or caissons sunk to form the foundations of the piers worked in a pressure of air rather greater than the pressure of the water outside which would otherwise have penetrated between the rims of the caissons and the ground on those days on which they were not employed and came to the surface they felt such pain in the joints from the expansion of the air which had been absorbed at high pressure that they begged to be allowed to go down into the caissons and spend their off hours in the pressure to which they had grown accustomed this instant of partial migration into conditions of high pressure seems worthy of a place among the facts of deep-sea exploration yet it must remain among the strangest features of life in the ocean abyss that its inhabitants show so little visible change of structure to meet what seems the first and most overwhelming change of physical conditions the anglerfish and eels and crabs and prawns starfish and zoophytes of the shallow waters are represented in the abyss by forms almost similar in structure though that some difference must exist is shown by the fact that when brought up by the dredge from the depths of the ocean they are killed and distorted by the diminution and disappearance of the vast pressure in which they habitually live the fish which live at these enormous depths writes mr hickson are liable to a curious form of accident if in chasing their prey or for any other reason they rise to a considerable distance above the floor of the ocean the gases of their swimming bladder become greatly expanded and their specific gravity reduced if the muscles are not strong enough to drive the body downwards the fish becomes more and more distended as it goes is gradually killed on its long and involuntary journey to the surface of the sea the deep sea fish then are exposed to a danger that no other animals in this world are subject to namely that of tumbling upwards but however obscure the structure which enables the deep sea creatures to withstand the pressure of the waters the means by which they combat the plague of darkness is evident and astounding it is well known that the number of phosphorescent animals even in shallow tropical seas is such that they can illuminate not only the waters but the air to a considerable distance sir wyville thompson states that near the cape verde islands he saw the sea in such a blaze of phosphorescence that though there was no moon it was easy to read the smallest print sitting at the afterport in the cabin while the bows shed on either side rapidly widening wedges of radiance so vivid as to throw the sails and riggings into distinct lights and shadows but great as is the number of luminous creatures in the shallow waters the percentage among those dredged from the deeps is greater though their brilliant glow when lying upon the decks of the exploring ships is no guide to the possible intensity of their light in the pressure under which they live many of the deep sea species possess light projecting organs in numbers and perfection unrivalled by the shallow water forms some of the fish have double rows of tiny lamps running the whole length of their bodies like the rows of portholes in an ocean steamer's sides these are supplemented by other sets of less clearly divided light organs arranged in clusters and groups of fifty or a hundred other deep-sea fishes have bull's-eye lanterns set beneath their eyes projecting their light full ahead sections cut through these extraordinary organs show that above the phosphorus burning vessel lies first a layer of reflectors and lastly a lens for concentrating the beams perhaps the strangest development of this power of illumination is in an anglerfish 
found at a depth of fourteen thousand seven hundred feet like the other anglers it has a huge mouth armed with long uneven teeth and a pendant fishing rod tentacle which attracts other fish like a bait in the shallow water anglers this tentacle resembles something edible by fish in the deep water species it is fitted with an organ which is supposed to be a phosphorus lamp and to play the part of a will-o'-the-wisp in attracting little fishes to the angler's jaws the phosphorescent power is by no means confined to the fishes proper of the deep sea starfish and most of the various forms of zoophytes possess it though in less perfect organs one poured out clouds of a pale blue highly luminous substance which not only illuminated the observer's hands and surrounding objects in the vessel in which it was confined but finally communicated a luminosity to the water itself another threw out light of a brilliant green coruscating from the centre now along one arm now along another in view of the phosphorescence even of the surface of the sea when full of luminous creatures it is not rash to conclude that the eternal night of the abyss is in places lighted with sufficient brilliance by its phosphorescent zoophytes and fishes where these are few or absent there must be darkness either partial or complete hence we are presented with the perfectly reconcilable contradiction of deep-sea creatures with eyes of high development and others with no eyes at all one species possessing eyes with four thousand facets while crabs and prawns are found totally blind like the fish of subterranean caverns those which carry lamps themselves or live among luminous creatures not only retain their eyes but are supplied with organs of abnormal power in order to use to the utmost the phosphorus beams the presence of bright colouring in the deep sea forms is also explained in the same way so far as colour is related to the presence of light there is little difference in the hues of deep sea and shallow water species except that shades of red are more frequent in the former possibly because red is the complementary colour of the phosphorescent beams it is in the leading facts which make such minor developments possible that the wonder and significance of these discoveries lie in the defiance of such physical obstacles as are set to life by enormous pressure and in the artificial lighting of the abysmal darkness by the invading creatures sir richard owen once suggested an extension of the limits of terrestrial life by pointing out that the light of the planet jupiter was suited to the form of the vertebrate eye when the mind which has once grasped the physical conditions of the ocean abyss is confronted with the triumph of living creatures over such surroundings it no longer lies with it to reject as impossible the surmise that life which so transcends the limits set by ordinary experience to its scope on earth may also extend to the planets End of chapter seven chapter eight of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight the lion house at the zoo hic habitas leones old map of central africa just fifty years ago when the best means of keeping wild animals in health and vigour when confined was still matter for experiment an interesting set of statistics of the length of life of the large felidae in the gardens was submitted to the society by mr rees it appeared from the records of the menagerie that lions leopards tigers and pumas only lived on an average for two years in the gardens which gave a rate of mortality of about one per month the value of lions and tigers was then about a hundred and fifty pounds each and of leopards and pumas fifteen pounds the system which led to this great mortality was one of confinement in small stuffy cages in a room artificially heated throughout the year and much was hoped from a complete change of treatment which had just begun 
the new principle was one of free exposure to the outer air with no artificial heat whatever and the range of dens now known as the terrace on either side of which the bears are kept was built for the accommodation of the lions and tigers the cages do not strike us as particularly roomy or comfortable now but at that time they were looked upon as unusually spacious and the unfortunate carnivora which had been boxed up in stuffy rooms and narrow cages soon felt the benefit of the change the african leopards which were emaciated and sickly before their removal became plump and sleek in a fortnight and the appetite of all materially increased the most convincing proof of this gratifying change was that a tigress feeling hungry in the night killed a tiger and a puma did the same and partly devoured its mate the society took the hint and increased their rations and for some time the new method of lion culture answered well the rough and ready expedient of exposing the great cats to all the changes of an english climate had a greater measure of success than might have been expected one is apt to forget that though the tropics are the main home of the tiger and the leopard both wander far into the northern mountains and that the former if bought originally from turkestan or china can stand an english winter as well as the chinese monkeys during the year after the removal of the animals to their new house there was not a single death and the system promised so well that artificial heat was for a time discontinued both in the monkey house and the giraffe house except that given by open fires that the health of all the animals improved is shown by the list of creatures which lived in the gardens including brown and black bears leopards and ocelots the present lion house with its fine outdoor summer palaces and its indoor winter cages in a house warmed with hot water is a combination of the two previous systems and so far as health goes it seems to leave nothing to be desired the zoo of the future will probably contain lion houses of vast size in which the creatures are allowed to live together in large numbers this is the system adopted by the largest owner of wild animals in the world mr karl hagenbeck of hamburg and new york in his gardens at hamburg six lions two bengal tigers and one from siberia live harmoniously in society with a polar bear a tibetan bear and a number of leopards the chance of a battle royal at meal-time seems too great to be risked but mr hagenbeck says that provided the animals are associated when quite young and that each addition to the family is a young one there is no danger meantime the space and freedom of the great cages and the absence of that ennui to which animals are subject when confined separately or even in pairs have the best effect on their growth and vivacity in the hamburg cage the polar bear will play and romp with the tigers for hours and most wonderful exhibitions of strength may be seen daily in these wrestling matches between such gigantic and dissimilar creatures mr hagenbeck is the mulkey of the wild animal trade his menagerie at chicago attracted more visitors even than the gigantic wheel mainly because the creatures had more liberty and more space than they enjoy in any other gardens and it is probable that he will effect a marked change in the modes of animal expeditions now in use meantime whether in summer or winter the lion house is perhaps better worth seeing than any branch of the society's menagerie few public characters are at home to visitors during so many hours of the day as its inmates who might with justice enter a protest against the incivility of the public which insists on taking the notice that the lions will be fed at three o'clock as a pressing invitation to be spectators of their manners at meal-times yet the economy of the lion house so far differs from the ordinary life of the other inmates of the zoo that for an undiscerning public which wants excitement and has no time for observation there is every inducement to confine its visits to a particular hour 
the cattle sheds the antelope house the monkey palace or the aviaries present much the same appearance at any time of the day the pleasant round of comfort eating drinking playing or sleeping goes on without variety or long cessation but the life of the great carnivora is ordered differently and with greater exactness in the morning in the lion house all is quiet the animals are resting or sleeping and the only visitors are artists or photographers whom the lions oblige with a sitting at cheaper rate than any professional models in the trade we wonder in how many characters the old nubian lion prince appeared he has striven with hercules carried una been vanquished by samson and shot by nimrod he has roared at daniel and eaten martyrs innumerable and he still lives on canvas to entertain androcles in his den or dies the last of his race in the desert cavern of some artist's fancy ars longa vita brevis is perhaps a saying which would appeal to the hungry lions equally with the artistic visitors to the zoo as feeding time approaches at two o'clock p m the animals awake stretch themselves and yawn showing the width of their enormous jaws and rows of gleaming teeth the public grows interested and the artists desponding even the little lad in knickerbockers the work on whose easel suggests the story of michelangelo's first essay in sculpture drops his brushes and runs to the steps at the back to watch his sitters in action then follows the mauvais quart d'heure before dinner in this case unduly protracted all the beautiful lithe creatures pacing ceaselessly to and fro noiseless as ghosts seem to be performing a kind of grand chain which becomes faster and faster as their impatience and hunger increase as the howling of the wolves in their distant cages is heard by the lions excitement breaks beyond control and the roars of the hungry beasts only cease as the truck of food is emptied as a spectacle the sight has a certain interest but except for those whose imagination can picture no other side of animal life in daily contact with man it is perhaps the worst moment to select in order to appreciate the real character of those most friendly beasts the lions and tigers at the zoo in the early morning hours when their sitting-rooms have been duly swept and strewn with fresh sawdust and their toilette which is always completed in their sleeping chambers is finished the iron doors are opened and the owners of the different cages come leisurely out to greet the day each in its humour as the night's sleep or natural temper dictates on the last occasion on which the writer waited on the tiger's levee it was evident that some disagreement had marked the morning hours the tigers from hyderabad came out with a rush and greeted the world with a most forbidding growl she then stood erect like a disturbed cat switching her tail to and fro and after examining every corner of the cage summoned her mate with a discontented roar the tiger then stalked out and endeavoured to soothe his partner with some commonplace caress which apparently soothed her ruffled nerves for after sharpening her claws upon the floor she lay down and rolling over on her back with paws folded on her breast and mouth half open went most contentedly to sleep the pair of tiger cubs in the next cage were still sleeping the long sleep of youth one making a pillow of the other's shoulder tigers it may be observed do not sleep like cats but resemble in all their attitudes of repose the luxurious languor of some petted house-dog constantly rolling over on their backs and sticking up their paws with heads upon one side and eyes half opened this pair of cubs was presented by the maharini of adipur in eighteen ninety two both cubs when called by the keeper can be stroked and petted like cats but no tiger which has yet lived in regent's park has been so completely tamed as the fine northern tiger warsaw from turkestan which died last winter after living in the zoo since eighteen eighty six 
taking into account the hardships endured by a wild animal in its transport from the distant steppes of central asia across the caspian sea thence by rail to the uxine and finally by ship to england it is difficult to maintain the belief in the innate ferocity of the tiger after making the acquaintance of warsaw the way in which this tiger found its way to the zoo is typical of the unexpected means by which the menagerie is supplied with rare animals colonel stafford who had been engaged on the afghan boundary commission in eighteen eighty five was returning by land through central asia when he found the tiger in a little cage waiting at the terminus on the eastern side of the caspian and destined for some scientific gentleman at warsaw as the northern tiger was almost unknown in england and there seemed some delay in the arrival of the purchase money colonel stafford bought it for the indian government who approved of his investment and presented it to the zoological society to get the tiger by the russian central asian railway to the black sea and thence to england was no easy matter in the first place the railway officials objected that tigers were not scheduled in their bill of charges and unlike the english station master who held that cats is dogs and rabbits is dogs and parrots is dogs maintained that tigers were tigers and ought to be paid for at exceptional rates including of course a bribe to the official this view being disputed by the tiger's owner it remained at the station where being not only quite tame but an adept at small tricks it became a general favorite its great performance was that of raising a basin of water and pouring it over his head and this accomplishment displayed before the daughter of the superintendent of the line ultimately secured the tiger a passage to the sea at poti it was shipped for constantinople being supplied with a small flock of sheep as food in case the voyage was protracted the animal remembered and recognized his first purchaser long after it had found a resting place at the zoo though not at so long an interval as that after which the lion in the tower showed its affection for its old keeper this lion which a certain mr archer employed at the court of morocco had brought up like a puppy dog having it to lie on his bed until he grew as great as a mastiff and no dog could be more gentle to those he knew was sent to the tower where after an interval of seven years he recognized one john bull a servant of his master who according to captain john smith went with diverse of his friends to see the lions not knowing that his old friend was there yet this rare beast smelt him before he saw him whining groaning and tumbling with such an expression of acquaintance that being informed by the keepers how he came bull so prevailed that the keepers opened the grate and bull went in but no dog could fawn more on his master than the lion on him licking his feet and hands and tumbling to and fro to the wonder of all the beholders bull was quite satisfied with this recognition and managed to get out of the grate but when the lion saw his friend gone no beast by bellowing roaring scratching and howling could express more rage and sorrow neither would he either eat or drink for four whole days afterwards warsaw's affections were not put to so severe a test but his forbearance may be judged from the fact that he would allow his paws to be pulled out between the bars and his toes to be examined to see whether his nails wanted cutting this amiability is very difficult to explain unless on the ground that the tiger was captured when very young though many cubs are ferocious when only a few months old another northern tiger from china which came as a half-grown specimen to the gardens three years ago was as tame as warsaw though it had suffered much in captivity and died before attaining its full size it was starved in china and never recovered this early ill usage its brief life being a succession of illnesses but its temper was never soured and it was far more demonstratively affectionate than any cat for some months it was kept in invalid quarters at the back of the house and its loud purrs could be heard at the end of the passage the moment its keepers entered 
it ran up and down its cage rubbing against the bars with its tail standing stiffly up and delighted to have its head and ears rubbed and patted sutton and the keepers more especially concerned with the lion house took all possible care of it and after nursing it through an illness in which it lost all its fur they succeeded in bringing it into condition to be shown but the tiger soon became sick again and after a long illness in which it was kept alive mainly by the care and affection of the keepers it died much lamented tameness is by no means confined to the northern species of tiger jack an indian tiger which died in the same year as warsaw was quite as friendly to its keepers and surpassed him in beauty for some time it shared with the sokoto lion the place of honor as the finest creature in the gardens when it arrived in eighteen eighty eight as a five months old cub it was led by a chain and collar like a big dog and was for some time taken to and from its cage by the keepers with no other precaution until its reluctance to be shut up when it preferred to walk at large and the difficulty of coercing so large an animal led to its permanent incarceration jack was the tiger which in the experiments with different musical instruments subsequently described displayed so marked an objection to the sounds of the piccolo in spite of the deaths of the three tigers of duke the old lion and of a jaguar and puma the years eighteen ninety two to eighteen ninety four have seen an increase in the numbers of the inmates of the lion house greater than at any period since the return of the prince of wales from his indian visit and the collection of so many fine young animals gives a good idea of the difference in points and form in creatures of the same species there is as much difference in lions as in horses or in dogs of the same breed and they are by no means uniformly noble or impressive to look upon some are down at heel some narrow-chested others have roman noses a very ugly feature in a lion some on the other hand are all that a lion should be by far the finest pair in the gardens are the lion presented to the queen by the sultan of sokoto and the pale lioness bred in the amsterdam zoological gardens those in the fancy say that if the sokoto lion had a black mane it would be the finest in europe except that in the clifton zoological gardens its coat and mane are the colour of red gold dust its head twice the size of that of the lioness its eyes a clear brown and its gaze steady and tranquil its body is compact its limbs straight and its attitudes unconsciously striking and magnificent the lioness is a very pale fawn almost cream colour and the damask spots of cubhood were still visible on her legs and feet when she was three years old in temper she is as savage and ferocious as her partner is gentle as far as points go she is almost perfect with a long straight back round black-tipped ears short strong legs square head flat forehead rounded cushioned feet and a chest like a bulldog's the only other creature which is equally ferocious is a very old tigress called minnie the writer has seen her stalk a keeper when his back was turned and there is little doubt that the scene was an exact reproduction of what takes place in an indian jungle she crouched down on the floor of the den her body gradually flattening out until she seemed all head the jaw was flat on the ground and the tail also with only the tip moving and the profile of the head seemed flattened as well as the body thus she remained for a minute or more the only movement besides that in the tip of the tail being the rush of dust upon the floor as a blast of growls sent the sawdust flying which strewed the planks this was followed by the spring which was of course interrupted by the bars but the whole performance was an instructive lesson in tiger tactics overfeeding in youth is almost as bad for the future health of a tiger or lion as starvation 
in eighteen ninety three three very fine tiger cubs about five months old arrived as a present to the princess henry of pontenberg from an indian prince they had been so lavishly fed on mutton during the voyage that they were immensely fat and heavy when they reached the gardens a few months later they all developed weakness in the hind quarters and though they may in time recover the effects of overstimulating food taken too early are very noticeable in the last cage of the house at the eastern end took place the celebrated fight in november eighteen seventy nine between a tiger and a tigress which resulted in the death of the latter an account of this scene derived from sutton the keeper's description of what took place is almost the last thing written by frank buckland who himself died in the december of the next year the description of the fight as it appears in the collection of notes and jottings from animal life selected and arranged by buckland shortly before his death and edited by mr g c bompas in eighteen eighty two agrees very closely with the description given verbally by sutton himself but the most curious point in buckland's account is that he apparently forgot that the tigress died from her wounds though he himself paid his last visit to the lion house in order to see the suffering animal the tigress began the quarrel by sticking one of her claws through the tiger's nostril the male tiger immediately pulled back his head with a jerk and the claw cut its way through the nose causing great pain and bleeding the only people in the house at this time sunday morning were sutton the keeper and a frenchman and the two tigers at once joined battle with very little chance of interference by outsiders the male used his feet and throwing the female down gave her several heavy blows and scratches and then having asserted its power gave up the combat the tigress got up followed him and bit him in the thigh this made the tiger furious he rushed at the other and bit her through and through the neck while the most fearful growls and screams came from both this set a lion duke and lioness fighting at the opposite end of the house while the frenchman shouting and gesticulating rushed up and down and further excited the animals sutton quieted the lions and then managed to drive the tiger off his victim the moment he let go his hold the blood spouted from the tigress's throat up to the roof and she fell down apparently dying while the tiger was driven into one of the sleeping compartments the tigress was also moved into a room at the back buckland in his short account says that though of course her nerves were considerably shaken she was soon all right again as a matter of fact she died ten days later having been unable to swallow food during that time and being dreadfully exhausted from her wounds the strangest thing in connection with this encounter and buckland's note is that his visit to see the wounded tigress was his own last day at the lion house he was anxious to do what he could for the creature and volunteered a visit though so ill himself that he had to be pushed into the passage between the dens and the outdoor runs in a bath chair but his nerves were so shaken by illness that when the iron shutter was about to be opened which led into the tigress's sick chamber he begged that it might be kept closed and though assured that the animal could not move he would not see it or have the door unclosed a year later he himself was dead by no one more regretted than by the keepers of the zoo the paragon of the lion house at the present moment is the snow leopard it is a most lovely creature and deserves all the praises lavished on it it is exactly like a gray but spotted angora cat six feet long from its pink nose to the tip of its bushy tail and of an exquisite pearly tint just dashed and spotted with black its eyes liquid and large with swimming black pupils are the color of a greenish-gray aquamarine and its expression as gentle as its ways it was a lady's pet in india and still remains the same gentle aristocratic languid creature that it was when the favorite of the mem sahib's drawing-room 
its neighbour the pure black leopard from singapore sent to england by the duke of newcastle is a strange contrast in colour and character it is so ferocious that when let loose in the cage it sprang at the bars with such force as to bulge the steel netting with which they had been covered by the mere shock of contact with its head it sulks day and night and is no more admirable in appearance than a morose and gigantic black tomcat end of chapter eight chapter nine of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine diving birds at the zoo submarine boats according to the naval architects would be the fastest in the world if only their crews could work them this seems a hard saying but the fact can be proved by theory and seen at work in nature on the surface most of the work done goes to form waves below no waves are made as for example when salmon are travelling up a stream there remains of course some resistance to the submerged boat or bird but so much less than on the surface that given the same driving power the speeds below water are thrice or four times greater than above the evidence of which proposition may be seen either in mr frude's experimental basin near fort gilkiker at stokes bay or any morning at twelve o'clock in the glass tank in the fish house at the zoo when the diving birds are fed unlike the submarine boats all of which are more or less alike the submarine birds show the most obvious and extreme differences of design both in body and propelling machinery yet they all get their living in exactly the same way by chasing and catching fish in deep water far below the surface cormorants for instance have been taken in crab pots set at a depth of a hundred and twenty feet penguins are found miles out at sea though they generally return through the rookery at night and puffins and guillemots also fish during the whole of the hours of daylight away from the coast in deep water the darters are inhabitants of american and african lakes at the present time there is an unusually large collection of all these species in the zoological gardens the most amusing and probably the best performers under water are the small black-footed penguins these have for neighbours a young puffin a couple of pairs of guillemots and a rare and beautiful cormorant in shape like the english bird but with a white breast and large sapphire blue eyes opposite these live a pair of darters except the puffin none of these birds in the least resemble the penguins which as a glance shows are strangely altered from the usual bird shape for some particular purpose the penguin has a large round intelligent head a deep boat-shaped bill and short neck it cannot fly in the air it cannot walk but hops as if its feet were tied together it cannot even swim submarine flight is its only form of motion it is a winged seal the darters on the other hand have long snake-like necks beaks like a wooden spit heads only large enough to support the bill and to hold a pair of eyes no brains to speak of long narrow sparsely feathered wings and tail and strong webbed feet as they stand with wings spread out to dry and the light shining through the pink skin and membranes their descent from some very early form of bird suggests itself at once though the anatomists forbid us to jump to the conclusion that the darters are saurian birds as the penguins are seal birds the submarine flight of the penguin is perhaps the most beautiful form of animal movement known certainly it is the most beautiful which we can see and admire with our own eyes the motions of flight in the air though now analyzed and laid before us in the exquisite drawings of monsieur Marais, must always remain something which must be taken on faith transcripts made by other eyes than ours records of the camera and the sun the true movements of flight so made familiar to our brain may in part be detected afterwards by the naked eye 
yet the speed and direction of birds flight in air and the necessary distance between them and ourselves which every beat makes greater must always leave it something of a mystery but the change of medium from air to water gives an added charm to flight the substitution of aqueous for aerial poise detracts nothing from the wonderful powers of the wing but it adds two conditions in the first place the whole scene is directly cognizable by our senses all the wonderful phenomena of flight can be watched from a distance of a few feet or even inches from the eye the simile of the caged butterfly does not apply to the diving bird in its tank which exhibits its powers pursuing its prey up and down in this space of a few feet as well as it could in the open ocean in the next the water does for the diving bird what it does for all its true children be they birds or fish or plants or flowers it adds a lustre and beauty a something of sea change whose effects not even sunlight can surpass the plumage of the birds undergoes a transmutation in the waves in tenser day which seems to fit them for everlasting flight in the palaces and grottos of the sea nymphs across which they fly bearing bubbles of sunlight from above scattering them through their chambers like crystal globes of fire those who have seen sir e burne jones painting of the mermaid in the depths of the sea will guess the means by which this glimpse of the water world was made possible and realize in part the effect which the beauties so disclosed produce upon the senses from the use which the gifted artist made of them in this one of the few successful efforts made to paint a submarine scene the greater part of the end of the fish house is crossed by a large reservoir some five feet deep and ten wide with a glass front the light strikes upon it from above and for all purposes of vision the spectator might be standing on the sea floor and looking along the vista which is level with his eye every movement of the birds can be seen and noted from the moment of their first plunge till their exit up the sloping board which leads to their cages like most other animals at the zoo these birds are only fed once a day and the appearance of the keeper with his pail of live gudgeon is the signal for sudden and intense excitement in the cages the penguins wave their little flippers and waddle to the door whence they peer eagerly down the wooden steps leading to the pool the cormorant croaks and sways from side to side and the darters poise their snaky heads and spread their bat-like wings at the water's edge the penguins do not launch themselves upon the surface like other waterfowl but instantly plunge beneath once below water an astonishing change takes place the slow ungainly bird is transformed into a swift and brilliant creature beaded with globules of quicksilver where the air clings to the close feathers and flying through the clear and waveless depths with arrowy speed and powers of turning far greater than in any known form of aerial flight the rapid and steady strokes of the wings are exactly similar to those of the air birds whilst its feet float straight out level with the body unused for propulsion or even as rudders and as little needed in its progress as those of a wild duck on the wing the twists and turns necessary to follow the active little fish are made wholly by the strokes of one wing and the cessation of movement in the other and the fish are chased caught and swallowed without the slightest relaxation of speed in a submarine flight which is quite as rapid as that of most birds which take their prey in mid-air in less than two minutes some thirty gudgeons are caught and swallowed below water the only appearance of the birds on the surface being made by one or two bounds from the depths when the head and shoulders leap above the surface for a second and then disappear any attempt to remain on the surface leads to ludicrous splashing and confusion for the submarine bird cannot float it can only fly below the surface 
immediately the meal is finished both penguins scramble out of the water and shuffle with round backs and drooping wings back to their cage to dry and digest the guillemots and puffins are some of the commonest of english seafowl and the last with its short thick neck large beak and upright attitude on land is perhaps the nearest relative to the penguin among british birds with the exception of the little auk like the penguins they fly below water though unlike them they can also fly in the air the puffin being almost the only english seafowl which is a true bird of passage and yearly leaves the cliffs and islands where it breeds along our coasts to spend the winter in the mediterranean the young puffin at the zoo refuses to dive for fish at present and only takes to the water when chased by its keeper the guillemot is a far more graceful bird dark above and white below with a long slender and curved beak it combines the submarine powers of the penguin with the buoyant gracefulness of a water hen when floating on the surface below the water its movements are far more deliberate than those of the penguin like the water hen it can use its wings for aerial or aquatic flight indifferently but the feet are also used in turning and the wing strokes are more sustained regular and slower than in the case of the true seal birds as an all-around performer the guillemot is perhaps the best in the zoological society's collection and with the whole of the upper plumage head and neck converted by a sea change into what appears a clinging mantle of quicksilver it is certainly the most beautiful in its favorite element the air jacket which the guillemot carries with it after each dive and which gradually vanishing in the water is renewed after its rise to the surface to breathe or swim probably plays a useful part in its submarine flights it lessens the surface friction of the water and like the air below the skimming dish boat which some inventors look upon as the probable means of obtaining the next considerable rise of speed on the surface is the simplest and most natural of all lubricants between the bird and the water the other birds in the cages are perhaps more truly classed as divers than the penguins and their relations they plunge and swim using their wings for aerial flight only those who watch the cormorant's diving feats are usually so interested in the fortunes of the chase as the handsome bird dashes after the fish that not one visitor in twenty observes that from the mode of its entering the water to its exit its methods of movement are absolutely different to those of the penguins the cormorant does not plunge headlong it launches itself on the surface and then ducks like a grebe its wings are not used as propellers but trail unresistingly level with its body and the speed at which it courses through the water is wholly due to the swimming powers of its large and ugly webbed feet these are set on quite at the end of the body and work incessantly like a treadle or the floats of a stern-wheel steamer yet the conditions of submarine motion are so favorable that the speed of the bird below the surface is three or four times greater than that gained by equally rapid movements of the feet when it has risen and is swimming on the top the luster of the feathers in the clear water the cloud of brilliant bubbles which pour from the plumage like the nebulous train of a comet as the bird rushes through the water and the sapphire light of the large blue eye make the cormorant's fishing one of the prettiest aquatic exercises in the world the darters though resembling the cormorant rather than the penguin in using their feet only for propulsion are so clearly a survival of some ancient type with their long snaky necks and pointed mandibles and meagre membranous wings that the imagination travels back at once to the steamy forests and swamps and fish and saurian haunted waters of some antediluvian epoch the appearance of these creatures below water is even stranger than when perched on the bank above like the cormorant they swim with the feet only and with the same rapid mechanical alternate movements of each 
like the cormorant also they allow their wings to float parallel with the body and the long black and white feathers and tail loosely set on and retaining quantities of air in the interstices are at once transformed by a surface of velvet and quicksilver as the bird descends but unlike the cormorant it keeps its neck drawn back in the form of a flattened s when in pursuit of the fish once within striking distance the sharp bill is shot out as if from a catapult and the fish is spiked through and carried to the surface this ascent is made after each single capture sometimes the bird has great difficulty in disentangling the pierced fish from the spear-like beak and its companion adroitly relieves it of the struggling victim and swallows the prize the brain capacity of these creatures is probably less in proportion to their size than that of any other bird after years of familiarity with their keeper they would as soon dart their piercing bills into his eye as into the body of a fish and are probably the lowest in the scale of intelligence as well as in development of the bird creation yet their movements below water are graceful and precise and their skill in their one accomplishment of fish spearing is unrivalled by human dexterity End of chapter nine Chapter ten of Life at the Zoo by Charles John Cornish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter ten Tame Divers when an ideal home for the diving birds is constructed at the zoo we may hope to see them sitting in the sunlight on the flat rocks they love and watch the guillemots and razorbills rearing their young or swimming on the surface with their offspring sitting on their backs as they do off the cliffs of freshwater and flamborough head these rock fowl unlike the gulls and terns are more easily tamed and in a sense domesticated than any other bird except the parrot but unlike the parrots they have so little fear of man in a wild state that is when quite young but able to fish for themselves at sea that two or three days in human company are enough to attach them firmly to their new acquaintances the tameness of the full-grown young razor-bills when engaged in fishing in the narrow waters of the lochs on the west coast of scotland has been more than once mentioned to the writer they hardly care to move out of the way of a yacht's boats when these are rowing to and from the shore or rowing up the lochs the young full-grown birds would allow the boats almost to row over them and when a hand was stretched out to pick them up they would just dive below the keel and rise as near on the other side in the irish sea they kept so close to a yacht that the spray from the bow or the parting waves under the stern seemed often about to break over them that this was due to a certain confidence in man is partly shown by the behaviour of a young bird which was found by some members of the same ship's party swimming by itself in a small lagoon left by the tide off the norfolk coast razor-bills are not common near this low shore and this young bird had probably come in pursuit of a shoal of fish and been unable to find its companions again in any case it was quite alone and in the absence of any of its own kind made itself one of the bathing party of young people who frequented the part of the beach where it was first seen it allowed itself to be caught and taken up to the house where on the arrival of the elders from a drive it was found in the stable yard sitting in the middle of a large preserving pan which had been turned into a temporary stew pond for a number of small eels which the children had amused themselves with catching when paddling in the stream the day before it has eaten all the fish was the first intelligence of the ways of the new arrival as a fact there were one or two eels left at which the razor bill looking like one who had greatly dined now and then aimed an apathetic peck to be carried inland by children and then surrounded by a whole family of humans to catch and eat about twenty live eels in a stew pan 
is good evidence of the confidence which these birds have in man from that day until its lamented death the bird was as much a member of the family as the fox terrier or the cats next day it was carried down to the beach and placed on the wet sand by the breakers it waddled down to the water took a swim round and came back to the shore this happened twice or thrice and as it showed no disposition to return to the sea it was carried back once more to the house every day the bird was taken down to the beach and set free while the whole party bathed from tents set on the shore it would swim out sometimes as far as a quarter of a mile until it was a mere black speck on the water then just as it seemed about to leave its friends for good the black speck turned into a white one as the bird turned its white breast towards the shore it would swim steadily towards the bathing tent scramble out of the water and walk up to the shingle bank on which the party were lying enjoying the sun after their bathe the razor bill having completely identified itself with the habits of its hosts would do the same opening its wings and sunning itself beside them one rather rough day with a choppy sea it was carried some way down the shore by a current and landed at a considerable distance from its usual point but it succeeded in landing at a place opposite to where some of the party were waiting for it during these excursions it dived and fished in the small lagoons left by the tide and the provision of a further supply was of course a delightful occupation to the children to whom the razor bill's unfailing appetite was a valid reason for being on the shore and in the water at all hours this curious alliance lasted for some nine or ten days when the bird was choked by its food in a rather odd way one of the children was holding in one hand a flat fish which was about to be cut up into pieces of a size more suited to the size of the razorbill's throat the bird was sitting on her other hand at the time and reaching across seized the fish by the head jerked it from her hand and swallowed it but though not choked at the time it never recovered the effects of its surfeit of flounder and died greatly lamented on the following day the penguin can be tamed almost as easily or rather are often tame from the first the keeper of the diving birds like many others at the zoological gardens is an east anglian coming from one of the most secluded and least aquatic districts of central suffolk but the instinct for the care of animals from cart horse down to geese and game bantams is innate in the intelligent suffolk and norfolk countrymen and waterman usually has at least one penguin which is almost as companionable as a child prince a rock-hopper penguin from new zealand was perhaps the most amusing and interesting of these amphibious pets it was the owner of a smart red flannel jacket with yellow facings which had been presented to it by an admirer and dressed in this the penguin would hop 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 in the most ludicrous and serious fashion after its keeper or make an excursion on to the lawn outside where the flight of the sparrows seemed a constant source of interest to this wingless bird poor prince died a victim to influenza and it will be long before his place is taken by a more friendly or amusing creature End of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of Life at the Zoo by Charles John Cornish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven: The Quest for the Wild Horse. The sustaining hope of the discoverer of the unknown is seldom wholly vague or visionary. No man, as a rule, breaks into a new world by accident or haphazard new worlds or lands or men or beasts have lived in the imagination and been foreshadowed and foretold by a hundred minute and subtle inductions grouping themselves round the central idea in minds so set on finding what they felt was to be found that in the end their quest was gained and they have been able to tell the world that what they felt must exist did exist and was found 
even though the nominal object of his search be prosaic and matter-of-fact the explorer generally cherishes some dear ideal some side issue some pet project of his own in the realm of discovery which his efforts shall bring to light and which will realize some reasoned result of his own sagacity and foresight when pythias the first navigator of the northern seas was sent on a commercial mission by the colonists of marseilles to find the ten islands he performed the practical part of his mission with all good faith and diligence but to him the man of science the mathematician and astronomer the bare discovery of new tribes of barbarians new islands and half-frozen seas could have brought no such nights of triumph as that on which he tracked the sun to his lair behind the lapland mountain and saw the brilliant creature slip again from his cavern after his brief but necessary repose such must have been the triumph of columbus when he fancied that he identified on the shores of america the plants and streams of india and cathay and such in some sense the feelings of Javalsky, the latest traveller to seek the eastern limits of the old world through new and untried paths when he realized his hope of discovering in the deserts of mongolia the wild camel and the wild horse the experiences of this russian soldier when he had penetrated into the regions behind the plateau of tibet to the mysterious lake of Kokonor, lying ten thousand feet above the sea are more in the spirit and setting of the journals of columbus than any tale of travel of modern times the lake blue as a sapphire lay in a setting of dull salt sand with an encircling rim of snowy mountains outside and beyond the mountains lay on one side the forbidden land of china on another tibet with its frozen and stereotyped government of a priestly class and on the west the broken tribes of eastern turkestan as he passed towards the great desert of gobi which divides the dwindling population on one side of the mountains from the decaying civilization on the other he found himself almost alone among the primitive animals and birds of the centre of the old world and as the old greeks imagined and as darwin found in patagonia and voyagers at either pole that at the ends of the world nature was simplified with fewer and more primitive forms so in the centre of the world Pervalsky found that in these remote and solitary regions he was face to face with some of the early and original types of those animals which man enslaved and turned to his own uses at such a distance of time that the original types were believed to have perished for ever the hope of discovering the undescended dark original of some of our domestic animals especially of those ancient servants of eastern mankind the camel and the horse seems to have been ever present to the mind of Prijalski and to have affected his imagination as the vision of the shining walls of el dorado did the old adventurers or the hope of finding the mother rock of the gold the gold seekers of our day from the sapphire lake of Kokonor, he pushed towards the northwest across the plain of zaidam a strange unfinished region once the bed of a huge lake a waste of sand salt impregnated clay and marshes through clouds of mosquitoes and gadflies towards another lake called lopnor lying in an extension of the great desert of gobi he had marked how as he journeyed across asia westward all the elements of nature grew more simple and severe and that as the more complex landscape resolved itself into waterless mountains salt lakes and rude vegetation so the types of animal life grew constantly more primitive he had left behind him the semi-wild horses of the don and southern russia and seen the still wilder ponies of the mongols under the average height about thick necks large heads thick legs and long shaggy coats 
the camels of the Coconor were smaller and rougher than those further west and he rejoiced to think that he must now be approaching the original home of the wild camel and even of the wild horse such a journey he wrote must finally set at rest the question of the existence of wild camels and wild horses the people have repeatedly told me of both and described them fully the wild camels were said to live in northwest Sidam and to have smaller humps and more pointed muzzles than the tame camels and gray hair they were hunted for food and were exceedingly fleet wary and suspicious of man these stories of the mongols were found to be correct several skins of the wild camel were brought to the traveller and he was at last rewarded by a sight of one of them though the distance was too great to enable him to shoot it or compare it with the tame camels later however some have been taken alive and the existence of the wild camel in the desert of Kobe may be taken as established the mongol accounts of the wild horses though equally positive were less satisfactory they were certain that there did exist wild horses in the same district as the wild camels and they were also certain that these were distant from the horse-like gang the wild ass of eastern turkestan and mongolia the gangs do in fact resemble a mongol horse in many points they have the same heavy head square shoulder chestnut color and short ears but they differ in having their lower parts almost white and a true ass's tail they neigh but also bray and when going at full speed have the characteristic appearance of an ass with great ugly head stretched out straight before and scanty tail straight behind as prejalski says they are in fact probably only a variety of the wild ass of persia and western turkestan but the mongol accounts of the wild horse were quite inconsistent with the description of the gangs the wild horses they said were numerous near lop nor but were so shy that when frightened they continued their flight for days they were of a uniform bay dun colour with black tails and manes sweeping the ground and were never hunted because they were too difficult to approach Perjalski obtained the skin of one of these wild horses but the evidence so obtained did not bear out the account given by the mongols who seem to have fallen into the usual error of imagining that in the wild horse they would find the species in a condition of original and primitive perfection of course nothing could be more contrary to probabilities wild animals compared with domesticated descendants of the same species occupy much the same position as wild plants do to their descendants in the garden and the absence of fine legs and a flowing mane in the equus prejalski made the place assigned to it as the ancestor of the modern horse all the more probable now the news comes that the wild horse of Prijalski has been seen hunted and captured by two russian travellers the brothers groom grizamo and that four specimens have been brought to the zoological gardens of st petersburg from their central asian home these creatures are said to correspond in all respects with the skin obtained by Prijalski and to represent the ancestors of all our modern horses from a picture of the animal which appeared in the graphic there seems some reason to doubt whether they may not after all be only a variety of the gang or wild ass of turkestan they have the ass's hog mane and a tail in which the long hairs though not confined to the tip do not begin to grow until some inches from the root neither has the animal any forelock on the other hand the ears are short not long as in all the ass tribe and the square shoulder is not more characteristic of the asses than of all neglected breeds of horses moreover it is a commonplace in natural history that the primitive characteristics are shown in the young and the thin tail short neck and head set on so as to make an angle with the throat instead of a curve are as characteristic of a young colt as of the equus Prijalski 
but apart from all external differences between the ass and the horse lies the inexplicable fact that the latter adapts itself to changed conditions in almost all climates while the former does not under human care and selection the horse varies so rapidly that we meet with all extremes from the dray horse to the shetland and all colors from black to white but the ass in the last five thousand years has varied little it will not thrive except in hot climates and centuries of careful breeding have not caused it to change color further than from gray to white and have done little to make it a pleasant animal to ride or big enough for heavy draught these facts give a starting point from which we may judge whether or not the equus prejalski is of the true stock let those recently brought to russia be made the nucleus of a herd and the variations of successive generations be noted then if they are true horses they will vary first in color then in shape and human selection ought to be able to guide the varieties towards different types if on the other hand they be asses they will refuse to vary and remain true to the type of the steppes of shungaria even in our own new forest this difference between the horse and the ass is curiously persistent in the southern forest there are many hundreds of semi-wild donkeys as well as ponies which are left to nature from year to year the ponies are of every color known in the annals of horse breeding but the shaggy little donkeys are all of a uniform dark stone color which never varies looking at the beautiful wild asses from the desert of kutch southern africa and central asia which are exhibited at the zoo one is tempted to wonder how it comes that the race in this country has been allowed to degenerate instead of being retained as a strong and useful auxiliary to our unrivalled breed of horses End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve aesthetics at the zoo the animal sense of beauty that sense of beauty to which the gorgeous plumage of the male birds in many species is an obvious and direct appeal is by no means limited to the knowledge so naively shown by resplendent husbands and adoring wives that fine feathers make fine birds so common and varied is the pleasure derived from this sense that in many kinds it extends to the conscious search for and appliance of beautiful objects in the decoration of nests of pleasure houses and the enrichment of collections this taste for ornament is by no means limited to birds kept in captivity in which they often learn tricks and habits foreign to their nature from ennui and idleness in the freedom of english woods or papuan jungles they show the keenest pleasure in the strange or beautiful shapes and colors of flowers of feathers of fruits of gay shells and insects of woven fabrics of metal glass and gems and similar tastes shown in captivity are often but the survival and maimed reproduction of their natural love for surrounding themselves with what pleases the eye it appears in species where it might be least expected and is developed to a point at which it becomes an artistic passion identical in motive and the means taken to gratify it with the same taste and its expression by civilized man it is not without reason that the papuan who lives naked under a tree calls the gardener bird the master which can build not only a nest but a lovely pleasure house besides and adorns this with a hundred beautiful objects to satisfy aesthetic wants which the savage is not yet developed enough to feel or understand the gardener bird has not yet become established at the zoo but the bower birds build their gallery every spring and decorate it with such articles of vertu as visitors are kind enough to place at their disposal 
the bower birds live in the compartments of the western aviary nearest to and on the left of the main entrance apart from the claims to sympathy which their aesthetic taste suggests the birds themselves are singularly handsome courageous and active and thoroughly enjoy the excitement and change of scene which is so distasteful to many creatures combined in a public menagerie they are strongly built compact-looking birds almost as large as a rook but in general shape something between a thrush and the indian mina the male in his adult plumage is a splendid purple while the hen bird is green and olive almost as brilliant as the colors of the ground parakeets they hop from perch to perch with wonderful agility and whether on the ground or in the branches are seldom still but always active inquisitive and alert in the first warm days of early spring they begin to collect materials for the bower the twigs of a birch broom are usually given them for the straw material and these are soon arranged with astonishing skill into two short incurving hedges the tops being pulled over to make the bower as nearly like a tunnel as the material permits if they had a larger allowance of brooms no doubt the tunnel would be made longer as it is it is only a section of a gallery when this is complete nothing makes the birds so happy as presents of bright coloured objects to arrange round the sides of the playground unfortunately for the birds the mice which have no aesthetic perceptions but are of a practical turn of mind steal everything soft which is put in the bower to make nests for their own young all pieces of coloured paper rags and tinsel are carried off in the night or even in the day so that the birds can only rely for permanent ornament on things not only bright but hard but their taste for colour may easily be tested by giving them shreds of paper of different hues if it be merely a question of colour not of texture they usually prefer red picking out the red strips first and trying the effect in different parts of the gallery that their power of selection is highly developed may be judged from the following example the writer was looking at the birds early in january when they showed signs of a wish to build and happened to have in his pocket some specimens of silk which had been sent in order to make a selection of a pattern for neckties the utmost variation from black allowed by the severe taste of london costume being some slight pattern of white or grey spots the difference in the colouring of these little bits of silk was so slight as to be hardly appreciable by any but the highly specialised sense of adornment in the masculine mind consisting as it did of more or less frequent repetition of little groups of spots or other insignificant pattern eight or nine of these were thrown on the floor of the aviary and the cock-bird at once flew out from the recess at the back and proceeded to pick them up and scrutinize them one by one finally after much consideration it took to the bower which was just begun the piece of silk on which the pattern was closest and most obvious their liking for what is bright and shining in texture is even stronger than that for colour some ingenious friend finding that the mice robbed the birds of their papers and silks presented them with a number of small glass files filled with coloured shreds or with tin and brass filings these were a source of great delight and when the supply was further increased by a dozen pretty glass solitaire balls they spent a week in arranging and rearranging their treasures it is obvious that the bower birds are highly intelligent creatures but these tastes appear in birds which are quite low in the scale of mental development even among the hawks which are among the least keen-witted of the birds the kite for instance has a great liking for pretty things or what it considers such in two of the rare instances in which the kite's nest has been recently found in this country the cock-bird had carried home a long trailing spray of woodbine in flower 
and left it by the side of its mate when kites were common in england their habit of carrying off to their nests any strange objects which took their fancy was well known the white sheet bleaching on the hedge has as great attractions for them as it had for a talkless shakespeare makes the peddler refer to this habit my traffic is sheets he says when the kite bills look to lesser linen but the bird though as much a snapper up of unconsidered trifles as autoclus himself is only a fine art and bric-a-bac collector in its way and is perhaps not more unscrupulous in annexing the specimens that take its fancy in a kite's nest found not long ago in this country the collection was enriched by pieces of newspaper and leaves of bradshaw's railway guide and on the few estates in england where these birds are still protected the keepers are said to be quite aware of their mania for collecting linen when laid out to dry and carrying off socks and bright cotton handkerchiefs to the nest the sense of beauty naturally appears in the rudest and most elementary form in such uncouth robbers as the kites in the far cleverer crows ravens magpies and jays it is a marked and hereditary passion from the jackdaw of rance to the old raven at the tower of london who amassed a unique and valuable collection at the bottom of one of the venerable cannons inside the barbican there can hardly have existed a tame member of the tribe which has not at times asserted its own right to a share in the enjoyment of what we remember to have been described in the pompous advertisements of a modern art furnisher as those products of the minor arts which contribute to the dignity and refinement of domestic life they have a wide and catholic sense of feeling for what may contribute to their happiness in this way and do not always distinguish between what is beautiful and what is merely curious at the same time they do often distinguish and keep apart what they collect or steal for food and their art collections which are hidden separately and far more carefully concealed the writer has seen this in the case of tame jays and jackdaws and has known it practised by a raven and a magpie the latter always hid the crusts and especially the small squares of toast made ready for soup which he stole or had given to him in the kitchen between the layers of household linen in the drawing-room of a large house in northumberland but his collections were buried in the straw in a disused outhouse the loss of several small cups and saucers out of a bright-coloured set belonging to the children led to the discovery of this hoard as the bird was seen to enter the shed and was there found pulling away the straw which covered the china so far we have traced the development of this sense of beauty from the kites which merely pick up and carry to their nests what they consider to be pretty and interesting to the crow tribe which have a separate hiding place for keeping and enjoying their treasures the conscious search for and application of ornament to the decoration of the fabric of the nest even at the risk of its danger and discovery through the gratification of their feeling for beauty is a further and most remarkable evidence of the pleasure which they derive from that sense for one of the strongest impulses of the nesting bird is to subordinate the colour and texture of the outside of the nest to the tint of its natural surroundings and none but a strong and tempting bias to the indulgence of a contrary instinct could compete with their natural solicitude for the safety of their young yet two undoubted instances of the addition of ornament by english birds to the outside of a nest have come under the writer's notice where its use clearly entailed some danger from the enemy the first was the nest of a chiffchaff found in a plantation near rosamond's bower on the isis near godstow it was a domed nest of the usual kind made of dry colourless grass with an entrance in the side but on the outside and round the entrance to the chamber were stuck several of the brilliant blue flowers of the kingfisher the position of these bright patches of colour on the outside of the nest 
is strong evidence that beauty not utility was the object of their insertion the other case was the nest of a goldfinch which was built on a high branch of a sycamore near the window of a house at sidmouth in devonshire when the fabric of the nest was completed the birds or rather one bird for the other was constantly employed in building brought long pieces of the blue forget-me-not from the next garden and so adjusted the sprays that the flowers hung all round the top of the nest the sacrifice of safety to beauty did not cause any risk from below as the nest was at a considerable height from the ground unfortunately it attracted the notice of a jackdaw passing overhead and the black robber plundered the nest of the eggs on which the bird had been sitting for some days it may be noticed that in both these cases in each of which there was a large choice of flowers or feathers for the feathers which lined the chipchaff's nest were brought from a farmyard near the irresistible colour was light blue this decorative instinct finds its final and complete expression in the bower birds and the still more interesting gardener bird of new guinea both of which construct an art gallery for the reception of their treasures and the better enjoyment of their sense of the beautiful these bowers are in no sense nests but palaces of art for the days of their honeymoon and are quite apart from the later cares of the nest or nursery the best of all are the galleries of the gardener birds which count rosenberg recently found in new guinea it was a piece of workmanship more lovely than the ingenuity of any animal has been known to construct writes the discoverer it was a temple in miniature in the midst of a meadow studded with flowers the bird which is not much larger than a thrush chooses a level place round some shrub which has a straight stem about the thickness of a walking-stick to this central pilaster it fastens the stems of a kind of orchid and draws them outwards to the ground like the cords of a bell tent but the leaves are left on the stems and remain fresh for some time the upper part is then fitted together and the leaves and moss make a beautiful umbrella-shaped roof in front of the central building the birds clear a space about a yard in diameter which they cover with moss after removing all stones and weeds on this moss carpet they arrange flowers and brilliant fruits in great variety and of the brightest colors to be found showy fungi and elegantly colored insects are distributed about the garden and inside the tent when these lose their freshness they are thrown away and replaced by others the tent itself is about thirty-nine inches in diameter and eighteen inches high the papuans never disturb these bowers they call the builder the master bird or tukan robin the gardener and say that it is wiser than mankind and judged by the papuan standard this estimate is a true one in the gallery of one of the bower birds half a peck of decorations was found among these were a large white shell four hundred shells of a bright coloured snail flints and agates red seed pods and seeds and the bleached and shining bones of animals if for shells we read mother of pearl for snail shells nautilus cups for flints and agates agates and malachite for seeds beads and for bones ivory where does the taste for beauty in the bird differ from our own end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen aesthetics at the zoo sense and sounds one of the oddest tales in the bestiaries or stories of bible animals written by the monks is the legend of the panther the panther so the homily runs is the most beautiful of all beasts more than this when it goes abroad it diffuses a marvellous sweet perfume this odour is so sweet that all the other beasts and birds follow the panther wherever it goes wherefore the panther is a type of virtue 
perhaps the old monks who borrowed and embellished this story had heard and misunderstood the strong love of sweet scents which the panther and its relations the lions and leopards often show the old theory of animal liking for scents denied them any share in such pleasures unless they suggested the presence of their food or prey but such a reason can hardly be alleged for a lion's liking for lavender water the writer wishing to test for himself the reported fondness of any animals for perfumes paid a series of visits to the zoological gardens provided with bottles of scent and a packet of cotton wool and there tried some harmless experiments which apparently gave great satisfaction to many of the inhabitants lavender water was the favorite scent and most of the lions and leopards showed unqualified pleasure when the scent was poured on the wool and put into their cages the first leopard to which it was offered stood over the ball of cotton shut its eyes opened its mouth and screwed up its nose rather like the picture of the gentleman inhaling alcaram in the advertisement it then lay down and held it between its paws rubbed its face over it and finished by lying down upon it another leopard smelt it and sneezed then caught the wool in its claws played with it then lay on its back and rubbed its head and neck over the scent it then fetched another leopard which was asleep in the cage and the two sniffed it for some time together and the last comer ended by taking the ball in its teeth curling its lips well back and inhaling the delightful perfume with half-shut eyes the lion and lioness when their turn came tried to roll upon it at the same time the lion then gave the lioness a cuff with his paw which sent her off to the back of the cage and having secured it for himself laid his broad head on the morsel of scented cotton and purred these were all old inhabitants of the gardens civilized but at the end of the building was the lovely young sokoto lion with the spots of cubhood still showing like a pattern in damask on his skin if he too liked the scent it could hardly be an acquired taste his reception of the new impression was different from that of the others he lay down inhaling the scent with a dreamy look in his eyes then he made faces and yawned turned his back on the scent and thought he then inhaled the perfume again for some time walked slowly off to his bed and lay down to sleep the smaller cats were in many cases as pleased with the scent as the leopards the oscillates in particular on one occasion after inhaling the perfume ate the small piece of paper on which it was poured but the liking for lavender water is by no means confined to the felidae the cape ratels were delighted with the scent and the raccoon when the bottle was presented to it corked with great good sense pulled out the stopper but this may have been due to curiosity as it was at once thrown away other creatures on the contrary either cared nothing for the scent or found it disagreeable an otter in particular gave a snort of disgust dived into the water and then ran to its mate to whom it seemed to convey some of its impressions for both otters carefully avoided the perfumed wool no doubt there lies somewhere in our rivers under the glassy cool translucent wave or on their flower-bordered banks some odorous herb or water-weed which the otter also loves that the pleasure felt by so many animals in the odor of sweet lavender is due to pure and simple enjoyment of a perfume made intensely more delightful to them than to ourselves by the wonderful development of their sense of smell seems clear not only from the fact that so many species share this amiable fondness for the scent but also because their liking for perfumes is by no means limited to that of lavender a flask of rose water will make as many friends among the leopards and their kin as will the former scent and they also enjoy the sweet odor of pinks and lilac blossom the heavy scent of lilies and narcissi fails to please perhaps on account of their strong narcotic qualities 
it is not unlikely that the scent of these plants with which the furies were said to stupefy their victims an odour which is often insupportable to men themselves should be distasteful to their far more sensitive nostrils it could hardly be expected that in the matter of sweet sound animals any more than men should think alike the scent of the rose gives pleasure from the himalayas to the hebrides but the music that soothes the highlander is to the japanese as the howling of cats still as to some men certain sounds are always musical so to some animals these same sounds give pleasure the taste finds perhaps its highest expression in those birds which actually learn to whistle the airs which they have heard from men and its lowest in the snakes and reptiles which seem to be fascinated by the indian pipe the writer has heard more than one parrot whistle part of a tune and then strike the octave of the last note and the piping crow at the zoological gardens and the persian bulbul which was once an inmate of the same aviary can whistle a tune perfectly it is to be expected that birds which take such pleasure in each other's songs should be most sensitive to sweet sounds new to them but the taste is not confined to birds the old horses in the regimental riding schools learn the meaning of the different bugle calls and though it is not possible to say whether they distinguish between different airs it is well known that they trot or gallop better to some tunes than to others this may be compared with a curious story told by playford in his introduction to music when travelling some years since he writes i met on the road to royston a herd of about twenty bucks following a bagpipe and a violin while the music played they went forward when it ceased they all stood still and in this manner they were brought out of yorkshire to hampton court seals have long been known for their love of sweet sounds lang in his account of a voyage to spitzbergen says that when a violin was played on board the vessel a numerous audience of seals would often assemble and follow the vessel for miles sir walter scott mentions this taste in the lines rude heisker seals through surges dark would oft pursue the minstrel's bark and it is said that when the bell of the church on the island of hoy rang the seals within hearing swam to the shore and remained looking about them as long as it was told in a less prosaic age the seals of hoy might have become an established myth of a successful deep-sea mission to the mermaids of the north it would be interesting to make some musical experiments at the zoological gardens but the first occasion on which the writer attempted this led to such a strong suspicion of his insanity among the visitors that in the face of a caution addressed by an elderly nurse to her charges don't go near him he ain't right in his head he had not the courage to continue his researches note in a letter to the writer the late dr john ray f r s the discoverer of the fate of the franklin expedition urged that he should nevertheless make some trial of the effects of music on the different animals at the zoo dr ray spent the days of his boyhood in the orkney and shetland islands and said that both there and in the regions round the frozen rim of the northern ocean it was a matter of common experience that the seals would follow a boat in which music was played the following chapters give the interesting result of this suggestion end of note end of chapter thirteen Chapter Fourteen of Life at the Zoo by Charles John Cornish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen: Orpheus at the Zoo, the First Visit. In making trial with the aid of a skilled musician of the effect of sweet sounds on animal ears, we knew that there was good reason to doubt whether Orpheus himself might not fail to charm within the precincts of the zoo for if on the one hand the creatures so far share the blessings of the golden age that they entertain a liking rather than a fear of man and have no dread of a possible enemy behind the mask of music 
many of them are no strangers to such forms of it as are produced by the harmony of a band which plays there weekly in summer evenings to those creatures which have lived for years in that part of the gardens near the bandstand the sound of music is no new thing and it was possible that they might be as indifferent to its strains as an organ grinder's monkey to the music of the street on the other hand there must be many to which either from living at a distance from the musical centre of the bandstand or in separate buildings such sounds are new and unusual and others which are but recent arrivals in the gardens fresh from tropical forests or the wastes and deserts of an unmusical world in any case to listen to the distant strains of a brass band is a different experience from that enjoyed in a chamber recital by your own violin player one who can draw from his instrument by sympathetic skill melodious chords sounds soft and weird grave and gay strident or tremulous harmonious or suddenly discordant eye watching eye and quick to change or repeat a note as he marks the varying expression of emotion roused by sound on animal faces sometimes strangely expressive or on others in which for minutes the eye alone gives token even of life it was on some of these last the snakes and creeping things that we proposed first to make trial of the powers of sound partly because eastern traditions of snake charming are some of the oldest in the world partly because if they proved unresponsive this would still leave room to hope that creatures of a higher organization and warmer blood might be more appreciative and lastly the day was dark with thunder and rain and orpheus himself in his sylvan concerts might have failed to charm with wetted strings before visiting the cobras and the pythons we made our way to the insect house with some design of making trial of the tarantula spider our violinist having a theory of his own that spiders had a liking for harmonious sound partly too from a mixed feeling that the tarantula whose bite makes others dance should itself have a feeling for musical numbers apparently the tarantula's powers are objective only for it remained in its corner sulky and unmoved but a nest of scorpions was less indifferent after the piece of bark behind which these venomous creatures were lurking had been gently overturned and they had settled down to their usual semi-slumberous state the violinist played chords at first gentle and melodious then rising to a high and sustained series of piercing notes in a few moments one after another the creatures began to move the mass became violently agitated and the torpid scorpions awoke into a writhing tangle of legs and claws and stings when the sounds ceased they became still when the loud shrill notes were played again they were again agitated the talking mina which lives in the same room sprang from end to end of its cage with ecstatic hops and whistled and coughed and gave evidence that it at least was a critical listener to the rival musician the pretty dappled axis deer which live in a little paddock by the path were our next audience and as we passed them on our way to the snake's house a few soft chords were played by way of trial the deer were at once attracted and drew near the railings with ears pointed forward while low pathetic chords were played they stood still panting but not unpleased at a sudden discord they sprang back and shook their heads loud quick music followed but this failed to please they stood further off stamped and shook their heads again looking excited and defiant but we had not come to play to the deer that day the snakes and pythons were our object the more so as we could play to these without interruption from the interested visitors whose inconvenient attention our enterprise was beginning to attract behind the scenes in the new reptile house lies a most interesting region 
and orpheus has a prescriptive right of entry to the arcana of the serpent world we explained the object of our visit cessit imanis mihi blandienti janitor aulae and we were most kindly taken to the private side of snake land in the zoo there if we may not breakfast on basilisk eggs as in the land of cleopatra's asp we may at least see the creature that does breakfast on basilisk eggs the great monitor lizard which eats the eggs of the crocodile or of hens at the zoo where crocodiles eggs are scarce there too we may see young basilisks or crocodiles frisking in a homely watering pot young rats too by the score party-coloured and piebald the destined food of serpents but meantime in high spirits and playful squeaking it was the very place for a chamber concert to the cobras for the thick plate glass before the cages shuts out the sound of the curious crowd in front while in the back of each compartment is a small square iron door like those through which food is passed in model prisons to the inmates of the cells this door in the case of the poisonous snakes is set high above the ground and is reached by a set of steps which travels on a rail it is therefore possible to observe the creature's movements while the player of the music is out of sight below the dweller on the threshold of the snake's home is the monitor lizard an active and formidable saurian some five feet in length whose watchful habits were said to give warning of the approach of the crocodile it did not belie its reputation for watchfulness for the instant that it heard the sounds of the violin through its opened door it raised its head and stood alert and listening then the forked tongue came out and played incessantly round its lips soft slow music followed and the lizard became quite still except for a gentle swaying of the head from side to side two groups of black snakes from the robin islands next claimed our attention and gave some evidence of the way in which the physical conditions of the moment affect the sensibilities of these creatures in the first cage they remained absolutely torpid looking exactly as if carved out in polished ebony in the next the heads were raised at once the forked tongues played and at a sudden discord each snake's head started violently back nor was this quick repulsion caused by any sudden movement of the bow for the player was invisible in the next cages to these were some small boas and madame paulus's pythons with which that lady used to perform in a tank at the royal aquarium the pythons showed no signs of interest except by a quickened respiration but a boa was at once attracted by the music as it worked along the rounded rim of its circular bath in the direction of the sounds it gave a beautiful exhibition of that snake movement for which we have no name neither crawling nor creeping but gently enveloping portions of the surface on which it lay with its lower scales and advancing noiselessly and almost imperceptibly arrived at the side of the bath nearest to the door it extended its head with a kind of tremulous motion until it obtained a view of the violin it remained for some minutes motionless with its eye fixed upon the instrument until the music became loud and strident then in sinuous folds it dropped like some viscous fluid to the ground and slowly advanced to the door from which it was gently put back by its keeper but the cobra is the snake to which all tradition points as most susceptible to musical sounds and we prepared to watch its attitude towards the violin with no little excitement and curiosity the accounts of indian residents mainly agree in saying that the snake charmer does influence these serpents by the monotonous notes of his little bagpipes that as soon as the sound is heard the snake rises spreads its hood and often waves its head from side to side in some sort of time to the music and that under these conditions these venomous serpents may be handled with impunity 
the last claim of the snake charmer is perhaps overbold the snakes appear generally to have their fangs drawn but in any case opinion agrees that the sound of the pipes does attract and interest the cobra wild cobras are also induced by the pipe player to come out from the holes in old wells or ruins in which they have taken up their residence the snake being noosed when its body is sufficiently clear of the hole to enable it to be jerked away by the snake charmer's partner the behavior of the cobras at the zoo more than justified the indian stories we selected for our serenade a large yellow indian cobra which was lying coiled up asleep on the gravel at the bottom of its cage at the first note of the violin the snake instantly raised its head and fixed its bright yellow eye with a set gaze on the little door at the back the music then gradually became louder and the snake raised itself in the traditional attitude on its tail and spread its hood slowly oscillating from one side to the other as the violin played waltz time there was a most strangely interested look in the cobra's eye an attitude at this time and the slightest change in the volume or character of the music was met by an instantaneous change in the movements or poise of the snake at the tremulo it puffed its body out a rattlesnake in the next cage was also listening intently at the same time with his head drawn back and slowly rising and falling but it was less apparently sensitive than the cobra the violin suddenly reproduced the sound of the bagpipes which greatly excited the snake and as the drone was put on to the tune of the keel row its hood expanded to its utmost dimensions soft minor chords were then played and a sudden sharp discord struck without warning the snake flinched whenever this was done as if it had been struck and this it may be worth noting was subsequently found to be a general effect of discords on most animals of a higher organization the results of these further experiments were naturally more easy to detect and record than in the case of the snakes but it may be taken as established that at the zoo there are serpents that are not yet deaf to the voice of the charmer even if he lack the training of eastern magicians end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen orpheus at the zoo the second visit the result of the first experiments made upon animals with musical sounds was such as to invite a second visit by the violin player to the inmates of the zoo the sun was shining brightly and most of the animals were just awaking from their morning sleep some were not yet awake the two polar bears were lying fast asleep in an affectionate embrace their noses touching and each one with one paw laid on its companion's side while the other grasped its friends both were dreaming like dogs on a hearthrug and gave slight starts and sounds from time to time and movements of their feet and paws we seated ourselves on the balustrade of the bridge above and serenaded the bears the young one awoke at once and slowly rolled over stretched itself and as the music increased in volume came out into the main cage to listen the violin was some ten feet above the level on which the bear was standing in order to get nearer the sound it stood up on its hind legs and listened intently it then retired and began to walk backwards and forwards uttering some half-formed sound but a fresh burst of music from the violin once more brought it to the front where it stood up and spreading its arms wide on either side pushed its muzzle between the bars when the musician descended from the balcony and went close to the cage the bear at once crossed to the place and sat down to listen occasionally putting its paws through the bars to try and reach the instrument it was not until we had ceased to play for some time that the bear left its place against the bars 
and sought refreshment in a morning tub the two grizzly bears at the first chord struck assumed at once an air of the most comic and critical attention each with its head on one side and its paws clasping the bars a sudden discord made both bears start back and the lively tone of the keel row set them walking up and down the cage in the lion house every head turned to the first sound of the violin as the strains continued the largest lion to whom the music was more particularly addressed began to wave the black tuft on its tail from side to side and a lioness which had been asleep in the inner cage walked straight out towards the violin and tried to push the lion from its front seat but by this time so much public interest was awakened in our experiment that we were obliged to forego our concert to the lions and seek an audience less subject to interruption there is a german tale of a fiddler pursued by wolves who was saved by the accidental breaking of a string of his fiddle the sound of the breaking string frightened the wolves for the moment and afterwards the legend adds he kept them from pulling him from the roof of the hut on which he had taken refuge by playing continuously the story of the breaking string frightening the wolves so far agreed with our experience of the effect of sudden and sharp discords on various animals that it was decided to make the experiment upon the wolves the result went far to show that the old legend of their fear of music is based on fact the common european wolf set up its back and drew back its lips into a fixed and hideous sneer showing all its teeth to the gums with its tail between its legs the indian wolf showed signs of extreme and abject fear it trembled violently its fur was erected and cowering down till its body almost touched the ground it retreated to the furthest corner of the cage when the music was played at the back of the cage where the musician was invisible its alarm was in no degree abated it crept to the door to listen and then sprang back and cowered against the bars in front of the cage and so continued in alternate spasms of curiosity and fear the jackals and some of the wilder foxes were only less alarmed than the wolves the female jackals ran back to their inner den and hid themselves the male erected its fur until it appeared as rough as an eskimo dog and crept backwards and forwards with its lips curled back opening and shutting its mouth growling whenever a strong discordant note was struck the scene at this time was extremely amusing the prairie wolves next door sat down to listen the african jackals sat on a shelf and watched and the performance was overlooked from a distance by a nervous but highly interested row of foxes of various sizes and colors all sitting on the party walls which divide their cages from the wolves and dingoes it was like a picture from an illustrated edition of aesop's fables the foxes in the large cages came forward readily to listen to the music though the usual experiment of striking a discord startled them greatly but the rough foxes from demerara in a small cage behind the building was so violently alarmed that the keeper requested that the music might cease for fear the creature would have a fit to which ailment it appears that foxes and wolves are very subject as might be expected the sheep found pleasure in sounds which terrified the wolves the burrell or wild sheep of the himalayas all came forward to listen their ears pointed forward to catch the sounds some even stood up and placed their forefeet against the palings stretched their necks in the direction of the music our violinist appropriately chose the shepherd's call in william tell and this served to engage their attention more than the keel row or any more violent airs like almost all other creatures they were startled at a discord in the row of sheep sheds the music drew out all the inmates the markor and the cretan ibex coming forward to listen and walking back to their food when the music stopped 
the old indian wild boar was an unexpected and appreciative convert to the charms of music it was lying fast asleep in the sun with its back towards the musician but at the first chords it rose and faced round toward the player after listening attentively with ears forward the boar began a series of complacent grunts and advanced to the front of the pen until disconcerted by a sharp discordant note which drove it back several feet the wild swine from spain and africa were also much interested in the music for some unknown reason the sounds which pleased the boars offended the african elephant setting up its huge flapping ears it flung up its trunk snorted and whistled like a steam engine driving its head against the rails and exhibiting every mark of anger and dislike the indian bison and the gael both brought forward their broad ears to listen and resting their muzzles against the railings seemed to enjoy the sounds a sharp discord caused them to start back and produced the same effect on the zebras and african wild ass both of which listened to the harmonious chords with pleasure and followed the musician from one side of their stall to another but it was in the monkey house that the music caused the greatest wonder and excitement the large apes two of which will never hear the violin again for sally and the young orangutan have both died since our visit were more frightened than pleased tim the silver gibbon was much agitated opening and shutting his mouth and waving his long arms about until two loud discordant notes were played when he came flying down from his tree and flung himself against the bars the young orangutan turned his back at once and made off to the top of his cage from which not even a banana would tempt him sally listened gravely with her hands crossed and a far-off look in her eyes until a strong crescendo was played when she made an audible and perfectly articulate remark though we were unable to record its meaning outside the large monkey house a large chely monkey was sitting in a cage apart thoughtfully chewing a stick at the sound of the violin it gave a violent start and frowned which however is not a necessary sign of displeasure in monkey physiognomy when sudden discords were played it sprang forward and rattled the bars the capuchin monkeys the species selected by dr garnier for his experiments in monkey language showed the strangest and most amusing excitement these pretty little creatures have wonderfully expressive and intelligent pink faces with bright brown eyes and pink lips and the play and mobility of their faces and bodies while listening to the music was extraordinarily rapid the three in the first cage at first rushed up into their box and then all peeped out chattering and excited one by one they came down and listened to the music with intense curiosity shrieking and making faces at a crescendo shaking the wires at a discord and putting their heads upside down in efforts of acute criticism at low and musical passages every change of note was marked by some alteration of expression in the faces of the excited little monkeys and a series of discordant notes roused them to a passion of rage most of the other monkeys came up to listen the malebrook monkey dropped the clay pipe he was making believe to smoke and the white-nosed monkey stole a lady's veil and picked it thoughtfully to pieces but a big baboon recently brought to the gardens assumed a most comic look of disgust and surprise and walked off to the utmost limits of its chain it is easier to give a record of such experiments than to speak with confidence of the feelings excited in our various listeners darwin while giving many instances of the expression of anger pain and fear gives few of the expression of pleasure or the milder emotions of curiosity and contentment it will not however be difficult to show that in many cases the animals at the zoo did exhibit pleasure and curiosity in a very marked degree 
while strange to say in the case of others anger or fear was shown in all the modes which darwin has described with the behavior of the wolves we may compare his description of the characteristic expression of fear in carnivorous animals by erecting the hair and uncovering the teeth and trembling cattle and sheep says the great naturalist are remarkable for displaying their emotions in a very slight degree except that of extreme pain but in the case of the wild sheep and even of the wild cattle the pleasure and curiosity aroused by the music was plainly shown as we have described above by their instant attention and their approach towards the sounds at the sudden discords they instantly showed displeasure by stamping the feet and retiring the african elephant gave unmistakable signs of anger the wild boar and pigs of pleasure and curiosity and among others which shared these amiable emotions were beyond doubt the zebras wild asses polar and grizzly bears and the ant-eater no creature seemed wholly indifferent except the seals and the sudden start and displeasure at a discord was almost universal from the snakes to the african elephant there are many men perhaps many races of men who could not detect a discord and would be indifferent alike to harmony and its opposite must we not then infer that owing to some greater sensitiveness of the organ most animals have a musical ear and that the stories of orpheus and his lute have at any rate a basis in the facts of animal aesthetics End of chapter 15chapter sixteen of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen orpheus at the zoo the choice of instruments last came joy's ecstatic trial he with viny crown advancing first to the lively pipe his hand addressed but soon he saw the brisk awakening bile whose sweet entrancing voice he loved the best in a former trial of the effects of sweet sounds on animals ears at the zoo our orpheus was so far in character that he played but one instrument and though the violin did duty for the classic lute the audience was in many cases as responsive as in the groves of thessaly when music still was young our object so attained curiosity went no further though if a matter of fact and scientific age demands results as a natural consequence to experiments however playful we would sum up the conclusions then reached as follows all animals except the cobras and the wolves showed pleasure and curiosity when listening to soft and melancholy music and all exhibited extreme dislike of loud harsh discordant sounds minor keys in all cases seemed most appreciated and in some animals such as the mountain sheep the bears and the wolves they produced the strangest results in the first two of pleasure in the last of fear but though the violin player is master of many sounds and can even imitate the drone of the bagpipe which the cobras so much enjoyed it still remained to make trial of our hearers with other sounds than those of the tuneful strings animals like the passions might have their favorite instrument if only it could be found and orpheus with his lute could be matched against the shepherd's pipe or could watch the emotion of his animal admirers while melancholy poured through the mellow horn her pensive soul respect for the peaceful early hours at the zoo induced us to forego for the time the trial of instruments of brass but it was thought that the contrasts of the violin the flute and the shrill and piping piccolo might afford some guide to animals taste in instrumental music without injury either to their own nerves or to the comfort of visitors to the gardens the hour chosen was the earliest which the rules for securing the animal's comfort allowed for the tests to be made were far more delicate than those by which we had proved the general susceptibility of animals to musical sound and demanded the undivided attention of our captive hearers 
the general order of our experiments based upon the supposition that animal nerves are not unlike our own was so arranged that their attention should be first arrested by a low and gradually increasing volume of sound in those melodious minor keys which experience showed them to prefer the piccolo was then to follow in shrill and high-pitched contrast and lastly the mellow wood notes of the flute were to soothe away whatever ruffled feelings the less tuneful piccolo had aroused in case the creature showed any marked preference for the flute over the violin then the flute was to take precedence there is a curious attraction in watching these half-human appeals to animal emotions and marking the quick look of interest and surprise visible in most of their faces as the sweet sounds gradually steal on their senses and the growth of pleasure or fear as the creature springs to its feet and either advances eagerly to listen or with bristling hair retreats to the farthest corner of the den until perhaps pleasure or curiosity overcomes their terror at the unusual sounds pleasure or dislike are often most strongly shown where least expected and the result of our last experiment goes to show that the tiger has strongest dislikes if not stronger preferences in the musical scale than the most intellectual anthropoid apes our first visit was paid to jack the young red orangutan which since the death of sally the chimpanzee claims the highest place in animal organization among the inmates of the zoo he is a six-month-old baby of extremely grave and deliberate manners and perhaps the most irresistibly comical creature which has ever been seen in london he is extremely well behaved not in the least shy and as friendly with strangers as with his keeper his arms are as strong as those of a man while his legs and feet seem to be used less for walking than as a subsidiary pair of arms and hands he is thus able when much interested to hold his face between two hands and to rest his chin on the third which gives him an air of pondering reflection beyond any power of human imitation he knows there's something up remarked his keeper as we entered the house and the ape came to the bars and sat down to inspect his visitors as the sounds of the violin began he suspended himself against the bars and then with one hand above his head dropped the other to his side and listened with grave attention as the sound increased in volume he dropped to the ground and all the hair on his body stood up with fear he then crept away on all fours looking back over his shoulder like a frightened baby and taking up his piece of carpet which does duty for a shawl shook it out and threw it completely over his head and body and drew it tight round him after a short time as the music continued he gained courage and put out his head and at last threw away the cloak and came forward again by this time his hair was lying flat and his fear had given place to pleasure he sat down and chewing a straw sat gravely listening to the music he looks just like our manager when a new piece is on remarked the violinist as he concluded his share of the serenade the piccolo at first frightened the monkey but he soon held out his hands for the instrument which he was allowed to examine the flute did not interest him but the bagpipes reproduced on the violin achieved a triumph he first flattened his nose against the bars and then scrambling to the centre of the cage turned head over heels and lastly sitting down chucked handfuls of straw in the air and over his head smiling as the keeper said with delight and approval the capuchin monkeys are kept in a large cage next to one containing a number of grey macaques the little capuchins were busy eating their breakfast but the violin soon attracted an audience the capuchins dropped their food and clung to the bars listening with their heads on one side with great attention the keeper drew our notice to the next cage there clinging in rows to the front wires was a silent assembly of a dozen macaques all listening intently to the concert which their neighbors were enjoying at the first sounds of the flute most of these ran away 
and the piccolo excited loud and angry screams from all sides clearly in this case the violin was the favorite we then decided to take the opinion of some of the largest and least vivacious animals and selected the young african elephant for our next auditor as this animal had shown the utmost dislike to the violin on a previous occasion the flute was employed to open the concert and with complete success the elephant stood listening with deep attention one foot raised from the ground and its whole body still a rare concession to the influence of music from one of the most restless of all animals so long as the flute continued it remained motionless and listening but the change to the piccolo was resented after the first bar the elephant twisted round and stood with its back to the performer whistling and snorting and stamping its feet the violin was less disliked but the signs of disapproval were unmistakable the deer as before were strangely attracted by the violin and showed equal pleasure in the tones of the flute the gemmel deer for instance ran up at once to listen to the latter their ears and tails being in constant movement at every change of tone or tune even the ostrich seemed to enjoy the violin and flute though it showed marked signs of dislike at the piccolo writhing its neck and walking uneasily up and down its enclosure the ibexes were startled at the piccolo first rushing forward to listen and then taking refuge on a pile of rocks from which however the softer music of the flute brought them down to listen at the railing the wild asses and zebras left the hay with which their racks had just been filled and even the tapir which lives next door got up to listen to the violin while the flute set the indian wild asses kicking with excitement but the piccolo had no charms for any of them and they all returned to their interrupted breakfast so far the piccolo had shown its inability to please in most cases of its power to annoy we soon had an amusing proof the lion house was almost deserted by the few visitors who were in the gardens and the opportunity of making trial of the musical preferences of its inmates was too good to be lost the violin player approached a sleeping tiger which was lying on its side with its feet stretched and touching the bars and played so softly that the opening notes were scarcely audible as the sound rose the tiger awoke and raising its head without moving its body looked for some time with fixed attention at the player it remained for some time in a very fine attitude listening to the music and then making the curious sound which in tiger language does duty for purring it lay down again and dozed the soft music still continued as we were engaged in watching a cheetah which showed great uneasiness and fear at the sounds making sudden starts and bounds raising the fur on its neck and waving its tail from side to side like an angry cat but whatever the cheetah's emotions of dislike the tiger did not share them but lay half or wholly asleep as if the chords which were being played made an agreeable lullaby judge then of our surprise when at the first notes of the piccolo which succeeded the violin the tiger sprang to its feet and rushed up and down the cage shaking its head and ears and lashing its tail from side to side as the notes became still louder and more piercing the tiger bounded across the den reared on his hind feet and exhibited the most ludicrous contrast to the calm dignity and repose with which it had listened to the violin then came the final and most successful experiment the piccolo was stopped and a very soft air played upon the flute the difference in effect was seen at once the tiger ceased to rampage and the leaps subsided to a gentle walk until the animal came to the bars and standing still and quiet once more listened with pleasure to the music no doubt it is possible to draw very different conclusions from experiments of so imperfect a character as those which we have described but it would probably be fair to infer that for some cause the violin and flute which human taste has marked as among the most pleasing of musical instruments are 
those most acceptable to animals under that unknown law which determines this branch of animal aesthetics end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen talking birds the parrots and macaws which live in the parrot house at the zoo are so numerous and noisy that the keeper has no leisure to teach them to talk but a parrot which can say a very few words is very quickly imitated by its neighbors and a new phrase or word travels from cage to cage should the birds in the immediate neighborhood of the accomplished talker be of one of the imitative species among birds there are progressive and non-progressive races which are indifferent to self-improvement and never try to learn a song of their own much less to imitate the voices of other birds or of men but the desire to gain new notes is very much more common than is generally believed and there are at least twenty kinds of birds which are able to reproduce even the complex forms of articulate human speech aristotle mentions an indian parrot which could talk and when it drank wine was somewhat improper habits and language which it had picked up no doubt from phoenician sailors but the most accomplished talker of indian birds is the mina a handsome purple-black bird with a short tail orange legs and beak and bright yellow ear flaps which run round to the back of his head like a collar it is a bold lively bird with a mellow song and whistle of its own its power of reproducing human speech is wonderful and it exhibits the greatest anxiety that the tones should be correct first repeating them softly to itself with its head on one side and then shouting out the words in the insect house at the zoo there lives a fine old mina who was deposited in eighteen eighty three while a visitor is examining the indian moths coming out of their cocoons he may hear behind him a thoughtful cough and the hello shouted with startling suddenness it is the mina anxious to be friendly and to begin a conversation the hindu traders in the bazaars avail themselves of the mina's services in a curious way they teach it to pronounce the holy name of rama and while the master's thoughts are on earthly gains intent the bird compounds for the neglect by shouting incessantly the name of the god and texts in honor of his power if the poet of its indian parrot find its way as he hopes to the paradise of birds and there converted balucres in sua verba pias it must surely meet the mina also another bird which talks better than most and whistles better than any is the piping crow it is a lively black and white bird as large as a rook but far more elegant in form several specimens inhabit the gardens but the best is in the western aviary where it whistles merrily dance the quaker in tones like a flute the american blue jay a most brilliant creature with lines of emerald and turquoise is an admirable mimic of many sounds even of the human voice wilson writes of one which had all the tricks and loquacity of a parrot pilfered all it could conveniently carry off answered to its name with great sociability when called upon and could articulate a number of words pretty distinctly our english jays can also talk and magpies especially if kept in good health and spirits by being allowed partial freedom soon pick up words jackdaws and the american crow can also be made to talk but in all the crow tribe except the piping crow the reproduction of human speech seems to be more a trick of mimicry than an effort to acquire a substitute for song parrots minas and some cockatoos take infinite pains to learn correctly and increase their stock of phrases but the magpie or jay learns what is easy and takes no further trouble even the raven seldom has many words at command though owing to its deep resonant voice and imposing size it attracts more attention than a chattering jay the raven is the largest creature except man that can talk 
and fancy and superstition have naturally exaggerated its powers still the speech of the raven has a depth and solemnity which that of no other bird possesses and whether in boding utterances like those attributed to the raven in barnaby rudge or by edgar allan poe or in plain business like the raven in guilford street which used to say ostler here's a gentleman when a customer arrived its powers are generally marked and recorded a fine bird belonging to a statesman in northumberland used to say poor old ralph or call the collie dog in the exact tones used by its master it's my very own voice its owner used to say laughing as the dog came running in from the garden but the crow tribe though as clever as some parrots are not so easily domesticated and their beaks and tongues are less well suited for the musical sounds of human speech most of the parrots and some cockatoos and macaws have both the mental and physical gifts necessary to make them excel in talking parrots of all classes have fleshy tongues moistened with saliva and the arched beak provides a substitute for our palate and teeth they have also wide nostrils and their natural voices are loud enough and strong enough to equal the volume of human speech in disposition they are highly imitative cockatoos are almost like monkeys in mimicking men for instance if you bow to them they will make elaborate vows if you put your head on one side they will often do so too but with many parrots the desire to learn new sounds is not we think a mere trick of mimicry but the desire to possess a song an accomplishment with which to please identical in kind with the motive which prompts the young of singing birds to learn their parents notes or in the case of the canary to learn and improve upon a song not their own which they have transmitted to their posterity the following account of the development of the talking power in a young parrot of which we have seen much lately is we submit a strong confirmation of this view our informant is a lady whose sympathies are by no means limited to parrots as the context will show and her observations are wholly reliable we bought barry she writes when he was quite young before his feathers were fully grown and we had him about a year before he began to talk then he began to make very odd noises as if he were trying to say words but could not quite do it now he constantly learns new words and sentences and early in the morning i hear him practising them over to himself exactly as our babies used to do in the early morning hours in bed if he improves as much in the next ten years as he had in the last he ought to be able to recite a poem if we teach him there is no reason why a parrot should not continue to increase his stock of phrases as he grows older if the supposition that he looks upon it as an accomplishment for which he is in some way the better is correct the butcher bird for instance and the sedge warbler do not rest satisfied with learning their own notes but often learn and reproduce the notes of other birds in great perfection the mockingbird which like the sedge warbler has a fine song of its own does the same but the parrot has an advantage in being very long live and constantly in human company the young parrot mentioned before gave an excellent instance of the association in its mind of words with things before it could talk it was friendly with a kitten which used to enter its cage this kitten was sent away and for a year there was not another in the house then a grey persian kitten was bought and when introduced to the parrot was at once addressed as kitty a word he had hardly heard since the departure of the other the correctness of parrot's imitation the result no doubt of their careful practice is remarkable a lady of the dutch court visiting the palace in the wood at the hague soon after the death of the late queen of holland was startled by hearing the queen's voice exactly reproduced it was a white cockatoo that had been a great pet of hers which was in a corner of the room parrots have no exclusive liking for the english language they learn german french and dutch quite easily 
another parrot at the hague went through part of the lord's prayer in dutch at an afternoon party with other fragments of its mistress's devotions which it had heard when in her room all small white and sulphur cockatoos seem to say cooper cool when they want their heads scratched we have translated it scratch a poll but it is probably pure parrot language go up to any cockatoo and say this to him at the same time holding the hand well above his head and he will probably answer and gradually lower his head and crest to allow you to gently ruffle the feathers the wrong way macaws do not seem to understand cockatoo language but the gray parrots often use much the same sound it seems to be a call note expressing their willingness to make friends and be petted is the talking of birds due to mental or physical causes is a question often asked in the first place no doubt it is due to the disposition of the bird some parrots and cockatoos never learn to talk though their organs of speech differ in no way from those of others that do they seem to be without the imitative bias like the hawks which have curved beaks and thick tongues but are equally silent but where the disposition to mimic is present physical causes limit or widen the bird's powers parrots and the crow tribe are both imitative but the parrots beaks and tongues are more suited for imitating human speech just as the raven with his high arched beak and big throat excels the jay other birds with still less suitable organs such as the sedge warbler though excellent mimics cannot reproduce human speech at all there seems no reason why parrots if they would breed in confinement should not teach their accomplishments to their young ones as the canaries have done theirs perhaps in time the experiment may be made End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen elephant life in england the strange artificial revival of elephant life in the countries north of the mediterranean and in districts where the bones of the fossil species show that they once lived and flourished naturally is yearly more remarkable the european elephant herd in the present year numbers one hundred and thirteen or about thirty less than the annual catch in the kedahs of the indian government their health seems quite independent of climate to judge from the countries in which they are kept often with very rough provision against the chances and changes of weather russia owns eighteen sweden and norway four france and belgium ten each seven of which are in the great travelling menagerie of the lockharts which migrates to and fro across the franco-belgian frontier germany has thirty-four and england about the same number holland has eight and italy two the british stock is at present supplied almost entirely from burma there only in the east elephants are bred in a half-wild state and not caught in the hedas they are brought over to europe when quite young and are now so cheap that any one who pleases may become the owner of a sober well-behaved little elephant from four to five feet high delivered at the docks for from a hundred and five pounds to a hundred and twenty pounds or not much more than the average price paid for first-class shire horses their subsequent development depends mainly upon their daily treatment in those which spend their lives at ease in the elephant palaces at the zoological gardens the rate of growth is surprising and they soon develop into magnificent animals not surpassed in size by the finest creatures in the stables of indian rajahs the pair of indian elephants now in the gardens are already nine feet and ten feet high at the shoulder respectively though when they reached the gardens in eighteen seventy six they were hardly bigger than a shetland pony but the greater number of english elephants spend their time as hard-working members of the large circuses and travelling menageries and lead a wandering homeless life in curious contrast to the comfort which surrounds the fortunate inmates of the gardens of learned societies 
their deliberate movements mask a wakeful self-possession which hardly ever deserts them and whether marching by the cornfields on the open downs or through the streets of a manufacturing town the elephant never misses a chance of levying contributions of food on the road where didst thou teach thy elephant that trick says peterson sahib in mr rudyard kipling's charming tale of the elephant dance when the animal holds the mahout's son aloft in its trunk was it to help thee to steal green corn from the roof when the ears are put out to dry not green corn protector of the poor melons says the little tumai in england the elephant is not an accomplice but helps himself freely in the back streets of the towns up which he is usually taken to avoid difficulties with the urban police he has ever a sharp eye for an open window or door and many a batch of new loaves smoking on the dresser or bunch of vegetables intended for the midday dinner is extracted through the window before the good woman who is admiring the procession at the door has time to rush back to the rescue at sanger's repository last year a fine gilded car came back for repairs the body of the car had been filled with loaves of bread on saturday night and then locked up an elephant smelt the bread and not being able to open the lock turned the whole car over to see if it would open in that way to the serious damage of the ornamental upper works the clever picture of the disputed toll by charlton adams in which an elephant is painted breaking open a turnpike gate records an amusing incident of elephant travel which occurred many years ago outside the pretty little town of sidmouth in south devon van armbruck's show was expected and the turnpike keeper locked the gate and demanded toll not only for the cars but for the animals the elephant was leading the way and after much fruitless argument its keeper slipping through the turnstile for foot passengers said to the elephant come along fido and the animal at once lifted the gate off its hinges and walked through cool and sagacious on the march they seem also thoroughly to enjoy the tinsel and trappings the music of the brass band the lights noise and crowd of an evening show perhaps there is something in this which recalls to them memories of the gorgeous east take for instance the annual world's fair at the agricultural hall which a hindu would describe as a very fine dumasha and in which no one but an oriental a british working man or an elephant could keep his brains clear for half an hour two large steam runabouts at either end of the hall grinding a different tune with an engine of ten horsepower form only a portion of the bewildering attractions of this palace of delight opposite each of these machines at the time of the writer's last visit was stalled a small indian elephant cool collected and sagacious his business mind wholly intent on raising contributions from the public one occupied a compartment in the centre of what was magnificently described as the mammoth wild animal congregation he was a very little mammoth not five feet high black and bristly supported on one side by a persian goat and a kangaroo and on the other by a couple of llamas in front stood a stall of cakes and to every visitor who came past the elephant pointed out the biscuit pile his trunk maintaining a line true as the needle to the pole while his head and eye followed the movements of the passer-by when quite neglected and alone he tried to attract attention by dancing a kind of double shuffle to the tune of the roundabout some one ventured to give a biscuit to the unfortunate goat its neighbour the elephant dexterously twisted it from between the nibbling lips of the goat and at once mounted guard to prevent any such diversion of its dues again with ears cocked and eye alert he held his trunk stretched out a few inches above the goat's head taking it away for a moment to receive offerings tendered elsewhere but switching it back to the suspected quarter the moment the dainty was swallowed elephants suffer from nervousness and occasionally from unreasoning panic in england just as they do in india 
a windmill has been known to cause them to jib like a horse and a large and very tame female indian elephant at the zoological gardens actually died of fright caused by a thunderstorm in the summer of eighteen fifty five she was out at exercise when a violent and reverberant peal of thunder caused her to break away from her keeper when caught she was found to be in a pitiable state of terror shaking and trembling with violent spasmodic twitchings of the whole body when led back to her stable she continued to show unmistakable symptoms of shock and collapse in a short time she lay down and after a few days died in spite of the anxious and skilled attention which she received from the first minor instances of panic are not uncommon but it is not often that the english trained animal loses his head so as to be a source of danger to the public as so frequently happens in india this is partly because they seldom travel alone in mr sanger's menagerie for instance the elephants are led when on the march by an old chestnut thoroughbred known as the jumping horse from his feet of clearing six five-barred gates in succession it was when out at exercise without its usual companion that one of these elephants bolted at highbury last september and spent an afternoon in rambling about the suburbs of north london the damage done by the animal was greatly exaggerated so far as the writer could judge after a visit to the scene of its exploits the elephant was drinking from a water trough just opposite finsbury park when it took fright at the sudden ringing of a tramcar bell pursued by boys and policemen it ran through the park and down a street near the lower entrance seeing a large wooden gate like that which leads to its own yard at tottenham it burst it open and found itself in a labyrinth of small sheds and wooden stables at the back of some shops threading its way through these with wonderful agility it ultimately arrived in a cul-de-sac in the yard at the back of a fishmonger's shop having thrown off its pursuers by this manoeuvre the elephant proceeded to make itself as much at home as circumstances permitted it first kicked into quiet a collie dog which had resented its intrusion next it picked up its kennel and pitched it over the garden wall then cautiously approaching the kitchen door it looked in to see if any provisions were lying within reach meantime the fishmonger who was taking a nap on his sofa was apprised that there was an elephant in his back yard trespass whether by man or beast is a thing no british householder can put up with so the fishmonger took down his whip and went to turn it off his premises jim was at that moment looking in at the door and elephant and fishmonger met on the threshold victory lay with the latter but only to a limited extent for the elephant still bent on finding provender broke in the door of the stable in which the tradesman kept his pony the door was only six and a half feet high and the elephant more than eight but it stepped in and being familiar with the economy of a stable looked for the corn bin this found it emptied the whole of the contents on the floor and soon ate up a bushel of oats this was not to be borne so the plucky fishmonger determined to catch the robber when it emerged from the stable this it did rather sooner than it had intended as the pony frightened at its strange visitor avenged the collie by kicking the elephant's ribs outside the indignant fishmonger and his man had barred the passage by drawing a light van across it and armed with whips mounted guard on the other side of the barricade jim on his part took a long drink out of a small slate water tank which stood near and having refreshed the inner elephant with food and drink surveyed the situation at his leisure seeing no other way out of the yard than that by which he had entered he walked up and with his head upset the van and brushing past the garrison and through the crowd outside the gates resumed his rambles in the street when captured it was long past seven o'clock and the animal was then well beyond the river lee 
no one was hurt by the elephant and beyond the wanton destruction of a small shed belonging to a fishmonger which it mischievously broke into pieces the size of barrel staves and an unfortunate rush through five garden walls in a rather awkward place in habury terrace it did little harm to property next day it was seen by the writer apparently none the worse for its adventures though a violent scolding administered by the keeper's wife caused it obvious uneasiness it could hardly swallow the hay which it was eating but taking it from its mouth rubbed its knees with it turning its head away and exhibiting signs of the utmost penitence and confusion african elephants are now very rare in this country this is due partly to the total blockade by the dervish power at khartoum of the ancient trade routes down the river at present there are only seven left in europe of these one is in the london zoological gardens one at manchester and one in wombles travelling menagerie but except to complete the collections of learned societies the african is far less in demand than formerly the elephant trade existed mainly to supply performing animals for the circuses and the african is not popular with circus owners or with their keepers or trainers this is strange because it was in the roman circus that the african elephant first became a popular favorite in europe though the first war elephants captured by the legions were baited to death in the arena the later arrivals appealed just as much to the good nature of the populus romanus as do their descendants to the british public this fact suggests one of the few humorous remarks which can safely be credited to a roman and in keeping with the rarity of the event the joke was made by almost the greatest of all romans caius octavius augustus emperor proconsul prince of the senate and pontifex maximus one of the humblest querites anxious to present a petition was so fortunate as to escape the eye of the lictors and to catch that of the emperor who graciously stretched out his hand for the document which he saw lurking beneath the folds of the citizen's gown flustered at the sudden chance of royal protection he pushed his scroll towards the outstretched hand then shrunk back before the thought of almost personal contact with the human embodiment of power come man said augustus do you think you're giving a penny to the elephant patusne te asem elefanto dare today though the public are ready to make the biggest elephant their greatest favorite as in the case of the african jumbo the keepers and trainers have little to say in favor of his kindred their opinion seems almost as unanimous as it is hostile at the zoo it is said that the africans are stupid and therefore dangerous for example supposing an indian elephant to be backing towards the wall and so in danger of crushing its attendants a push or a slap on its huge thigh will instantly be understood as a hint to move forwards or to stop the less careful african would probably take no notice of the warning and the man must either slip on one side or be crushed the trainer alleges that they have bad memories this makes them uncertain performers in the ring they will learn a few tricks without difficulty but when called upon to show off in public they are extremely likely to refuse their parts and either to stand still or bolt to their stable there seems also to be a general feeling among circus attendants that they are unsafe the fine young african elephant now at the zoological gardens has given far more trouble to its keepers than the two large indian specimens during the far longer period of their sojourn in regent's park when quite a baby its obstinacy was as marked as their docility the indian pair would walk around the grounds with their keeper between them the man placing a hand on each of their backs and the two solemn little fellows walking in step on either side the african would not even take the bath which most elephants look upon as one of their greatest treats in hot weather he roared and kicked and made such a determined resistance that it was necessary to rig up a block and tackle and haul him into the water when there he sulked and seemed prepared to undergo the fate of drowning rather than the humiliation of obedience 
the recollection that you may bring a horse to the water but cannot make him drink hardly expresses the feelings of his keepers when they realize that the tackle which is sufficient to haul an elephant into the water may be unsuited for hauling him out ultimately the chinaman's recipe for driving a pig if you can no pushy no pulley then try plenty stick was adopted with success the african elephant's uncertainty has one redeeming feature it may shy or jib on one day and get the better of its keeper for an hour or more but he does not necessarily therefore lose prestige in the eyes of the animal and can assert his authority next day unimpaired an indian elephant if once the master in a deliberate act of disobedience loses from that moment all respect for the man whom it has worsted inferiority in parlor tricks and in comparative docility does not excuse the strange neglect which the native species receives as a beast of burden suited for the work of african pioneering dr schlater writing from the offices of the zoological society in hanover square says that there have been african elephants in the gardens of the society for nearly twenty years and that in his opinion they are quite as intelligent as those of the indian species though perhaps not quite so docile he suggests that a keda of indian elephants and their attendants should be transported to the east african coast and that the indian elephants should be used to capture and tame their african brethren general gordon shortly before the disaster at khartoum wrote to dr schlater advocating the employment of the elephant in africa and making inquiries as to its possibility the size which the african elephant will attain under favorable conditions in this country is well illustrated by the case of jumbo when this elephant came to the gardens he was about four feet high and weighed seven hundred pounds at first he was troublesome but after a short time became perfectly manageable and grew very rapidly this was attributed by mr bartlett in his remarks on a paper read before the society of arts in eighteen eighty four by colonel sanderson to good food and a daily bath in hot weather in sixteen years he grew from four feet to eleven feet in height by that time he was probably twenty-three years old an elephant does not reach its prime till thirty-five and jumbo increased another ton after a year at barnum's he was therefore probably not full grown at the time of his lamented death the reasons for his sale were not very clearly stated at the time of his transfer the cause of sale in the case of any animal is never a point on which the vendor is anxious to dwell sold for no fault but solely because the owner is giving up hunting is the favorite formula at tattersall's and an elephant which is leaving a zoological garden to appear in a monster circus might be supposed to be disqualified for service in the latter if it possessed any vice which made it an undesirable inmate of the former the inference is more apparent than real for the harder work and exercise at barnum's could hardly fail to make a change in the impressionable elephant temperament but a pleasing mystery surrounded the deal the shrewd sense of barnum himself nursed the growing excitement on both sides of the atlantic with a genial dexterity which will ever be considered a masterpiece of management among the illustrious exhibitors of the future the society on their side kept their own counsel and the sale of the big elephant was briefly alluded to in the report as made for satisfactory reasons given by the responsible executive neither did the price received figure as a separate item in the receipts but as the amount credited to garden sales exceeded that of the previous year by about eighteen hundred pounds we may assume that the sum paid by mr barnum was well within that limit a good authority informs the writer that the net payment was a thousand pounds 
meantime the jumbo boom was immensely profitable to the society's revenue the fees paid for admission to the gardens rose by fifty five hundred pounds in the year an increase which the secretary's report attributes to the great interest taken by the public in the removal of a favourite animal the splendid new reptile house with its unrivalled facilities for observing the habits of the snakes lizards and alligators was the result of this most welcome windfall it was in fact the legacy of the african elephant to the zoo the facts as to jumbo's state of mind were afterwards clearly given by mr dartlett during the last years of his life in the gardens he became at times very excited and terrified every one who came near him except his keeper scott who had extraordinary control over him scott added mr bartlett was a very curious man himself and it was with the greatest difficulty that he could be persuaded to allow another man to assist him in the management of the huge animal it was feared that if scott fell ill or were injured by the elephant he would be entirely unmanageable for no other man dared go near him in his house though when out at exercise he was perfectly quiet at night however he would tear about and almost shake the house down and became such a source of trouble that the council decided to part with him he was quite tractable in barnum's show and became the father of two little elephants scott went with him and after his death in a collision with a locomotive was offered the charge of a large stud of elephants which was shown afterwards at olympia but his sturdy independence rebelled against the wearing of costume which barnum's feeling for proprieties of the arena enjoined faithful to his old charge he mounted guard over the stuffed jumbo and preserved his hide from the knives of relic hunting visitors in conclusion we may contrast the knowledge and skill shown in the management of jumbo at a critical time with the fate of an elephant which exhibited much the same symptoms in the liverpool zoological gardens in eighteen forty eight before the present race of english elephant keepers had been trained to their work this elephant like jumbo was said to be the finest in europe it cost eight hundred pounds eleven years before its death and was said to be then worth a thousand pounds it had already killed one keeper accidentally as it was thought but not long afterwards it struck down and crushed a second such was the panic of the owners that two six-pounder cannon were bought from the albert docks and set loaded opposite to the elephant's house in case it should succeed in escaping as it remained quiet two ounces of prussic acid and twenty-five grains of aconite were given to it in its food as the poison did not seem to take effect thirty men from the fifty second regiment were ordered to shoot it the first fifteen delivered their fire and as the creature did not fall the next squad discharged their muskets and the elephant sank dead with thirty bullets in his body together with enough poison to kill a ship's company it may fairly be claimed that we have made some progress in the management of the elephant in england since the days when the owner of such a valuable animal was not only incapable of keeping it with safety but ignorant of the means to kill it humanely the average duration of their life in this country is now probably well over fifty years and though this does not contrast favourably with the eighty years of the indian studs there is every prospect that it will increase the office of mahout promises to become almost as hereditary here as in india and while traditions of elephant management are handed down from one generation of keepers to another so it is noticed that the new and acquired habits practised by the more experienced and sagacious animals are observed and copied by the young arrivals the elephant is being slowly europeanized End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen wanted a new meat the lack of variety in those meats which whether flesh or fowl 
must always form the groundwork and basis of an english bill of fare is a want keenly felt but most difficult to remedy to judge from the list of fresh food which the improved transport of the last few years has made available for the london dinner-table a natural inference would be that so far as novelty has been studied we had made provision not for man as humanized by schools of cookery but for a race of fruit-eating apes we have a dozen new fruits shaddocks limes custard apples bananas pines italian figs pomegranates lychees ground nuts gourds watermelons and avocado pears but among the thousands of tons of foreign game imported yearly there is hardly a beast or bird which may not be had in better quality and condition at home except the prairie bird and the quail for those canvas-backed ducks which escape the keen search of the new york dealers and find their way across the atlantic alight only on the tables of city companies and millionaires like the caladras of old that appeared only at the deaths of kings yet there are probably twenty people in this country who have eaten canvas-backed duck for one who has ever tasted swan or rather cygnet the finest waterfowl for the table alike in size and flavor a bird easy to rear most prolific rivaling even the breast of a teal without the fatal drawback of that excellent little bird that no one has ever been able to get enough of it even now though so neglected by the world swans may be had from the norwich swan pit for two pounds each they weigh some sixteen pounds and with them is forwarded an ancient recipe for cooking them done into rhyme by a person of quality another fowl which was once reserved for the tables of kings and is now hardly thought good enough for aldermen is the peacock what roast swan is to roast goose such is roast peacock to roast turkey many owners of country houses who keep peacocks and let them run wild and nest in their woods and shrubberies take little trouble either to fatten or cook the pea chicks if they did they would perhaps take more pains to rear these birds for the table the meat is very white and of exceedingly fine and close grain and has the true game flavor with none of the stringiness of the common turkey the american wild turkey is however an even finer bird for the table than the peacock those which appear in the poulterers shops of london generally arrive in such bad condition from careless packing and refrigerating that they are inferior to the domestic bird but when allowed to run wild and nest in english woods as is done on some estates on its merits and apart from any tricks of cookery it is perhaps the very best land bird that is available for food the game flavor is not too pronounced but gives a character to the whole which is altogether absent in the tame black turkeys of the farmyard but flesh and not fowl is what is mainly desired to widen the possibilities of the dinner table fatted swans or peacocks or american turkeys might be increased and multiplied without affording more than an occasional relief to the monotony of the menu and the brain-searching of housekeepers what is wanted is some new and large animal whose flesh has a character of its own which would readily distinguish it from beef or mutton and an excellence which shall make it independent of any special treatment in cooking something which shall combine the game flavour with the substantial solidity of a leg of mutton an increase in the quantity of venison reared in this country naturally suggests itself and it is not impossible that in neglecting the produce of our deer parks we are hardly less careless than in losing sight of the culinary possibilities of the swannery good doe venison may be bought in the neighbourhood of some large parks at a much lower price than mutton and the quantity of first-class venison which finds its way to london is surprisingly little considering the number of parks and private herds in the country it is objected that deer can never pay to fat for food because the annual growth of their horns reduces them so much in condition as for a time to make the venison worthless 
but this applies only to the bucks stags may be kept like bullocks and doe venison might still be remunerative as early as seventeen forty an enterprising jersey squire of the name of chevalier who had succeeded to an estate in suffolk whose descendants still constantly sit in parliament had formed a small park for fattening deer and sending them up to london his accounts of the cost and profits of the enterprise are still preserved and he abandoned the scheme not from difficulties encountered in fattening or selling the deer but because of the uncertainty of carriage to london venison even when reared under the present unscientific method or rather want of method varies greatly in quality that from certain parks being much superior to that grown on less suitable pasture and it is not too much to hope that if bred and fattened solely for the table venison would be in demand as something more than an occasional luxury but swan peacock and venison are after all only revivals of the old bill of fare which was available in the households of old england to find a new meat we must take stock of the world's resources of animal food and inquire after due survey if there does not still exist some neglected quadruped which will furnish what we seek roughly speaking our main supply of animal food is drawn either from the rodents the ruminants or the pachyderms represented by the rabbit the ox or sheep and the pig to vary the supply at our disposal we shall probably not be able to go beyond these limits for the general experience of civilized man has already pronounced judgment on the question and science supports the verdict it is no good to eat a wolf for the wolf has already got the benefit of eating the lamb and left no surplus for us of the three great tribes the rodents may be dismissed from our search for those that are not already used as food are either too small to be useful as the lemming or the guinea pig or too repulsive in appearance like the capybara or in habits like the rat of the pachyderms we find only one which is domesticated for food the dear familiar berkshire or yorkshire piggy the larger pachyderms are too big the smaller like the peccary too savage the warthog and other african varieties too repulsive clearly then we must have resource to the list of ruminants if we are to find one to add to the british bill of fare at first the choice seems wide enough it embraces all the deer tribe the wild sheep and antelopes goats and ibexes which are numerous but they all possess a rank and disagreeable flavour which must prevent their coming into the list of first-class food the possibility of extending the supply of venison we have already considered the wild sheep would probably differ so little in flavour from mutton as to make it hardly worth while to domesticate them though those of the himalaya will breed freely in confinement the antelopes and wild oxen therefore alone remain and it is among their number that the animal wanted must be found if it is to be found at all if the accounts of african hunters are reliable the venison obtained from the larger kinds of antelope found in south and central africa is really excellent that of the kudu the oryx and the eland being the best perhaps the highest modern authority on the subject is the opinion of lord randolph churchill those who read of and sympathized with his account of his sufferings under the cuisine of the cape steamers must have marked with a feeling of relief that in his letters to the daily graphic he confessed to having made an excellent supper on stewed roan antelope his verdict on the eland has not been given but its flesh is said to surpass that of all other antelopes by as much as welsh mutton surpasses lincolnshire teg ten educated palates have pronounced it peculiarly excellent having in addition the valuable property of being tender immediately after the animal is killed which makes it much appreciated in central africa where the meat is usually tough and dry in addition to the quality of the meat the eland has the additional recommendation of large size 
a full-grown eland is as large as a two-year-old shorthorn and has far more the appearance of a high-bred indian bullock than of an antelope its horns are short and straight pointing backwards and it has a dewlap like an ox it can live on the hardest fare and soon grows fat on good pasture best of all it becomes quite tame and is easily acclimatized when lord darby the president of the zoological society died in eighteen fifty one he directed that his herd of five elands at nowsley should be given to the society for use in their menagerie they multiplied fast and six fawns were produced between eighteen fifty one and eighteen fifty five and it was found that at two years old they stood thirteen hands at the shoulder the protection necessary was not more than that usual in fattening fine cattle and the society resolved to sell their fawns for the experiment of acclimatization in english parks lord hill bought a young male and two females for his large park at hawkstone but according to whittaker's deer parks of england none of these survive the marquis of breadalbane also bought three in eighteen sixty one twenty one calves had been born in the zoological gardens since lord darby's gift ten years before and there is still the nucleus of a herd of their descendants at the zoo though their size and stamina is diminished by interbreeding it does not appear that eland breeding is now followed with much enthusiasm by the owners of large parks and chases partly no doubt because the shorthorn mania was for a time such an absorbing pursuit among country gentlemen as to leave no thoughts for any other experiments it seems a waste of the resources of nature to allow these fine animals to be exterminated as they soon will be in our new african empire the argument that because south african negroes have not tamed them we should not attempt to do it is of little force the african keeps cows to give milk meat was supplied in inexhaustible quantities by the wild antelopes and other game and with far less trouble than domesticated animals give until the white man with guns destroyed them we are too apt to forget that england owes the best of her trees vegetables and animals to other countries all are now so good that we are prone to believe that neither can be added to or improved perhaps admiral roos was right when he declared that it made him simply sick when an arab cross was proposed for our english thoroughbreds but why should we not save the eland the harness antelope and the kudu and other large african species from extermination america has almost allowed the bison to perish shall we not take warning and preserve for our own use the splendid african antelopes which within the memory of man were a thousand times more numerous than they are to-day end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty an experiment in animal preservation when the founders of our zoological gardens formed plans for acclimatizing foreign animals in england they could scarcely have imagined that the gardens might form almost the last preserve of animals then living in enormous numbers in america yet it is not beyond the limits of possibility that our zoological gardens may within a few years contain the last living specimens of the american bison it is said that thirty of the surviving herd in yellowstone park were recently killed by poachers for the sake of their hides and horns and the chances of their survival in the united states are thus further diminished if they do not disappear altogether it will be in a great degree due to an experiment in the preservation of wild animals and natural scenery undertaken by a wealthy american mr austin corbin the story of the enterprise so far as it has yet appeared is given in a connected form in the last report of the smithsonian institution of washington mr corbin is a railway king who owned a property on long island 
there he amused himself by keeping a few deer at his home farm not in a park but much as antelopes elands and bison are kept in the queen's stockyard with the domestic cattle at windsor this was in eighteen eighty six six years later mr corbin conceived and carried out an idea for extending his deer farm on a scale which a comparison with some of the forest areas most familiar to englishmen scarcely enables us to grasp he bought twenty two thousand acres in a compact block and to these he subsequently added an adjacent territory of eight thousand acres more and reserved them as a sanctuary for all such of the large game of north america with the exception of bears pumas wolves and foxes as could be obtained to stock the ground the area so reserved is larger by a quarter than the twenty two thousand acres of the forest of dean windsor forest contains barely fourteen thousand acres and the new forest alone of the ancient game preserves of the crown exceeds it in dimensions but all these are forests in the proper sense not enclosed parks the animals of which are fenced in and protected the corbin preserve is a true park surrounded with a fence high enough to confine a wapiti and strong enough to resist the charge of a bull bison and entered by nine gates each under the supervision of a resident warder contrasted with an english park it differs alike in dimensions and general purpose here the object of the enclosure is to surround the mansion with a wild domain in which deer may run wild within certain limits and trees reach their finest proportions without formality the park and its contents are really subordinate to the daily pleasure and convenience of the resident owner though in some cases notably that of warwick castle small and ancient deer parks exist at a distance from the mansion and form preserves much in the spirit of mr corbin's forest but this enclosure of thirty-five square miles in a ring fence must be without a rival either in modern or ancient history though perhaps the paradises of the persian satraps filled with all kinds of wild beasts and trees watered by numerous streams and enclosed by walls parks like that in which xenophon and the greek captains were led to expect that the army of the great king was lying in wait to destroy them might have approached it in size the modern paradise lies in new hampshire almost the northernmost of the old states on the atlantic slope between vermont and maine and encloses a portion of the white mountains and hill lands running northwards from the alleghanies to the banks of the st lawrence east of montreal it is a temperate and well wooded region and water is abundant the park itself contains two large pools of twenty and thirty acres and nearly two miles of streams with timber of all sizes and good pasture land bison beaver and deer should all find favorable conditions in such a spot the work of stocking the park was doubtless made easy by the owner's indifference to expense eighty thousand pounds were laid out on the purchase of the land and the costly fencing alone but mr corbin was fortunate in being able to obtain twenty-five bison from the few survivors of the wild herds to start his buffalo ranch those bred in the paddocks of england during the last fifteen years have steadily deteriorated in size and stamina the cows growing yearly more weedy and less prolific but there must be some source not generally known from which they can still be bought though at a high price cross the liverpool dealer is said to have sold ten cows two years ago and those in mr corbin's preserve show a disposition to increase and multiply the history of the chillingham and chartley wild cattle which though inbred for generations remain vigorous and prolific when allowed to live their natural life in parks not a tenth of the area of that in which the bison now roam 
gives good ground for hoping that the existence of the bison may now be prolonged for such time as american sentiment may think fit to preserve them besides the bison the original stock in the corbin park includes sixty wapiti deer or elk as they are called throughout north america seventy deer probably the black-tailed deer of the rocky mountains six caribou the american reindeer six of the rare pronghorned antelopes twelve moose or elk proper eighteen wild boars and by this time it is hoped a colony of beavers of these the moose the antelope and the beaver must soon be extinct species unless protected by some such means as mr corbin has chosen to preserve them the caribou seems to have migrated beyond the extreme margin of human habitation though rapidly disappearing in the northwest immense herds were seen last summer by explorers in the almost unknown barren lands fringing the arctic sea and the mouths of the copper mine and fish rivers the hunters employed in the capture of the various deer were fortunate enough to discover a moose yard in the deep snows of northern canada in which three hundred animals were collected on the area which they had stamped down and made safe for movement amidst the snow six of these were found isolated from the herd and adroitly frightened into the deep snow in which they were easily captured the weight of the animals breaking through the crust of ice above and leaving them helpless these were sent with others a distance of two thousand miles by train in four days but neither they nor any of the deer would feed while in the train and several of them died either in transit or after their arrival twenty deer were also killed in a railway collision but more than two hundred animals were before long collected in what is to be their permanent home, and the Wapiti alone have already doubled in number. The limits to be set to the increase of each species, should the experiment prove successful in all or most cases, will no doubt be matter for careful inquiry. Large as the area is at their disposal, the space required by wild animals is far larger than that which suffices for domestic creatures the three acres of good land which is supposed to suffice for the poor man's cow expands to twenty-five acres of the best deer forest as the yearly keep of a single stag and setting the increased size of bison moose and wapiti against the better pasturage of the new hampshire hills it is probable that the proportion of game to acreage in corbin park cannot safely be increased beyond the limits which experience shows to be necessary in the forest of blair athol two of the species the moose and the beaver live entirely on the branches of trees the beavers are far more destructive than the moose and will soon level all the timber near the streams a single family in the island of butte cut down one hundred and eighty-seven large trees in ten years and it is not likely that they will be less industrious in what was once their native home twenty thousand hawthorn trees have been imported from england to be planted not as a vast and beautiful feature in the landscape of the park an experiment well worthy of the author of the enterprise but as a hedge to take the place of the wire fencing which now surrounds the enclosure the beavers will soon convey the thorn trees to their lodges and make an easy road for the escape of the rest of the colony nothing is said of the removal of human occupiers from this area though it seems improbable that such favourable soil should be void of inhabitants even if the exhaustion of the land in the old states and the movements of the inhabitants westward has been as rapid as recent observers would have us believe new hampshire is a small state yet we hear no protests against the exclusion of population from an area one-third of that of the new forest on the contrary the project seems welcomed as suggesting a new employment for millionaires preservation of every kind is costly and as a rule makes no return in a case in which sentiment and not prudence suggests it 
when states intervene it is generally too late and there is always a suspicion that the rights of the poor may in some way be interfered with just as in the case of preservation by ancient landowners whether of game or trees or streams or mountains but though mr corbin's enterprise provokes no suspicion and seems to have gratified american sentiment he is evidently aware that time and continuity are essential for its success the association of his son with the fortunes of the park gives a guarantee of permanence not perhaps equal to the traditions that have maintained chillingham and chartley but sufficient to ensure a fair trial for the experiment End of chapter 20chapter twenty one of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one jamracks jamracks the ancient and original centre of the wild beast trade in london lies in what is now called st george street but was until late years known as ratcliffe highway not many minutes walk beyond the tower it existed when the king's lions were kept in the tower itself and was established thirty years before sir stamford raffles conceived the notion of the zoological society the shop itself is almost the oldest building in the street far older than the docks and their lofty warehouses opposite and dating back as far as some of the later work in the tower itself the main bulk of the traffic from the docks which lined the river for miles below rolls past its doors which opened to receive the ship captain's ventures of birds and wild beasts armorer and curios idols and fetishes mummy and dyak skulls weapons and snakeskins and the odd zoological bric-a-brac which are part of the minor stock in trade of the naturalist salesman the front of the shop in which these are displayed looks like an old picture time and varnish with the dust of the docks have given a rich mellow colour both to frame and contents in curious contrast to the brilliant hues of the parrots and lorries which fill the cages in the adjacent window in the little office at the back the steady traffic in wild beasts has gone on for a hundred years between the jamracks and the ship captains in the first instance and later with the buyers employed by zoological gardens and menageries frank bucklin van omberg and mr bartlett and most of the great circus and menagerie proprietors have sat in the old windsor chairs and discussed the merits of new purchases or schemes for the capture of rare and valuable animals few even of the most ancient business houses of that most picturesque and characteristic part of london the city and the eastern wards which cluster round the tower have retained their old forms so entirely as this some of the old back parlours and lobbies are still provided with the racks of blunderbusses and bayonets which the traditions of the gordon riots suggested as a terror to daylight robbers and a guarantee of security to timid depositors others keep upon their walls the charters and firmans granted to adventurous merchants by sultans and chieftains whose territories are now well-regulated provinces of the british empire but the trade of jamracks has this peculiarity that it always deals in commodities which as a rule disappear before advancing civilization and must be drawn from beyond the ever encroaching limits of common commerce from the regions where the half-armed savage still robs the cubs of the gatulian lioness and barters his barbaric spoils for the wares of the civilized west so in the old room at jamracks the barbaric settings have gathered almost without intention round the spot which the nexus of commerce links with the rough outside edge of the white man's world and the dusty shields and assages the bolas and bows 
the matchlocks and two-handed swords of the rhinoceros hunting arabs are mingled with sharks and crocodile skulls scalps and tomahawks wampum and indian relics and whatever in the unnumbered lumber of the world of savage sport and warfare corresponds to the tamer accessories of the gun-room in our english country houses the place of the favourite dog before the fire to continue the simile is of course taken by some foreign pet which is the favourite of the moment at the time of the writer's first visit to this naturalist sanctum the goddess of the hearth was a lovely little japanese pug puppy the little creature was covered with the long silky black and white hair which in the japanese pug like the japanese bantam takes the place of the shorter and less elegant covering of the western breed it was carefully clothed in a neatly fitting flannel jacket and apparently had all the fondness for english habits which distinguishes the cultivated classes of modern japan it sat up and begged and wagged its tail like an educated little british dog and carefully measuring the appreciation and temper of its visitor suddenly dropped ceremony and bounded into his lap there after an apologetic wriggle it curled itself up and its master discussed the present and future of the animal trade a great revival in this ancient industry has recently taken place and at the time of the writer's visit Carl Hagenbeck, the largest owner of wild beasts in the world, and exhibitor of the model zoological gardens at the World's Fair, was making a rapid inspection of the stock of animals on view, in order to make purchases for his new gardens in New York. In most forms of livestock buying, the necessary acquaintance with the points of two or three species is sufficiently difficult to master in the present case it was necessary not only to judge the merits of the animals but to identify the species with certainty but once among the stalls and cages the deals for a dozen different species were made in less time and with less discussion than a berkshire farmer would feel due to the merits of a litter of pigs the stables as the wild beast store is called lie away from the shop and the main street up a narrow court like those which run back from the north of fleet street up this passage every animal must be either driven or carried before it can be deposited in safe quarters in the store and though its length and want of breadth lend themselves to blocking the escape of any creature which might succeed in breaking out it must offer considerable difficulties to the transit of a large iron cage or of a refractory camel or elephant the lower story of the stables resembles a large well-warmed london cow-house with antelopes deer or kangaroos tethered to the walls and mangers or stalled in loose boxes instead of alderneys and shorthorns an immense oodad with wild yellow eyes horns curving in an almost complete circle and a thick shaggy beard continued into a fringe down its chest and sweeping the ground between its feet occupied the first loose box most of the other pens were vacant as a large shipment had left that day for the united states a steep flight of steps leads to the second and third stories in which the animals are stored not for exhibition but just as they have come from the ships in the docks close by there are no fixed rows of cages for the carnivora or wooden pens for the large birds and harmless quadrupeds because the former are delivered in their sea cages and the latter have grown used to confinement and are either tethered or confined by wattle hurdles in corners or against the walls the gallery is warm and dark an important element in the comfort of the nervous night-feeding animals and of the more savage felidae lighted only by one or two gas jets and redolent of sweet scented clover hay the floor is encumbered with boxes of various dimensions with all kinds of inmates from squirrels and civet cats to pumas and panthers the small size of the box or cage in which a large leopard or panther will live in fairly good health for several weeks makes their transport an easy matter they curl up like a cat in a basket and if kept quiet and in the dark do not greatly suffer in condition 
the semi-darkness and the position of the boxes on the floor make it difficult to see the full beauty of the prisoners within nor is it desirable to approach the roughly constructed cages too closely the animals in jamracks are not the half domesticated creatures of the lion house at the zoo but the wild and savage denizens of tropical jungles captured but not yet cowed or even reconciled to the proximity of man as parts of the fronts as well as the sides and backs of the cages are boarded over the visitor naturally sees a view from a point somewhat close to the bars an approach which is at once converted into a sudden movement in retreat as the animal inside appears to explode a crash of claws upon the bars a sharp throat-splitting blast of growls and a glimpse of white teeth and yellow-green eyes in the darkness is the instantaneous expression of the panther's dislike to intrusion if the shutters are removed and the light admitted the beautiful creature shrinks slowly backward and downward its soft and elastic body slowly contracting and flattening with the fluid suppleness of a python's folds a pretty pair of young african cheetahs in another box spat and bared their teeth with a show of high resentment which would not have discredited wild beasts of a far larger growth and maintained a bickering sputter of repugnance and hostility till the offending gaze was withdrawn two large and richly coloured patagonian pumas a pair of leopards and several striped hyenas and small jungle and civet cats occupied the same gallery of these the pumas were perfectly tame as safe to caress and as willing to be petted as a cat they do not even catch the infection of ill-temper from other animals and the writer observed a puma arching its back and rubbing its face against an attendant's hand quite unmoved by the hostile growls of the panther its neighbour these pumas had probably been domesticated for some time and a certain proportion of the fiercer animals which arrive at the docks must have been in captivity for some time previous to shipment men who habitually deal with wild animals are quick to see the difference between the savage and the half-tamed beast van ambrug the celebrated lion tamer is said to have called at jamracks to purchase a leopard he soon selected one from the boxes and when asked how he would like it to be sent produced a steel chain and collar from the pocket of his greatcoat he then opened the box dragged the leopard out put on the collar and hauled it down the passage and into a four-wheeled cab in which he drove off to astley's with his purchase the strange medley of animal forms in the upper chambers the gleam of green and yellow eyes in their dusky recesses and the juxtaposition of creatures whose natural instinct is inveterately hostile with others which are their common prey give to the chance menagerie at jamracks a character quite distinct from any exhibited collection the creatures are there for sale not for show and meantime are kept as quiet and as close together as due attention to health permits the panther's room was shared by an african black buck from the cape a black-tailed jackal various kangaroos and wallabies and a pair of demoiselle cranes on another story were a happy family of monkeys lemurs and chinese dogs a pair of cassowaries a vishaka foxes large and small native companion cranes a brown tasmanian opossum cotamundis a beautifully marked civet cat and two small siamese porcupines this list though apparently no bad nucleus for a zoological garden is only a fraction of the number which is usually stored in the depot by the docks there is a sudden and unprecedented increase in the demand for wild animals at present not only for the continent but for the united states the stocks in most of the european zoological gardens have decreased of late a shrinkage partly caused by the closure of the sudan by the dervishes 
in america the popularity of the great menagerie at the world's fair has created a sudden demand for wild animals of all kinds circuses and private menageries are competing with the zoological gardens and scientific societies for rare and interesting animals and the demand for america is far greater than for the continent of europe after five or six years of neglect there is such a boom in the wild beast trade as is hardly remembered until the expeditions which hagenbeck and others have dispatched into central africa via berbera and into borneo and the west coast of africa return there is little to fall back upon but the average supply which arrives without system and in chance ships a single purchase by an agent from the philadelphia zoological gardens included a leopard a hyena a pair of cheetahs a bornean bear antelopes emus and other birds other zoological gardens are being laid out and built in new york and the cities of the west but it may be doubted whether even from jamracks the inhabitants will readily be found to occupy them the frailness of the cages in which many of the animals arrive from their sea voyage is matter for some surprise they are nearly always wooden boxes hardly stronger than a sound packing case with a front of strong iron rails the secret of their safe carriage lies in their own stupidity like a lobster in a pot they always endeavour to escape from the front springing towards the light and it is precisely at this point that the strongest part of the case the iron bars blocks the way when the last black leopard arrived at the zoo as a present from the duke of newcastle who had purchased it at singapore when on a tour round the world it was soon shifted from his travelling cage into the fine new den it was to occupy in the lion house as it was known to be a violent and savage creature an inner lining of steel netting about eight inches across the mesh had been fixed inside the vertical bars the leopard on being turned into the den at once made a violent spring towards the light and pitching head foremost against the netting screen bulged it out to the exact contour of its face it never seems to occur to these creatures that they could easily gnaw their way through the wooden sides of their temporary prisons and escape like the hyena which recently maintained itself for a week in the hold of a large cargo steamer and was kept in good temper by joints of prime new zealand mutton until on the unloading of the vessel the hyena was captured in the congenial cavern in which it had taken up its residence the well-known escape of the tiger which the elder mr jamrack recaptured in the street was partly due to the weakness of a cage an indian tiger had been brought up from the docks and was about to be transferred to a larger den in the stables this animal showed more judgment than most of its kind for it used its back in the fashion of a lever and burst the rear of the cage it then trotted down the narrow passage and into the main street then known by its old name of ratcliffe highway the only person who waited its approach was a little boy of eight years old who had put out his hand to touch it the tiger patted him with his paw and of course the child fell on the pavement though the blow was so gently given that the child was stunned but not injured the tiger then picked him up by the loose part of his jacket and was trotting off with him exactly like a cat carrying a mouse when mr jamrack the elder came running up in pursuit he at once sprang on the tiger's back and grasping its throat with both hands drove his thumbs into the soft part below the jaw the tiger dropped the child and mr jamrack literally drove it home like some domestic animal only with a crowbar instead of a stick the courage and readiness of mr jamrack's attack can hardly be overestimated the creature was an absolutely new arrival as to whose temper nothing but the worst could be imagined after so prompt an escape and the attack on the child the native coolness and indifference to human powers of resistance of the tiger could hardly be better illustrated than by the unabashed impudence with which this tiger after months of captivity by human beings after being fed moved hither and thither 
lowered into ships and hoisted onto keys by men whom it was powerless to injure picked up the first nice little boy it met after two minutes of freedom and trotted off to make a meal of him in a city of four millions of people mr jamrack has been good enough to give the writer details of another and less well-known tiger escape which took place on the northwestern railway near weeden station about fifteen years ago the tiger was being sent to a dealer in liverpool and was in a cage fastened to the bottom of an open truck the cage was amply strong but another train loaded with huge iron girders that had been improperly packed and projected from the sides of the trucks passed that in which the tiger was travelling and one of the girders struck the cage and smashed it to pieces the tiger was unhurt but the cage fell to pieces around it and left it sitting on the truck like a pigeon when the trap is pulled the tiger at once bounded off and by a strange chance alighted almost in the middle of a flock of sheep it knocked down half a dozen and after making a meal of one of these trotted off up the line the news soon spread writes mr jamrack and caused the greatest consternation everywhere fortunately a troop of soldiers happened to be quartered at weeden and these were called out and packed away in a railway train which followed up the tiger at a slow rate and out of the railway carriage the soldiers potted away at the tiger until they killed him my father always considered he had a good claim against the railway company for damages but did not follow it up and consequently was a heavy loser the most troublesome arrival to recapture which ever escaped from the stables in london was a large baboon it contrived to get clear of its cage overnight and opened the window of the room in which it was confined thence it leapt on to the roof of a house opposite crawling over the tiles says a writer to whom mr jamrack told the story it ensconced itself among the chimneys pleased with the warmth and chattered defiance at its pursuers then a grand commotion ensued among the neighbors letters and messages of horror and entreaty poured in to mr jamrack he was even threatened with legal proceedings all sorts of methods were tried to catch the fugitive but an ape's feet are more at home on narrow ledges and steep inclines than feet cased in boot leather for days the baboon kept his liberty consoling himself for the chilliness of the nights by abundant frolics during the day little wonder if the children were afraid to go to bed at the top of the house or if the servant girls looked up nervously from their toilettes at any sound on the tiles outside fearing to see the face of that odious creature glaring in through the glass pane there could be no rest until he was caught and caged eventually he was enticed into a room through an open window and a blanket having been thrown over him he was caught and carried home in triumph the panic caused by a big monkey at large is almost equal to that which follows the escape of some really dangerous beast only in the present year a large mandrel owned by a lady was pursued and shot without mercy in essex as a precaution against its well-known ferocity the most interesting side of our profession says mr jamrack is the possible arrival of new creatures animals never seen alive in europe or new to our experience the chance of such an event is never quite absent even in eighteen ninety four he received a strange deer from japan he sent this at once to professor milne edwards at the jardin des plants of paris who pronounced it to be a new species the prices of rare animals often differing little in general appearance from common species are high enough at present to make the wild beast trade a lucrative business but it would be a mistake to suppose that the pursuit of this profession or even the business of owning and exhibiting wild beasts is solely a matter of sale and barter or mere money-making in all connected with the sale or management of wild animals with whom the writer is acquainted there is a genuine naturalist appreciation in the creatures they deal in often existing side by side with something of that pride in maintaining animals in good condition which they share in common with the whole race of breeders of prize cattle racehorse trainers masters of hounds and huntsmen down to the laborers with their pigs 
from the highest to the lowest they seem to know most of what is going on not only in the different menageries of england but also on the continents the masters and owners will meet one another often in the course of business and the men pay cross visits to rival establishments and discuss the latest additions or losses we seldom fail to see at a circus or exhibition of performing animals the well-known faces of some of the keepers at the zoo and when going round the houses at the gardens the best-known owners of circuses the lion tamers or elephant trainers of the ring may often be seen musing in front of the cages and taking stock of their inmates a suffolk villager in london nearly always chooses the meat market at smithfield as the first place in which to spend a happy day and a wild beast keeper goes naturally for change of scene to another wild beast menagerie End of chapter twenty one Chapter twenty two of Life at the Zoo by Charles John Cornish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty two Expression in the Animal Eye. The wonderful compound eyes of insects recently formed the subject of a paper read by Lord Raleigh before the Royal Society, recording observations of minute accuracy and ingenious measurement by Mr. A. Malik the general conclusions formed as to the actual power of these complex organs rather raises than lessens the claim to efficiency of the simpler vertebrate eye the compound eye pieces together the separate impressions of the object seen and should any of the facets be out of order a blank must be left in the corresponding part of the picture the only advantage which is claimed for insect sight is that at the shortest distances the object seen is still in focus which partly accounts for the short-sighted manner in which most insects seem to examine any object in which they are particularly interested seen under a powerful microscope and measured by the delicate instruments so skilfully employed by mr mallock these insect eyes are marvels of geometrical symmetry but they are merely organs of sight not of expression they are beautiful with the beauty of cut gems and as devoid as a brilliant of any power of expression of character or emotion a very brief visit to the stalls and cages of the zoo shows that the importance of the eye in the physiognomy of the higher animals is even greater than in the human face for in the greater number of even the best animal types the play of feature is so limited that expression is conveyed mainly by the eye to which the movable ear plays an important and connected but always subsidiary part by what seems almost a paradox many human eyes which produced a first impression of beauty but are soon discovered to be singularly lacking in expression are afterwards felt to have a strong resemblance to the eyes of certain animals of deer for instance or of birds yet in the very animal which suggests the resemblance the eye often possesses great intrinsic beauty which is increased and dignified by a peculiar fitness for the face in which it appears it is in keeping with the limits of animal expression that the actual size of the eye should bear a greater proportion to the area of the face than it does in man and it will be found that the general estimate of animal beauty varies in the main with the size of the eye the giraffe whose immense orbs exceed those of any other animal in size perfection of shape convexity lustre depth of colour and length of eyelash being perhaps the most general favourite in the rivalry of beauty and the almost eyeless moles and manatees those which stand lowest as judged by the presence or absence of expression without the accession of hideous deformity the analysis of beauty must always be approached with diffidence there is always the danger that like the crystal drop it may on the displacement of a single component part rebuke the impertinent inquirer by the shivering and resolution of the perfect whole into fragments which baffle reconstruction and defy recognition 
common opinion the fairest arbiter in a matter of such general interest is probably agreed that in the human eye color does not control our estimate of beauty black eyes or blue eyes hazel or gray as the song says are equally admired in the proper setting but in the eyes of all other creatures color does make a marked difference in the impression which they convey to us though the reason for this difference is obscure light-coloured eyes of any shade seem to detract strangely from the depth and significance of animal expression the usual tint in these light-coloured eyes of animals is a bright golden yellow creatures of very similar form and almost identical shape of head and face appeal or fail to appeal to us by the expression of their eye largely on account of this slight difference though the probable range of emotion and scope of intelligence in the one can hardly be believed to differ greatly from the same powers in the other the yellow eyes of the sheep and the goat have probably never been the subject of a word of commendation while poets and painters have never tired of celebrating the dark eyes of their cousins the roebuck and the gazelle in birds the contrast is even more marked as a rule the eyes of the hawks are light yellow bright and piercing with wonderful powers of vision the true falcons which do not surpass the hawks either in size or courage have black eyes which lend a nobility and dignity to the expression of the bird which the goshawk with all its pride of carriage never attains there is something infinitely roguish and mischievous in the light blue eye of the jackdaw which would be pure ruin to the character of its grave cousin parson rook if by some unkind freak of nature one were born with such disfigurement indeed it may be doubted if the colony would not pronounce sentence of execution at once upon such a discredit to the tribe there seems good reason to believe that this feature often the only obvious mark which distinguishes young nestlings of one species from those of another is that which leads to the detection and prompt destruction by birds of the newly hatched young from alien eggs which have been placed for experiment in their nests there is however one middle shade found in birds eyes which is singularly beautiful the so-called gravel-coloured eye of certain breeds of pigeon this is really a brilliant shade of tawny red and though unshaded by lashes and set in the centre of the bare sear gives to the birds a bold and intelligent appearance in complete contrast to the vapid effect of red eyes in most animal faces we believe that the countenance of a pink-eyed albino guinea-pig is as nearly devoid of expression as it is possible for the face of a quadruped to be and whenever the pink eye accompanies albinism there is an obvious loss of interest in the face though the eye considered as an object apart may have the depth and lustre of a smooth garnet where albinism develops blue eyes as in white cats and sometimes in white horses the loss of expression is less but even in the horse the blue eye ringed with pinkish white is too like that of fish to suggest a tenth part of the intelligence and power of emotion latent in the face of the dark-eyed arabian even dogs with light eyes have less of the appearance of truth and trustfulness than others though the pale eye is seen in some of the most ancient and valuable breeds such as the lemon and white clumber spaniel in the case of the dog the human preference for the dark over the light eye is perhaps explained by the affinity which the last has with that of the wolf and the common fox the cunning shifty look which the last animal possesses is largely due not only to the yellow colour but also to the shape and mechanism of the vulpine eyes they are set close together and the inner corners run down almost parallel to the muzzle in addition the pupil of the fox's eye expands and contracts like that of a cat by day the eye is a mere yellow orb with a narrow line of black in the centre 
the reason that the stuffed foxes heads to be seen in so many country houses bear the amiable and most unfoxy expression which they do is that the artist who stuffs them sticks in nice brown glass eyes with black pupils which he takes from the compartment labelled dogs in the curious box in which glass eyes for all creatures from tom tits to stags are kept duly sorted for use cat's eyes are by no means devoid of a pleasing expression except in strong light but among them the dark grey iris of the angora and some of the blue cats give a look of repose and serenity which the brassy orbs of the yellow-eyed varieties never possess a larger and more striking example of the same difference is found in contrast of the yellow eyes of the black leopard at the zoo one of the most unpleasant looking of the big felidae and the dark convex eyes of the ocelot but the most striking instance of the immense difference between the effect of the light eye and the dark is seen in the case of a new species of eagle owl which has just been brought to the zoo from mashonanland the great brown eagle owl of northern europe with its huge round yellow and black eyes with which it sternly stares the visitor out of countenance has a fierce wide-awake resentful expression exactly in keeping with its character the milky eagle owl a splendid bird with plumage barred with wavy lines of grey from crest to talons has oval eyes of the deepest black soft and lustrous and shaded with eyelids and lashes the result is a change of expression to something quite unlike the face of any bird and more human than that of most beasts it is certainly the finest bird eye yet discovered the eyes of homer's goddesses must not be judged too literally by the animal model in the standing epithets by which he loves to describe them Tlahocpis athene was the bright-eyed goddess and the owl probably had its greek name from the brightness of its eyes so hera was ox-eyed that is with round dark eyes fine to look at but if we may judge from her character perhaps equally without expression with those of the animal which they resembled helen when restored to menelaus and playing the part of hostess to ulysses artlessly apologizes for the trouble which the greeks had incurred on her account kuno pitos aivica cures in which the word kunepidos with dog's eyes may be taken to mean what would now be described as rather a forward young person yet in the recognition of ulysses by the old dog argus there is a feeling for the pathos of animal expression which finds adequate interpretation in the beautiful picture in which mr britton riviere has depicted the longing look of recognition in the eyes of the dog and of pity in those of the hero who sees in the first the sole signal of welcome to his island home the charm of this picture lies in the truth that in the eyes of the dog and in the eyes of the king the same emotion is actually present and exhibited naturally and spontaneously by the organ of sight without transgressing the limits of expression in the animal which one of the greatest animal painters not unfrequently ventured to do by transferring to it modifications of feature only possible in the human eye the expression which is associated with the most beautiful of animal eyes those of the horse the stag and the eagle is so dependent upon particular differences of shade and setting in creatures whose emotions and intelligence cannot greatly differ in degree that its common interpretation must be due rather to analogy than to any appreciation of its meaning End of chapter twenty two Chapter Twenty Three of Life at the Zoo by Charles John Cornish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Three: London Bears. Never make a pet of a bear is the advice given by the experienced bear ward at the zoo. But though his conclusions are the result of longer and closer experience of the animals than is possessed by any one person in Europe 
there is something so attractive in the apparent simplicity and bonhomie of the comfortable warmly clad deliberate earth sign race which appeals irresistibly to animal loving englishmen ever since the early middle ages the performing bear has been a favourite and to this day there is in turkey and bulgaria a wandering race of gipsies who are known by the common name of bear tamers from their traditional occupation of catching the young cubs in the forests of the carpathians and leading them through the villages as performers in all the feasts whether christian or mussulman of the ancient land of thrace the same bear which for the greater part of eighteen ninety one and eighteen ninety two was exhibited in the london streets and ultimately had an audience from her majesty at windsor castle was also a familiar acquaintance of most of the london police magistrates its popularity was such that whenever exhibited it instantly became the centre of a crowd which increased until the police constable on duty felt it incompatible with his position not to take it into custody then came the scene in the dock next morning and the dismissal with a caution as a sequence meantime the bear had usually held a reception in the police station the night before and so much did its endearing ways win the hearts of the force that on one occasion the constable who had run it in made a collection for its benefit the moment the case was dismissed this was a small pyrenean bear about three years old with a rough coat the colour of a dusty coconut fibre doormat and though it had a strong steel muzzle of apparently needless severity fixed round the base of its nose the genial provencal who owned it and whose bed it usually shared at night in the quarters of the foreign artist and street music and ice creams in which he dwelt when not employed in exhibiting his pet before royalty or elsewhere declared that it was a brave bête douze comme un enfant et doué de traits de caractère tout à fait remarquable the behaviour of the street urchins to the brave bête was perhaps a reminiscence of the days when bear baiting was looked upon as an exhibition calculated to maintain the pugnacious character of the true-bred englishman for once assured that it would not hurt them they stamped on its toes as occasion offered until the bear rose on its hind legs and assumed an attitude of defence which drove the malicious tribe to a safe distance pauvre bete il a peur said his owner and it was evident not only that the bear was afraid of the brutal children of the street but that it looked to the grown-ups for protection probably the most easily tamed of the tribe are the small malayan bears five of which are at present in the collection of the zoological society these are true honey-eating bears provided with long elastic tongues and covered with short close fur of the most beautiful dark and glossy brown of the tent to which sealskins are dyed the largest is a perfect beauty in the eyes of bear connoisseurs sleek and glossy its coat fitting it like a well-made suit of felt and when walking upright as it prefers to do when about to be fed it is just like a person as we once heard a small girl remark it has a cream-coloured face and a beautiful orange bib the oldest of the family has been twenty years in the gardens and is so stiff and decrepit that when on the ground it moves like a rheumatic old man but it can still climb and will exhibit most amusing feats upon the bars in return for a lump of sugar sugar is the greatest luxury which can be given to these sweet-toothed animals except honey and their rations of this are carefully regulated as it does not agree with their constitutions when in confinement when a lump of sugar is shown to the old bear it climbs the bars with great deliberation and then holding on by all four feet waits for the visitor to go through his part of the performance unless this is carried out according to rule the bear descends and sits on the floor waiting until it gets the sugar thrown to it without further trouble but if the lump is slowly waved round in circles from right to left the opposite direction is not considered fair and the animal won't play if it is persisted in the bear also turns coach-wheels slowly on the bars 
his old elbows stick out and his paws turn in but he still feels equal to almost any number of turns if the visitor is exacting when rewarded with the sugar the bear makes it last like a nasty little boy with a sugar plum only far more ingeniously that was a white sugar plum i gave you says the horrible child in mr du maurier's picture it was pink once the bear is not really nasty but it has discovered an ingenious process by which loaf sugar can be converted into honey it first wets its forepaws and then cracks the sugar into two pieces and puts one on to each paw it then rubs the bits on with its nose and next picking each up again cracks it and lays two well moistened pieces on to each paw as before it then licks these off again and if any is left again deposits them on the backs of its well moistened sticky knuckles finally it licks them quite clean and turns slowly head over heels as an acknowledgment of the treat a regiment of lifeguards recently owned a large brown bear which ultimately found a home in the zoo after giving proof of the wisdom of the keeper's opinion it was a pet of the regiment and was taken from knightsbridge to windsor and later to the albany street barracks where it was kept chained up like a big dog and treated with all the consideration due to a non-combatant member of the corps a boy who was rather a favorite with the men and used to run errands and make himself useful about the barracks took a fancy to the bear and was employed to bring it its daily rations one day when the animal was asleep the boy woke it by pulling the chain at the same time laying the food before it the experience of all those employed in the care of animals whether wild or domesticated forbids any approach without speaking to the creature first in this case the bear sulky at being wakened and tethered only by a very long chain seized the lad and bit and clawed him so seriously that he was for some time an inmate of the middlesex hospital the bear was dismissed from the service and condemned to solitary confinement in a cage in the terrace of the gardens the ungrateful behavior of the guards bear must not be taken as a reflection on military treatment of wild animals for an almost similar instance of the innate surliness of its species occurred many years ago in the establishment of one of those retired east india civilians whose oriental habits were such a puzzle to the country squires in the country seats in which the retired nabobs often chose to spend their latter days the gentleman in question had bought an estate in devonshire but it was his pleasure always to be waited upon by a black man at dinner and in the later parts of the evening to sit at table with a pair of black bears each adorned with a silver collar seated in a large armchair on either side of him an old devonshire woman who had been a servant in his family took the bears under her charge and fed them daily until one of them bit three of the fingers off her hand this was too much even for her master's partiality for his pets and the bears were slaughtered and their bodies duly boiled down into bear's grease under the superintendence of their former owner and the attached domestic who though approving of the measure like john gilpin's wife had still a frugal mind and felt that the unexpected supply of an expensive cosmetic should not be wasted the polar bears are perhaps with the exception of the elephants and other great pachyderms the longest lived of animals when in captivity in eighteen eighty the first of the polar bears died after spending thirty-four years in regent's park and the eldest of the pair now in the collection has already spent twenty-six years in the zoo this is a splendid animal at a rough guess it must weigh nearly a ton and no carnivorous creature approaches it in size and strength when we recollect that its common prey is the walrus a sea beast nearly as large as a rhinoceros seldom moving far from the edge of the ice floes and able by mere weight to drag both himself and its enemy into the sea and to fight for life in its native element the strength and armament of teeth and claws necessary to destroy it 
must be greater even than those of the lion which with all its weight of bone and muscle seldom attacks even so large an animal as a buffalo unless crippled by wounds the old polar bear is now heavy with age and indolence but the young female exhibits an activity and lissomeness whether on land or in the water which shows how swift dexterous and terrible a foe to animal life the polar bear must be confinement and maturity have not in the least abated its vigour and it seems to enjoy life more than any creature in the zoo fresh water is let into their bath three times in the week and as soon as the bottom is covered the young bear rolls in and cuts capers to use the keeper's phrase she teased the old one till he got up to have a look and then shoved him in he informed us on a recent visit and though he seldom enters the bath now he quite enjoyed it when once under water when in the bath by herself the female bear is in a state of pure physical enjoyment delightful to watch she always prefers to take a header but not after the orthodox fashion for as her nose touches the bottom she turns a somersault slowly and then floats to the surface on her back after several rolls in the water she begins to play taking hold of her hind paws with her forefeet she makes a huge ball of her body and turns round and over with a curiously buoyant easy movement occasionally putting her head out to take breath and look at the spectators then she clambers out shakes herself and gallops round the edge of the bath in spite of her bulk this bear is really as active as a cat and can go at speed round the narrow circle without pausing or missing a step the next object of the bear is to find something to play with in the water anything will do but if nothing else is handy she usually produces a nasty bit of stale fish which she seems to keep hidden in some handy place and dives for it coming to the surface with the fish balanced on her nose or on all four paws if the water is still running in she will lie under the spout and let it run through her mouth but the most amusing game in which the writer has seen her occupied was played with a large round stone after knocking it into the water and jumping in to fish it out she took it in her mouth and endeavoured to push it into the hole in the pipe through which the water was running this was a difficult matter for the stone was as large as a tennis ball and the pipe was not much wider several times the stone dropped out though the bear held it delicately between her lips and pushed it out with her tongue at last she sat up and holding the stone between her forepaws put it up to the pipe and pushed it in with her nose this was a great triumph and she retired again and contemplated the result with much satisfaction later being apparently tired of this achievement she threw water at it with her head and failing to wash it down picked it out with her claws and went on diving for it in the bath bears do not often have families in the zoo they are bad mothers in confinement though when wild they are most devoted to their pretty little cubs it must be admitted that they are almost the least well housed of any creatures in the gardens as their dens though dry are cold and small the most remarkable cubs ever born in the gardens were a cross between the polar and american black bear born in eighteen fifty three in the spring of eighteen ninety four one of the she-bears in the pit gave birth to a litter of two but one of these was killed by the male bear and the other fatally injured their place was however more than filled by a pair of tiny cubs which arrived at the gardens on easter monday a gift from mr arnold pipe they are of the grey syrian breed which is found from the lebanon across the high lands of asia minor as far as the caucasus in which mountains these cubs were found when only a few days old though in a sense they are distant relations of the bears that ate the bad children who mocked the prophet elisha these little fellows were extremely tame and friendly they were about the size of a large sky terrier when they arrived with sawdust-coloured heads white collars brown bodies and sharp noses 
they fed heartily on bread and milk and treacle and their little stomachs stuck out roundly in evidence of their appreciation of their diet they were extremely sociable and never quite happy unless people were near them or within sight when they had human company they sat up stretching their claws through the bars in order to take hold of and suck the fingers of any one who would permit it if not they sucked their own keeping up a continual humming noise all the time if left alone this became a loud sustained complaint like the noise of a litter of hungry puppies bears are far more difficult to rear than would be thought in the case of such rough hardy creatures they are liable even after the first six months to cramp and paralysis of the hindquarters which gradually increase until the animal dies in winter time all the bears are worth a visit the black himalayan bear with its white front the brown russian and american species with their magnificent soft fur and most beautiful of all the full-grown syrian bear with coat of cinnamon gray carrying a bloom like that on some soft fruit are then in perfect condition the two grizzly bears are interesting mainly on account of their rarity and the possibility that they may live to develop the huge proportions which american hunters are unanimous in ascribing to the monsters of the rocky mountains but even in full growth it is much to be doubted whether the grizzly ever reaches the size even of the smaller polar bear now in the gardens End of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty four young animals at the zoo artemis protectress of all young wild beasts should be honoured with a statue at the zoo for the cages are yearly filled by the graceful young of wild creatures native to every quarter of the globe the greater number are born in the menagerie honest little british lions and the rest of the true cockney breed others come from the gardens on the continent notably from amsterdam where for some reason the wild beast farm thrives amazingly and others mainly the whelps of the fierce carnivora are the gifts of indian rajahs or of african sultans to the empress of india or captured by english sportsmen in their distant forays among the beasts of prey by mere coincidence the lion house has lately been almost restocked by gifts which have been part of the tribute from the east to the west since the days of roman proconsuls five of the new arrivals were cubs all of rare beauty of form and colouring and in the finest health and condition three young tigers presented to the princess henry of battenberg by the nawab sir Asmanji, had reached the gardens only twenty-four hours before the writer paid them a visit and were in a state of royal indignation at their change of quarters from the ship to which they had become temporarily reconciled one only would enter the front cage of the den where it lay on its back with its paws bent inwards growling to itself occasionally turning over laying its ears back on its head and flattening its nose against the back of its wrist like a sulky child two other half-grown cubs were in that interesting region known as the passage which runs between the winter cages and the fine outdoor palaces behind the details of the daily management of from twenty to thirty lions tigers leopards jaguars and pumas can be comprehended at a glance from this central position the ground floor of the cages in the house and of the playgrounds on the opposite side is about four feet higher than the floor of the passage the sleeping compartment of each cage has an iron sliding shutter always kept locked which gives on the passage a corresponding shutter leads to the playground a travelling bridge running on rails and barred on each side with iron rods is the means of transit from the cages to these outer runs when an animal is to be transferred from one to the other the bridge is run up the shutters are raised and the lion or tiger after sniffing and hesitating like a cat entering a room walks through the bridge cage and takes possession of its apartments 
two of the young tigers were in the sleeping den the other chose to remain in the bridge cage where it lay crouched and sulking on the floor though not more than half grown they are more massive in shape richer in color and marking than any full-grown tiger in the zoo the record of their capture is more complete than is usual in the case of animals presented by native princes they are part of a litter of five taken at Shardlane, about fifty miles from hyderabad the nawab himself shot the tigress and had alighted from his howdah to measure it when an alarm was raised by the beaters that another tiger had been seen creeping in the jungle on the beat being resumed the five cubs then about a fortnight old were caught each being about the size of a full-grown cat for the first week a she-goat acted as foster mother but they were afterwards brought up by hand with cow's milk from a feeding bottle for food on the voyage to england they were provided with a flock of sheep and so well were they fed that they arrived at the gardens with half a sheep still uneaten in the cage the two lion cubs caught by Lord Delamere in Somaliland were hardly of age to leave the nursery, though the difference of temper, which is so commonly observed among lions, was already marked. One, a beautifully mealy-tinted little lioness, with a thick, rough coat like a St. Bernard puppy, and dark brown eyes, ran out to play with a handkerchief, and could be petted like a kitten the other was a morose little savage lying at the back of the cage and growling at every passer-by they are fed on mutton powdered with bone dust and promise to rival in beauty even the slim and elegant young lioness presented by the sultan of zanzibar three litters of wild swine were born in the gardens during the first eight months of eighteen ninety three too early in the spring and one of four beautiful piglings late in the summer young wild boars are far prettier than might be expected from the rather forbidding appearance of their parents their bodies are slim and elegant their snouts fine their ears short and their legs and feet almost as finely shaped as those of a young antelope their colour is a bright fawn or a rich tan with longitudinal stripes like those on a tabby kitten and in place of the thick bristles of the older pigs their bodies are covered with a long and thick coat of rough hair family life in the wild boar's quarters is harmonious and amusing for the first month the little orange striped pigs depend on their mother for food and take no notice either of visitors or of each other each roams about by itself in the most independent fashion or drops down to sleep on its stomach with its legs stretched straight out before and behind like a kneeling elephant in miniature later when they have to be satisfied with the food provided in the troughs they become the most amusing and importunate beggars in the zoo the old sow and boar setting the example well supported by the little pigs the whole family stand upright on their hind legs in a row like heraldic pigs supporting a coat of arms with their forefeet against the rails and squeak grunt and even climb the wire netting for contributions even if the floor is littered with delicious hogwash they prefer to plead in forma pauperis and the yearning to reach just one inch farther than their brothers seems to give an impulse to the growth of their snouts which soon grow long flexible and narrow like those of the parent swine the ancient breed of wild swine which haunted the great caledonian forest may claim to have been re-established for some of these are the third generation in descent from ancestors bred in scotland but the youngest member of perhaps the oldest family in the british islands was the white calf the lineal descent of the wild white cattle of ancient britain the bull cow and calf formed one of the happiest family groups in the gardens and should be studied by any one desirous of appreciating the natural beauty of these cattle one of which a wild steer from chillingham took a first prize when judged on its merits among the finest domestic breeds of england the bull at the zoo belongs to the chartley herd 
which has been in the possession of lord ferrer's family for nearly a thousand years has a short muzzle broad forehead and crescent horns with a downward reversed curve its silky coat is pure white its eyes the deepest jet black shaded by long white eyelashes the tips of the ears and of the horns are black and just above the hoof are black and white speckles like the flea bites on a lamerick setter's coat the cow like the bull is white with black points but the horns curve upwards between the two stands the little bull calf a perfect miniature of its father except that the horns are only budding it has the same black muzzle and ear tips even its tongue is black and the black and lustrous eye is shaded by thick straight white lashes like rims of hoar-frost deer and antelopes breed freely at the zoo the eland calf has a short body more like that of a young colt with long legs and the hump upon the back undeveloped all the elands are in fine condition and might be propagated to stock our english parks but as an ornament they cannot compare with the indigenous wild cattle of the chillingham or chartley herds both the wild ass and the zebra had young ones the young wild ass was a pretty playful creature with a coat like grey velvet but the infant zebra was perhaps the greater favourite with the visitors to the zoo it exactly resembled its mother in colour and in the distinctness and arrangement of the stripes but it was far lighter and finer in its proportions with a luxurious instinct for comfort the little creature usually lay asleep upon the light green hay which the mother pulls from the rack above a background which contrasted admirably with its rich sepia and cream-coloured stripes but the pride and flower of all the youth of the zoo is the young hippopotamus as it lies on its side with eyes half closed its square nose like the end of a bolster tilted upwards its little fat legs stuck out straight at right angles to its body and its toes turned up like a duck's it looks like a gigantic newborn rabbit it has a pale petunia coloured stomach and the same artistic shade adorns the soles of its feet it has a double chin and its eyes like a bull calf's are set on pedestals and close gently as it goes to sleep with a bland enormous smile it cost five hundred pounds when quite small and to quote the opinion of an eminent grazier who was looking it over with a professional eye it still looks like a growing into money there are connoisseurs in hippopotamus breeding who think it almost too beautiful to live we had hoped to find a prairie dog family as several of the smaller rodents had produced young ones but though several of the solemn little fellows were sitting bolt upright cramming straw into their mouths with both hands as fast as they could like a conjurer swallowing tape there were no little prairie dogs the kangaroos and wallabies on the other hand had several joeys and nothing could well be stranger than this dual existence of mother and young in which contrary to all precedents the young is carried by its parent though it is quite independent of its milk thus an old kangaroo or wallaby will put its head down to drink while the young wallaby wide awake and independent in the pouch picks up a piece of cabbage and holding it in its hands eats it like a boy eating an apple and looking out of a window the long sharp claws of the hind legs are doubled forward when in the pouch and project like a couple of pens on either side of the young one's ears while the tip of its tail also hangs out just under its chin in a cage in the small mammal's house there were a number of young weasels which were without exception the brightest and most active creatures in the gardens they were absolutely without fear of man bold impudent and astonishingly agile they had converted the hay at the bottom of their cage into the likeness of a hedge bottom with numerous tunnels galleries and holes and in these they would play by the hour it was always the same game catching and killing and the fury with which they would roll over and over until one had the other by the throat and pretended to kill it was most excellent counterfeit the difficulty was to tell the number of the weasels there were only four but there seemed to be as many more 
they were here there and everywhere and scarcely had the tail of one disappeared in one hole than its sharp bright eyes were peering from another at the opposite side of the cage they could run either backwards or forwards in the holes and no mouse rat or rabbit could stand a chance against these untiring and agile little enemies it is difficult to say why there are no young wolves at the zoo according to shudi the naturalist of the alps they are pretty little creatures born blind covered with reddish white down and sprawl in a heap like puppies the little dingoes of which a litter were born early in the year eighteen ninety three much resemble this description and like the wolf cubs are born blind they are sold and fetch a pound each eskimo puppies which are often born at the zoo are amusing little creatures ready to eat boiled tripe from a dish until their little stomachs resemble a cricket ball an instance of heredity no doubt transmitted by generations of half-starved ancestors young marmosets and gerbils angora goats ibexes mountain sheep and wapiti deer gazelles and opossums with a brood of young puff adders young seagulls and wild geese hardly complete the list of the year's increase at the zoo in eighteen ninety four the black-headed gulls reared several broods in the gardens but all the other waterfowl in the large aviary failed to rear their young though the ibises nested and seemed about to lay the water animals unlike the water birds seldom breed at the zoo probably the little ponds and pools in which otters beavers and seals are kept are not large enough to give them that quiet and repose which conduces to family life but otters true devonshire otters did once have a litter at the zoo and the head keeper mr james hunt who was greatly interested in their welfare gave the following pretty description of their habits the female otter was presented to the society by lady roll on february fourth eighteen forty being apparently at the time about three months old in eighteen forty six a large male was presented to the society by the rev p m brownwin of baintree essex its weight when first taken was twenty one pounds but it was not half that weight when presented to the society having wasted much in confinement in a cellar about a month after his arrival there was continual chattering between him and the female at night which lasted for four or five nights but they did not appear to be quarrelling on august thirteenth the keeper who has charge of them went to give them a fresh bed which he does once a week while pulling out the old bed he saw two young ones apparently about five or six days old and about the size of a full-grown rat he immediately put back the bed with the young ones in it and left them on the twenty first the mother removed them to the second sleeping den her object appeared to be to let them have a dry bed on the ninth of september they were first seen out of the house they did not go into the water but crawled about and appeared very feeble on september twenty sixth they were first seen to eat fish and follow the mother into the water they did not dive like the mother but went in like a dog with their head above water and it was not till the middle of october that they were observed to plunge into the water like the old ones when the water was let out of the pond for the purpose of cleaning it they were shut up but got out and into the pond when it was half full of water the young ones were not able to get out without help and for some minutes the mother appeared very anxious and made several attempts to reach them from the side of the pond where she was standing but without success as they were not within reach she then plunged into the water to them and began to play with one of them for a short time and put her head close to its ears as if to make it understand what she meant the next moment she made a spring out of the pond with the young one holding on to the fur at the root of the tail by its teeth this she did several times during a quarter of an hour as the young ones kept going into the water as fast as she got them out sometimes the young held on by the fur of her sides sometimes by that at the tail as soon as there was sufficient water for her to reach them from the side of the pond she took hold of them near the ears with her mouth and drew them out and led them around the pond 
close to the fence and kept chattering to them as if telling them not to go into the pond again a litter of young raccoons were born in the spring of eighteen ninety four unfortunately they all died just as it was hoped that they had passed the most dangerous time of infancy on the other hand the little caucasian bear cubs which arrived at easter throve amazingly and in three months grew to the size of a retriever dog though they had not abandoned the youthful habit of sucking the paws and humming to signify that they wanted to be fed but the great and notable birth of the year almost contemporaneous with that of the infant prince and worthy to be noted as a prodigium if the keeping of sibylline books were part of the english constitution was the arrival of a young new it was even uglier than its mother whose compound features of a horse's body a bull's horns and a goat's beard combined to make her one of the strangest beasts existing the infant was exactly like its mamma minus the horns but plus a high nose and a curly beard which makes it in profile rather like a portrait of sennacherib or shalmaneser another most beautiful calf of the wild cattle a cross between the chartley bull and the white cow from the banger herd is as pretty and pleasing as the new calf is ugly but in each case the mother is vastly proud of its infant and they are probably the best judges of what their offspring should be. End of chapter 24chapter 25 of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 25 animal coloring the conclusions of naturalists as to the laws which govern the coloring of animals must it seems be modified there is no reason however to fear any loss of interest in one of the prettiest and most attractive sides of natural history the collection and comparison of the wonderful analogies in color between animals and their environment and between one animal and another will still be guided by the leading principles which bates and wallace detected and the delight and surprise with which the non-scientific world welcomed these discoveries need neither be regretted nor diminished but without wishing to grudge one iota of the praise awarded to explanations the dexterity and aptness of which would alone entitle them to admiration it is still possible to doubt whether some of the minor hypotheses framed to account for facts which seem to stand outside the explanation of color mimicry by the general law of the survival of the fittest are not almost too ingenious the fascination of the subject is so great that it seems to develop an over-keenness of scientific insight the facts of resemblance themselves are so wonderful and the contrast between the colors of the sexes in birds so startling that the temptation to make a great principle like that of natural selection fit the exact requirements of each case and to explain the complexity of nature in a sentence is almost irresistible it is quite possible that the principle of natural selection which gives a perfect explanation of the wonderful phenomena of protective mimicry may also be the master key to the remaining problems of animal hues the chief difficulties which remain after accounting for protective coloration are first the extraordinary differences between the tints and plumage of male and female in many birds and secondly the conspicuous colors of certain creatures by which the attention of their enemies must necessarily be attracted the first of these obvious difficulties has been explained by what is called sexual selection which is an auxiliary to the general law of natural selection the female pheasants or birds of paradise or pigeons as the case may be by an enduring good taste in choosing for their mates those with the brightest plumage and finest wattles and spurs have played their part in the general scheme of evolution so well that their progeny have in time developed all the beauties which they now possess that theory is obviously quite consistent with the general law 
it accounts logically in part if not entirely for the perilous beauties of the stronger sex but there are creatures in gorgeous attire for which sexual selection could give no justification caterpillars for instance which run additional risks by their conspicuous hues that said the naturalist is in order to advertise their inedible qualities they require writes mr wallace some signal or danger flag which shall serve as a warning to would-be enemies not to attack them and they have usually obtained this in the form of conspicuous or brilliant coloration very distinct from the protective tints of the defenceless animals allied to them there is one obvious objection to this explanation it is really too clever it fits the case so perfectly that in the absence of further experiment and observation one is reluctantly obliged to pause before yielding entirely to such a brilliant surmise and to welcome the note of warning which mr betterd the prosector of the zoological society utters in his admirable work on animal coloration it is evident from the space given to the two points of sexual selection and warning colors in this work which aims only at furnishing a general notion of the facts and theories relating to animal coloration that room exists for doubt as to the value to be attached to either theory the contribution which mr betterd makes towards solving the difficulty is threefold he presents as alternatives to the theories of sexual selection and warning coloration the ingenious speculations of mr stoltzmann and dr isaac neither of which have yet found their way into works of a popular character and he gives an account of numerous and careful experiments made at the zoo with insects of brilliant coloring and reputed evil flavor as food for birds and reptiles no care or pains was omitted to get at the truth of these supposed instances of warning coloring no augurs with the purest motives to guide their interpretation of the omens ever watched the feeding of the sacred chickens in the capital with a more ardent desire to mark the real appetite of the prophetic fowls than did mr betterd and his predecessors in observing the practical results of warning coloration which make trial of the birds at the zoo but the list of experiments does not give any clear line of refusal or acceptance between the protectively colored insects and their more sober relations and mr betterd's conclusion is that the experiments which have been made might be taken to prove anything that is so far disappointing but it is probable that with time and patience a body of evidence will be accumulated which will throw more light on the vexed question of the palatability of these gaudy insects or reptiles meantime the discoveries of dr isaac to which mr betterd introduces us throw light on the question from a different point of view if his surmises are confirmed the fact will be additional evidence in favor of that minute and laborious specialization which so often goes without reward his researches are devoted to the history of a small group of sea worms one of these he found living parasitically upon a marine sponge in the bay of naples the sponge was of a yellow color caused by the presence of small particles of coloring matter the worm was of the same color with bright orange spots and the pigment which colored the sponge was found to be the same which colored the worm having been simply transferred from the tissues of the sponge to the skin of the worm after going through part of the alimentary canal dr isaac is of opinion that the pigment so transferred from the alimentary canal to the skin is itself the cause of the creature being distasteful which suggests the conclusion that the brilliant color that is the secretion of a quantity of coloring matter has itself caused the inedibility of species rather than the inedibility has made necessary the production of bright color as an advertisement this explanation mr betterd remarks is not entirely contrary to the views of wallace bolton and others for we may still suppose that the bright colors are actually warning colors although they have not been evolved for that purpose 
but the weakness as well as the attraction of the unmodified theory really lies in the supposition of the creation in the creature of colour for the express purpose of advertisement the modest conjecture of dr isaac transfers the explanation to safer ground the mode by which in the simple organisms which he observed the colour was transferred from the food to the feeder also suggests the existence of some simple and natural relation between the tints in the skin or hair and external conditions of food and temperature to account for the strange changes of colour to suit outside conditions in animals exposed to the rigours of a northern winter the mountain hare of ireland does not always change its colour to white in winter though in the colder climate of scotland and norway the change is the rule so the arctic fox seems always to be bleached in the extreme north though often retaining its darker dress throughout the year when further south yet exactly the same effects are found in connection with want of food as with want of warmth the rats in a large iron ship which was recently wrecked off the coast of northumberland and remained stranded for many weeks without connection with the shore turned quite white a change due apparently to starvation in strong contrast with the modifications of the part played by evolution in animal colouring suggested by dr isaac is the alternative which mr stoltzman proposes to the theory of sexual selection it is not a change which will flatter the masculine imagination contrasted with the view which accounted for the predominance of male strength and in some cases of masculine beauty over the weaker sex by a long course of discerning feminine selection it has an unconscious irony going quite outside the merits of the male sex per se mr stoltzman weighs its worth in view of the survival of a species so considered an excess of males is an evil which the law of natural selection is under obligations to remedy the tendency of nature is to produce a superabundance of males observations on the origin of sex having shown that the percentage of male birds among birds is greater than that of females further inquiries into the influence of nutrition on sex go to show that badly nourished eggs produce males while well-nourished eggs produce females and scarcity of food is a more common condition than its abundance the fine feathers which make fine birds have therefore been given to the males with a view to exposing them to the attacks of their enemies and to reducing their numbers always be it observed in accordance with the law of the survival of the fittest but by a curiously different line of argument from that which lent its weight to the theory of sexual selection probably neither the one nor the other should stand alone nor is this result to be feared bigotry seems almost unknown to the spirit of the natural history research of to-day the only danger of the open mind of its followers is in the constructive ingenuity of theory which it seems to foster End of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty six wild cats at the zoo the reservation of one-tenth of the area of scotland for deer forest has probably arrested the extermination of three if not of four of the largest and rarest of our birds and beasts of prey for at least a century the great increase in the numbers of the golden eagle and the migration of the ospreys from the lakes to the forests are among the results of the protection so afforded it was reasonable to expect that the wild cat would also benefit by the policy now generally in favour with owners of forests of encouraging animals of prey to keep down the grouse and hares the arrival at the zoological gardens of two genuine scotch wild cats trapped during last year on the same estate in Invernessshire, is evidence that even there the rarest and wildest of all british quadrupeds are recovering from the persecution of half a century of grouse and black cock preserving both were caught in steel traps and each had lost part of a forefoot 
but with the wonderful vitality of all cats they so far recovered from their injuries that on being confronted with each other they at once joined battle like the border rider at chevy chase who when his legs were bitten off did fight upon the stumps these bold and courageous beasts fresh from the remnants of the caledonian forest have not diminished either in size or courage since the wildcat was described by john boswell in fifteen ninety seven he is sly and witty and seeth so sharply that he overcometh the darkness of night by the shining light of his eye in shape of body he is like unto a leopard this is not the case however and hath a great mouth he doth delight that he enjoyeth his liberty and in his youth he is swift pliant and merry he maketh a youthful noise and a gastful when he proffereth to fight with another the growling of the wild cats is gastful indeed not only when they proffer to fight with another but whenever a friendly visitor proffers to look at them that owned by lord lilford which has been in the zoological gardens for some time when exhibited at the cat show at the westminster aquarium performed the singular and creditable feat in wild cat annals of growling without ceasing for two whole days varied only by explosions of hisses and spitting this cat is somewhat lighter and has fewer dark markings than the scotch wild cats the ground hue of the fur is pepper colour its eyes pale green its nose very small not a usual feature in wild cats and covered with fur its face round and bushy and its expression infinitely surly the only stripes distinctly marked are two on either side of the head though the list of so-called wild cats includes twenty species there is only one besides the animal we have described which seems to compete with it as the possible undescended great original of the bundle of concepts which civilized man has in his mind when reference to all the vagaries of the domestic animal he uses the abstract term cat this is the chaus or jungle cat which bears somewhat the same geographical and tribal relation to a scotch or russian wild cat as a pathan tribesman to a highlander the scotch wild cat is found with very little variation throughout northern and central europe across the steppes of northern asia as far as the southern limits of the nepal hills at a height of some eight thousand feet his place is taken by another cat equally bold and far less retiring and solitary the chouse which is common not only in india but at the roots of the caucasus and throughout northern africa and upper egypt a splendid specimen of this oriental cousin of our wild cats occupies a cage in the same house at the zoo under the somewhat misleading name of the egyptian cat nothing could well be more different from the paintings of the sleek tabbies of ancient egypt the sacred animals of the goddess bast petted by priests and taught to catch wild fowl for their masters in the reedy banks of the nile than this rough round broad-headed bushy whiskered upstanding savage who has held his own till the present day in the swamps of asia and africa and in the immediate neighbourhood of every indian country village or tank just as the european wild cat did in england till the days of the tudors the late general douglas hamilton in his journals of sport in southern india tells a story of the courage of this indian wild cat which matches exactly the experience of charles st john in sutherlandshire st john's terriers had brought a wild cat to bay under a rock and when he approached the animal sprang straight at his face and was only stopped by a blow from a stick which he had cut before coming up to aid the dogs general hamilton says of the chouse one of these animals came into our cantonment evidently on the prowl for fowls or anything it could pick up so we collected all the dogs we could and had a hunt we came to a long check the dogs being quite at fault after looking for some time i spied the cat squatting in a hedge and called for the dogs when they came i knelt down and began clapping my hands and cheering them on 
the cat suddenly made a clean spring at my face i had just time to catch it as one would a cricket ball and giving its ribs a strong squeeze i threw it to the dogs not however before it had made its teeth meet in my arm just above my wrist for some weeks i had to carry my arm in a sling and i shall carry the marks of the bite to my grave the chouse is a far finer animal even than the european wildcat it is larger and more powerful though its proportions and movements are almost the same in colour it is a fine tawny grey with long bushy hair a rough round its face yellow cheeks shading into white a long very broad nose long ears slightly tufted yellow eyes and bars on its tail there are also two dark bars on the inside of the arm above the elbow when laying its ears back spitting and uttering growls like distant thunder it is the very moral of a big ill-tempered domestic tomcat which poaches all day fights all night and sleeps by choice in the coal cellar apart from their general resemblance to the tame cat both the chouse and the scotch cat in their moments of repose exactly resemble the domestic species they never pace their cages a habit which distinguishes all leopards and tigers and all the tiger cats when young they sleep all day if possible either curled up on their backs with their noses upwards like a tame cat in a sunny window or with their backs drawn up and their fore paws tucked neatly under their chests when feeding they do not lie down like the leopards but crouch over their food with their jaws almost upon the ground and their backs somewhat arched like a tame cat with a mouse anatomists state that the european wildcat differs from the tame animal in the dimensions of that part of its interior which is in such request for violin strings if this objection is fatal to the claim of the former to be the ancestor of our cats we should be inclined to find its direct ancestor in the chouse a view which need not conflict with the conclusions of m chamfleury who considers that the egyptian cat was acclimatized in egypt at the same time as the horse in sixteen sixty eight b c all the other wild cats are either tiger cats leopard cats or puma cats names in which the last half of the compound should we think be read either as a diminutive than as an index to race in them the habits and appearance of the larger rather than the smaller animal appear to the writer to bear the greater proportion in the affinities of the whole from first impressions the bengal tiger cat for example appears to be a variety of the domestic cat with the coat and colouring of a leopard or rather of a cheetah its attitudes or rather those of the full-grown specimen in the society's collection are those of a tired house cat it sleeps in the same positions and like the true cats never paces for exercise but a young one of the same species shown this year at the westminster aquarium untamed preserved all the lion-like features strongly developed just as the young of lions and pumas preserve the spots which disappear at maturity the movements of this little creature and its general proportions were almost exactly those of a quarter-grown lion it had the square head the flat massive jaws and the same restless eager pacing movements from side to side of its cage and feet always ready to claw or strike the colouring and texture of the skin in the full-grown animal are wholly unlike any variety of domestic cat known to the fancy its colour is tawny its coat short and close its eyes yellow with a black centre the face of the adult is narrow like that of a female house cat but the six parallel lines two on either side and two on the centre of the head break into spots upon the back its tail which is long and thick is spotted not ringed and it has spotted leopard-like legs the collection of these beautiful smaller felidae in the zoological gardens is less complete than that of any other tribe exhibited even the clouded tiger the most perfect in colouring of all the spotted kinds has disappeared from the collection though some years ago there were two fine specimens 
in the cat house the clouded tiger is marked with almost rectangular ornaments of clouded black on a ground of rich buff it is the largest of all the tiger cats and has a very long thick silky tail ringed with black this animal has a special claim to be an inmate of the zoo for it was first discovered and brought to this country by sir stamford raffles the moving spirit in the establishment of the zoological society they were no less good than beautiful and the following description of their behaviour from the pen of sir stamford raffles himself should be contrasted with the ancient and inbred malignity of the true wild cat both my specimens he wrote were remarkable for good temper and playfulness no domestic kitten could be more so they were always courting intercourse with some person passing by and in the expression of the countenance which was always open and smiling showed the greatest delight when noticed throwing themselves on their backs and delighting in being tickled and rubbed on board the ship there was a small moosey dog who used to play round the cage with one of these animals and it was amusing to see the playfulness and tenderness with which the latter came in contact with its inferior sized companion when fed with a fowl that had died he seized the prey and after sucking the blood and tearing it a little he amused himself for hours in throwing it about and jumping after it in the manner that a cat plays with a mouse before it is quite dead he never seemed to look on men or children as prey but as companions the natives assert that when wild they live principally on poultry birds and the smaller kind of deer they are not found in numbers and may be considered rather a rare animal even in the southern part of sumatra both specimens constantly amuse themselves by jumping and clinging to the top of their cage and throwing a somersault and twisting themselves round in the manner of a squirrel when confined the tail being extended and showing to great advantage when so expanded it is obvious that so active and beautiful an animal could not be seen with advantage or kept in good health in the cramped little cages of the present cat house but the society still possess a good specimen of the finest of the self-coloured puma cats the golden cat of sumatra an island in which every ornamental species whether bird or beast seems endowed with a double gift of beauty in colouring it is unique and its proportions are as elegant as its tints the fur on the back is the colour of the red variety of gold stone with the texture of thick piled velvet this warm and luminous hue pales into white on the belly and runs up the chest ending on the chin which is square and almost bearded giving a tigerish expression to the head on the mask of the face the ready golden fur is striped with wavy lines of orange and white the eyes are strangely large dark clouded barrel brown globes with smoky yellow topaz lights and shine like round translucent gems set in a velvet case this mass of orange tawny gold and topaz is set off by the pale rose pink of the nose and lips and the not unfrequent exhibition of rows of ivory teeth the whole body is elegant and symmetrical and the colouring so exactly balanced that the warm white of the lower parts which ends in front at the point of the chin extends with the same precision along the lower part of the tail even to the tip as if the golden cat were fresh from a swim across a lake of cream among the lacunae in this part of the collection the marbled tiger cat the viverine cat the pampas cat the margay the ira cat the jaguarande and the leopard cat of bengal may be mentioned most of these have been seen at the zoo at one time or another and mr bartlett found the ira cat a most affectionate and amusing pet it is an american wild cat but far longer and lither in shape than others of the true cats resembling a gannet in shape it is a tree-climbing species as active on the branches as a squirrel 
on the other hand there are a pair of oscillates which in the absence of the clouded tiger may be taken as representing almost the highest development of ornament among four-footed animals one of the pair comes from southern and the other from central america no two oscillates are marked exactly alike but the general tone and shading is sufficiently alike to compare them generally with other species the argus pheasant alone seems to afford a parallel to the beauties of the ocelot's fur especially in the development of the wonderful ocelle which though never reaching in the beast the perfect cup and ball ornament seen on the wings of the bird can be traced in all its earlier stages of spots and wavy lines as far as the irregular shell-shaped ring and dot on the feet sides and back just as in the subsidiary ornament of the argus pheasant's feathers most of the ground tint of the fur is a pearly smoke color on which the spots develop from mere dots upon the legs and speckles on the feet and toes to large egg-shaped ocelli on the flanks there are also two beautiful pearl-colored spots at the back of each ear like those which form the common ornaments of the wings of many moths as in the golden cat the very large convex translucent eye and the pink nose make the face of the ocelot a wonderful combination of contrasts in colour and texture apparently they are tame and friendly though the conditions of their life at the zoo are hardly such as tend to promote good temper the remaining occupants of the cat house are mostly lynxes or half lynxes like the servals and caracals or civets and gannets there is a fine collection of the last pretty little creatures which are far more like ichneumons and mongooses than any form of cat the most interesting fact about these thoroughly oriental looking beasts is that one is actually found in the alps where one could almost as soon expect to discover a cobra or a crocodile they are beautifully marked and spotted with black and dark brown or smoky grey and are as restless as a mongoose or a coati end of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty seven the speech of monkeys mr garner's claim to have gained a clue to a form of language understood by monkeys for a short time excited more interest than any subject of natural history in recent years it was based on such ingenious experiments including the practical use of such an invention as the phonograph and was based on methods so pleasing to the scientific mind that there seemed more than a probability that he was on the verge of a great discovery on the other hand men like the keepers of the monkeys in the zoological gardens who have a special and practical knowledge of the subject refused for a moment to entertain the idea either that there was a universal simian tongue or even one which was common to more than the members of a single class in his book on the speech of monkeys he gives in a complete form the result of the ingenious inquiries the first instalment of which roused such curiosity when published in the new review every one who read the story of the clever experiments made by the aid of the phonograph which caught and reproduced when required the characteristic tones of monkey chatter will be anxious to learn whether the increase in the numbers and variety of the experiments recorded strengthened or weakened the conclusions which mr garner first formed with one important modification he is still confident that he has obtained evidence not only of the existence of a form of speech current between monkeys but of the meaning and modifications of some of the sounds in use the exception is one which would occur to most minds on reading the evidence if not from natural probability he no longer claims for monkeys any one speech common to all races a universal simian tongue which if it existed would argue a greater uniformity among the diversities of monkey structure than exist among the uniformity of human physique the experiments on which mr garner based his conclusion that there is a common simian tongue 
was no doubt difficult to explain on any other supposition for having obtained on his phonograph a record of the sounds made by two chimpanzees he found that a note which he translated to mean milk but which he subsequently took to stand for food in general was used by the capuchin monkey in apparently the same sense he now believes that the sounds are only understood by members of the same species this admission agrees with the views of the keepers who maintain that the cries and exclamations of different species of monkey when expressing the ordinary emotions of fear or pleasure offer no sort of resemblance and scout the notion of a common simian tongue the fact of the interpretation of the chimpanzee's note by the capuchin can perhaps be explained without throwing doubt upon the whole theory monkeys in captivity do learn occasionally the notes of other species not as mere mimics but with the meaning which the other naturally attaches to the sounds the most remarkable case writes mr garner which has come under my notice is one in which a young white-faced monkey has acquired the sound which means food in the capuchin tongue this event occurred under my own eyes attended by such conditions as showed that the monkey had a motive for learning the sound in the room in which the monkeys were kept by a dealer in washington there was a cage which contained a young white-faced cebus of more than average intelligence he was a quiet sedate and thoughtful little monkey whose gray hair and beard gave him quite a venerable aspect and for this reason i called him darwin from some cause unknown to me he was afraid of me and i showed him but little attention on the same shelf and in an adjacent cage lived the little capuchin puck for some weeks i visited puck almost daily and in response to his sound for food i always supplied him with nuts or bananas i never gave him any of these things to eat unless he would ask for them in his own speech on one of my visits my attention was attracted by little darwin who was uttering a strange sound which i had never before heard one of his species use i did not recognize the sound at first but very soon discovered that it was intended to imitate the sound of the capuchin in response to which i always gave puck a nice morsel of food after this i always gave him some in acknowledgment of his efforts and i observed from day to day that he improved in making this sound until at last it could scarcely be distinguished from that made by the capuchin this may explain the mistake as to the simian tongue professor garner also wishes to get rid of the notion that monkeys can carry on a connected conversation their speech is usually limited to a single sound or remark which is replied to in the same manner what mr garner now claims for monkey speech is that it is voluntary deliberate and articulate that the sounds are always addressed to some certain individual with the evident purpose of having them understood and that they wait for and expect an answer and if they do not receive one frequently repeat the sounds which they do not utter when alone he further finds that they understand the sounds made by other monkeys of their own kind and usually respond to them with a like sound and that the sound is interpreted to mean the same thing and obeyed in the same manner by different monkeys of the same species the words which we have placed in italics are of course the most important part of the conclusion but much if not the whole value which they bear must depend not only on the certainty that their sounds convey a fixed idea on a given subject from one mind to another but also on the assurance that these sounds are sufficiently numerous and definite in meaning not to come under the same head as mere exclamations of alarm or pleasure which form part of the usual utterance of so many animals a cat for instance shows pleasure by sound that is by purring displeasure or fear by sound that is by growling and spitting and desire by sound that is by mewing and if all that professor garner had to show was that monkeys had something equivalent or rather more than equivalent to a cat's purring growling or mewing there would be nothing very remarkable in the fact 
though the extreme ingenuity and patient attention which he has exhibited in making his experiments must always lend these a subordinate and secondary interest of their own but he rightly excludes mere sounds of emotion from the faculty of speech such as he claims for monkeys speech he says is that form of materialized thought which is confined to oral sounds when they are designed to convey a definite idea from mind to mind and sounds which only express emotion are not speech it is therefore not sufficient for professor garner to show that the sounds which he has so carefully observed and noted are understood by his monkeys he has also to show that they are distinct from mere expressions of emotion the fuller experiments from which he now writes do not tend to clear away this difficulty the capuchins which are alike the most voluble and the cleverest of the smaller monkeys have a sound which professor garner first translated as food but to which he subsequently found he must attach a wider meaning he now thinks that when modulated in one way the sound means a certain kind of food and when modulated in another it means give or give me that by repeating it to a capuchin he often induced it to hand over a part of its food or some plaything but it would be possible to infer from this that the sound was a mere expression of desire and not really different from the mewing of a cat when it wants its kittens returned or a door opened the word for drink he still considers to be distinct from that expressing food and fixed alike in form and meaning the sound which he took to mean weather because uttered by a sick monkey when a storm burst has now resolved itself into a general expression of discontent the alarm sound is dual one form is expressing fear another chi merely calling attention but some animals such as the elephant have more than one warning sound and warning sounds in themselves do not constitute speech nor does the fact that the professor has been able to reproduce and get replies to the food sound of the rhesus and cebus monkeys prove more than that he has been a clever and careful observer of a particular exclamation he thinks however that there is a sound meaning monkey because this is uttered when one meets another or is shown its image in a mirror after solitary confinement and he finds that the shake of the head by which monkeys like men signify no is also accompanied by a clucking sound which he takes for a negation but even if the results of his later experiments are less fruitful than might have been anticipated professor garner has still good reason for hope the phonograph which alone made it possible to conduct his inquiry with scientific accuracy promises to give aid in a new and unexpected quarter the same invention which has rendered possible a permanent record of sound and its reproduction at will also facilitates its analysis or synthesis one of the main difficulties for the human ear in dealing with monkey speech is its extreme rapidity and the possibility of modulations existing which are to us inaudible but are perfectly distinct to the acute simian perception by recording the monkey notes on the drum and then spinning the machine at a slow rate the sounds are analyzed and modulations detected and in a way hitherto impossible much is hoped from such analysis of the main words of monkey speech which seem now to have different meanings though the vocal difference is indistinguishable professor garner pins his faith to the obvious fact that monkeys like men have tongues teeth lips and all the organs of speech that they use the organs and that there is at least a probability that a distinction is attached by them to many sounds in which no difference is detected by our ears he deserves every success in his new experiments though the effect of the latest has been to diminish rather than to increase the range of the monkey vocabulary 
the later experiments with the larger anthropoid apes from whose deliberate utterances better results might be expected than from the volatile chatter of the small monkeys do not seem to have given much additional information mr garner's expedition to western africa in the hope of inducing wild monkeys to answer the sounds which he had succeeded in learning from the tame ones ended as such an enterprise might have been expected to end in failure perhaps the whole inquiry may lead to the conclusion that we know no more now of monkey speech than we did before but in any case it was a hopeful and ingenious experiment and without boldness and enterprise fresh knowledge comes slowly end of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of life at the zoo by charles john cornish this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty eight rare and beautiful monkeys among the hundred inmates of the monkey palace at the zoo more than half the species shown may claim a place among the more elegant animal forms and an acquaintance with the smaller and squirrel-like members of the tribe which abound in the forests of central and south america and which in spite of their delicate constitutions are generally represented in greater or less numbers in the society's collection shows that in at least three elements of beauty the delicate modelling of the hands the brightness and vivacity of the eye and in the colour of the fur they hold their own with the prettiest and most attractive of the four-footed animals of the four continents the repulsion with which all monkeys are now commonly regarded is a curious instance of the change of association with animal types it is mainly modern sentiments that has identified the monkey with the idea of repulsive ugliness and if the great anthropoid apes with their disgusting affinities had never been discovered the monkey tribe might have retained the place which they held in the imagination of old cosimo tura the rugged and angular but illustrious painter of the fifteenth century who filled the backgrounds of his stately pictures of pageants and processions and his illuminations in the choir books of ferrara with groups of the fantastic and decorative monkeys which he had seen kept as pets in the precincts of the ducal palace like the lemurs and lories with which they are not remotely related the most elegant little monkeys are natives of the great tropical forest but the rarest and most interesting of the tribe are so delicate that their brief lives are passed almost unnoticed at the zoo where most of them as they arrive from time to time in the gardens are kept secluded in an inner chamber those from the woods of guinea and brazil are at once the most beautiful in form and the richest in colouring like all the monkeys of the new world they have round heads and broad noses of the order known as the cogitative nose in the classification by which an ingenious physiognomist recently determined the place of that organ as an index to character there is however little else in the countenances of these vivacious little creatures which suggest a reflective mind though the separation of the nostrils by a wide breadth of cartilage is the character mark which distinguishes the monkeys of the new world from those of the old and rescues the face of each and all of them from the cast of vicious inanity which disfigures so many of the latter whatever human features they possess are neither exaggerated nor degraded and the intelligence which this resemblance lends to their expression is fully borne out by their behaviour as observed by humboldt and others who have recorded their character in confinement it is on record from more than one reliable source that these south american monkeys we believe alone among animals can recognise the meaning of a picture audubon showed one the portraits of a cat and of a wasp at both of which the monkey was much frightened whereas on seeing the painted picture of a grasshopper and a beetle its natural food it precipitated itself towards the picture as if to seize the object there represented the beauty of the fur is perhaps the most marked feature of these south american monkeys one the squirrel monkey of guinea 
possesses the most brilliant coloring of any mammalian creature great or small when lying along a branch it might be taken for some slender golden-hued squirrel did not its round head and baby-like face at once claim a place for it among the monkey tribes its arms look as though they had been dipped in gambo's yellow dye up to the elbows above the fur shades off into rich hues of greenish olive with alternating lengths of short and long hairs of gold green and black which cover the arched squirrel-like back its eyes are a brilliant black but the cheeks are pink and the hands flesh-coloured like those of a very young child this is a most vivacious little creature quick and active in its movements and extremely short-tempered if it is not fed when it stretches out its imperious little hand it flies into a passion at once making ugly faces shaking the bars of its cage and uttering shrill bat-like cries for the squirrel monkey is by no means the silky little pet which it appears but a bold carnivorous little creature though its prey is only butterflies and the insects of the guinea forest another pretty and extremely rare central american monkey lived for some time at the zoo during the summer of eighteen ninety three this was the negro tamarin also a guinea species which had not been seen in london for twenty years two of these were still alive when the writer visited them in their private apartments at the zoo seated on a small strip of turkey carpet they looked like statuettes of the negro chieftains whose portraits adorn the works of travellers in central africa each was about seven inches high with head limbs and body in perfect proportion their faces hands and feet were highly polished ebony black with black bead-like eyes and black nails or rather claws for the tamarins like the squirrel monkeys and the marmosets are insect feeders the fur is close and silky and covers all the body except the face ears and hands the back is shot and mottled with wavy bars of orange an ornament which seems peculiar to the monkeys of tropical america unlike the rest of its near relations the little negro has one thoroughly monkey feature large sharp-pointed ears too like the impish forms of fusilli to allow it to rank among the first in the scale of monkey beauty the preeminence in this respect belongs without question to the marmosets two of these are by this time sufficiently acclimatized to be placed in a separate cage in the large room of the monkey house where they live in great contentment with another little tropical rarity the pinchin monkey from guinea except on very hot days they prefer to spend their time curled up in a nest of hay made in a small box at the top of the cage when the keeper calls them there is an answering cry from the inmate and in a few seconds the sounds in the box are like those from a nest of active little twittering birds presently three bright little heads and a row of six miniature hands appear at the door so rapidly put out and withdrawn that it is impossible to say to which of the inmates they belong then after much conversation apparently directed to the question of which is to get out of bed first one marmoset descends a few inches of the stick which serves as a ladder to the sleeping box eagerly pushed from behind by the others who are anxious to go shares in the food offered below but unwilling to fetch it when once out of the nest the beauty of the marmoset's colouring as well as of its face and limbs is at once apparent the fur is more like the plumage of birds or moths than the hair of any four-footed animal loose and feathery and mottled with tortoise-shell on black like the ornament seen in some of the rarer oriental pheasants this mottling is exchanged for bars on the tail and runs up between the shoulders to the neck the beautiful little pink faces of these black marmosets set with bright jewel-like brown eyes are fringed over the eyebrows and above the ears with white fan-like sprays their movements like their voices and their fur resemble those of birds rather than of monkeys a resemblance which their insect feeding habits indirectly promote the king of the tribe the lion marmoset covered with golden yellow fur with a mane-like cloak across its shoulders 
is not among the present inmates of the zoo but some years ago a pair of black-eyed marmosets produced a family whose welfare was the engrossing care of the keeper these tiny creatures were scarcely so large as a mouse with shorter and lighter fur than their parents but of exquisite proportions their baby hands being it is said one of the most beautiful instances of minute proportion ever seen in young animals for three weeks the marmoset mother nursed her babies until after one exceptionally cold night father mother and infants were all found dead as a rule it is fog not cold which is fatal to the monkeys at the zoo in the past year which was exceptionally sunny and free from fog though with many weeks of low temperature scarcely any rare monkeys died in the season which preceded it the fogs killed sixty but the marmosets are an exception to the rule they can no more endure cold than a tropical butterfly and a fall of a few degrees of temperature on a winter night chills the last sparks of life in their tender little bodies the pinchy monkey fully deserves its place in the marmoset cage except in face it might pass for one of the latter for its body has the same bird-like plumage barred with yellow and black and it warbles a little song like some tropical wren but its head and neck are plumed with white like the war dress of some indian chief and its black face and high features make the resemblance more amusing and complete of all the american monkeys the capuchins seem the most hardy and long-lived species they occupy a portion of the large central cage at the zoo being well able to take care of themselves both in human and monkey society the last addition to the family is a brown capuchin a bright intelligent round-necked round-eyed little monkey with a long thick tail and a coat of rich brown fur though perfectly fearless when with grown men pulling them towards it with all the strength of its little arms this capuchin has a vehement and aggressive dislike of boys the instant one approaches the cage it warns him to keep his distance with menacing and imperious gestures and if a face comes too near the bars slips its arms through and slaps the odious countenance with the utmost fury and aversion the monkey appreciation of degrees in human development is as alert and vigilant as the limits which human instinct sets between themselves and the latest prodigy of infant humanity End of chapter twenty eight